Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, so this is the third day of the conference, uh, the final day. So uh, Claire, you will be the, the chair and uh, the floor is yours uh, for this uh, morning session. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good morning and welcome to the final panel on diasporic circulations. I'm uh, going to introduce the speakers um, as they present their papers and then we'll take um, questions afterwards. So our first um, paper is from Scott Spencer, who's joining us from the Thornton School of Music in the University of Southern California. Uh, Scott is in LA, where it is midnight, I believe. And uh, um, he, his research explores the interactions of oral tradition and digital culture. And he's also served as an editor for the Ballad uh, Collectors of North America and runs the Sound in Sacred Spaces Working Group in um, uh, USC, <coughs> being involved in the UCLA Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture. Scott is going to talk to us about um, Captain Francis O'Neill and the uh, Edison Wax Cylinder Recorder. Can't wait. Thanks, Scott. Thank you so much. So we've danced around Captain Francis O'Neill just a little bit, especially um, as uh, Aileen Delan was saying yesterday, um, Irish music has been mediated technologically in the US for 200 years. So here's a wonderful example. And again, um, Irish studies world often looks to um, music as a specialist's area uh, outside of uh, history and literature. And I'm, I'm hoping that this will be something that will open things up for a little bit for people as well. So uh, talking about Captain Francis O'Neill, born in 1848 in rural County Cork, um, ended up being a sailor off to the US, to Yokohama, to Honolulu, shipwrecked on Baker Island in the South Pacific for a month. Um, his flute skills actually, uh, he used them to uh, get a, a further rations so that he wouldn't starve while he was there for the month. Um, he was around the world by age 19 in San Francisco, off to New York City, Pennsylvania, Missouri, and in 1870 hit Chicago. He was planning on working on the ships in the Great Lakes, um, ended up married, uh, marrying his sweetheart, Anna Rogers, that year and worked for a few years as a laborer. By 1873, he had joined the police force and five years later uh, was named a sergeant. And after 10 years on the force, he had been promoted to the rank of lieutenant and has uh, had a position as the assistant chief clerk of the Chicago Police Department. By 1890, he moved to Drexel Boulevard in Hyde Park, Chicago. And by 1893, was the chief clerk of the department. 1893, of course, as we heard in a fascinating panel um, a couple of days ago, was the Columbian Exposition. He attended and met uh, Piper Patsy Tui. Um, we'll return to this a little bit later as we get uh, into... So at the Columbian Exposition, he meets a, a number of Pipers. Um, uh, he also lived in very interesting times, um, uh, served during the Pullman strike in 1894, and in uh, April 30th, 1901, became the general superintendent of police, or as people like to call him, as he liked to refer to himself, the chief of police. So he was known to employ Irish musicians as they passed through town, and uh, his circle of, oh, I'm sorry, I see what you're saying. It is this. That is the presentation method. Great. So Fantastic. great. Good. Thank you very much. Um, so as uh, he was known very much for employing Irish musicians in Chicago, and there were many of them. This is the Irish Music Club of Chicago. Um, he brought in his circle of friends, mutual associates, and they would send word to him of newly arrived musicians. Um, that he would bring in and ask for tunes. He had collected the tunes starting in 1880s, and as he didn't read music, he would bring in his friend and transcriptionist, James O'Neill, no relation, and the two gathered hundreds upon hundreds of tunes from the oral tradition, ironing them out into notes on the page um, to get rid of variations and discrepancies and make an urtext of the oral tradition. 
So um, O'Neill had mentioned the Brighton Park neighborhood as being the mecca for all who enjoyed traditional Irish music. Performers cheerfully entered into the spirit of the enterprise and contributed any music in their possession which was desired. Many pleasant evenings were thus spent and those who enjoyed them will remember the occasions as among the most delightful of their lives. His first book was entitled O'Neill's Music of Ireland. And this is uh, still to this day referred to as the Bible in the traditional music scene, especially in the diaspora. This was uh, published in the year of his reappointment as chief of police in 1903. He lived in interesting times. Um, he was supervising the rescue of the Iroquois Theater fire, December 31st, 1903. Um, and then resigned after the conclusion of the Teamsters strike in July 1905, just months after his second appointment. Um, he spent the next few years publishing the bulk of his books, eight or nine books, depending on how you count them, with his final Waifs and Strays of Gaelic Melody published in 1922. I don't have to mention here that those years, 1901 to 1922, there were a few things happening back in Ireland as well. Um, his books landed at this fascinating moment of diasporic nationalism and nostalgia. His 1910 Irish folk music, a fascinating hobby, um, was described as 1500 Irish airs hitherto preserved only through traditions have been rescued from oblivion and written down that they might endure as precious heritage for the sons and daughters of Aaron. Uh, but back to the world's Columbian exposition in Chicago, Edison's uh, gramophone was being featured at this. Um, it was an early invention. Here in this picture, you can see that they're using tubes that go directly to the ears rather than the horns that we see later. Um, there are also a hundred nickel operated um, uh, wax cylinder machines by the American Graphophone Company as well, scattered around the park. We also know that Benjamin Ives Gilman was recording non-Western music at the fair, 102 cylinders worth, under the sponsorship of Mary Hemingway, who went on to do a sponsorship for some of the earliest Native American language recordings. But Piper Patsy Tui, and this is at the, the St. Louis Fair a few years later, uh, Piper Patsy Tui was a remarkable piper from Galway who had been on the vaudeville circuit for years and was making a splash at the one of the two Irish villages at the fair. Um, a review says, um, the hopes and aspirations of a regenerated nation were pleasingly typified in Patsy Tui, the spruce young man in corduroy breeches and ripped stockings, whose expert manipulation of the great set of Taylor pipes that uh, Taylor Brothers built uh, in Philadelphia made him the center of attraction within. Patsy in his gray clothes, ruffles, and green stockings is a great attraction, but he is not swelled up with pride, being bashful and modest. And that was from the uh, Columbian Gallery publication. O'Neill described him as the genial wizard of the Irish Pipers, a stranger to jealousy. His comments are never sarcastic or unkind, neither does he display any tendency to monopolize attention in company when other musicians are present. So I can't imagine that um, O'Neill and Tui had missed the cylinder displays while they were at the, the events uh, at the exposition, but we really don't have a whole lot about their entry into the world of recording. Um, O'Neill really had been focused on transcription and Patsy Tui on the vaudeville and minstrelsy circuits had been uh, more, more focused on performing. But we do know that in early 1901, Tui was approached by the Edison Recording Company to enter into a recording contract. However, as Francis O'Neill later wrote in a friend, uh, to a friend in Ireland, Tui could not get enough for his time from the record people. His theatrical business is more profitable. They found a cheaper man to record, James C. McAuliffe, and cheaper work, of course. Um, this is from Mitchell and Small's The Piping of Patsy Tui, um, also published in Ana Puibra, uh, the newsletter of Na Puibri Ilan, um, 1974. Uh, James McAuliffe um, was the American-born replacement for this incredible piper and recorded a few wax cylinders for Edison, and they are exceptionally not good exceptionally not good. Tui must have taken notice of the potential market for recordings of his playing, 
for on the 20th, uh, the 18th of May in 1901, um, he put up the following advertisement in the Irish World newspaper in New York. Irish bagpipes on the phonograph, original phonograph records of the Irish pipes, made to order by the best Irish piper in America, $1 each, $10 per dozen, send for catalog of 150 Irish airs, jigs, reels, hornpipes, etc. to Patsy Tui, 1388 Bristow Street, New York City. This uh, wax cylinder recorder could be purchased for home use and um, the idea that a form of traditional music being commodified and exchanged is certainly not unprecedented. Here is an oral tradition that quickly incorporated and subsequently relied upon multiple forms of technology, documentation, and mediation to span great geographic distances as players developed traditional performance practices and negotiated ideas of orality and identity. Considering that Ireland's history of hardships, of forced migration, of nation building, all coincided perfectly with the dawn of the recording age, such an odd paradox between oral tradition and the technologic became quite necessary for the continuation of the tradition. Unlike other genres of music, which have used recordings to recapture repertoire or style through a secondary orality, these early recordings allowed those on the periphery of Irish music to act as vital cultural agents and engage with developments in the larger tradition through mediation and dissemination. How many wax cylinders Tui actually cut at home through this method can't really be determined. A number of the cylinders are still in existence today, held in the library of the University College Cork, in the Irish Traditional Music Archives in Dublin, and the Ward Irish Music Archives in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. O'Neill also made use of an Edison wax cylinder just like this in his residence to transcribe musicians as he and his collaborator pretend, uh, prepared their books of tunes. And it must be assumed that many musical visitors to his house must have also been recorded. Um, O'Neill, though, at the, uh, after the tragic death of his son Rogers in 1904, promised his wife that there would be no more music, no more merriment in the house, and gave all of his cylinder recordings, his recording devices, and um, uh, all other frivolities in his life to his friend Sergeant Early, who was a fiddle player and one of uh, uh, O'Neill's early police recruits. So O'Neill, a devoted fan of Tui's and a self-proclaimed authority on pipers and their performance prowess, and not to mention also their personalities, sent a large number of recordings to colleagues in Ireland and began a series of correspondences that placed him at the center of the piping world as arbiter of piping talent and of personality. In a letter to William Halpin of County Clare, Captain uh, Chief O'Neill wrote about one of his first musical parcels sent to Dr. Reverend Hennebury in Waterford as a Christmas present, which was sure to be appreciated. I forwarded in 1907 to Reverend Dr. Hennebury at Waterford Island, a box of Edison phonograph records, which Sergeant Early generously permitted me to select from his treasures. Among them was the Shaskin Reel played by Patrick Tui. The clergyman's comments is best expressed in his own words, Quote, the five by two e, the five cylinders by two e, are the superior limit of Irish pipering. One of his, the Shaskin reel, is so supreme that I am utterly without words to express my opinion of it. Why there is no Irish musician alive at all now in his class. If things were as they ought to be, he should be installed as professor of music in a national university in Dublin. Oh, if it were only so that easy. And that is what I think of Patsy Tui and his pipering. In other letters to Mr. Halpin, O'Neill mentions a number of cylinders that he had posted to his colleagues, uh, including uh, Reverend Dr. Dr. Reverend Henry in Waterford. Um, in a letter dated March 9th, 1912, he writes of a number, number of cylinders he had posted to Henry in a shipment that included wax recordings of three different musicians. In the letter, he refers to a cantankerous Chicago piper named Bernard Delaney, Although pulled out of obscurity and befriended for more than a fourth of a century by yours truly, proved an ingrate, and I have none of his records, though I sent some years ago to Dr. Hennebury, I think, and that reminds me that I sent a dozen from Tui and a dozen from John McFadden, our best traditional fiddler, to his reverence in January 1911. From Mr. Wayland, I know that they arrived safely. 
O'Neill mentions in another letter to Halpin that Delaney may have had the same personal home Edison cylinder set up as Tui. In one letter, he mentions that, and this is Delaney and O'Neill and another friend I can't identify, he mentions that yesterday, March 8th, March 8th, 1912, Bernard Delaney, the smoothest and most rhythmic piper, which was ever my lot to hear, left Chicago to reside permanently at Ocean Springs in the Gulf of Mexico, 900 miles away. In a, later, a letter later that year, he bitterly mentions that Delaney, quote, sold his machine and records to a stranger, although planting himself and his wife upon my hospitality for a few days before his departure. Delaney did not sit very well with O'Neill. And in fact, um, this letter, which is possibly the best letter I've ever found in an archive or has been uh, turned up from an archive says, Dear Jim, the attached letter explains itself. Will you please write to the police officials at Havana, Cuba and try to dig Barney up? He may have got drunk after getting out of the hospital or may have been slugged out and thrown in the bay or other hiding place, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Tell Julia not mention this just now. So um, in March, uh, March of 1912, and uh, the letter to Halpin, he writes, your consignment of two e tunes were shipped uh, just a week ago via United States Express prepaid. Patsy announced the names himself, so you have a record of his voice as well. They were made in Sergeant Early's residence, and now they are yours, and I wish you luck with them. The dates of the above correspondences suggest a number of things uh, about O'Neill's use of technology and his distribution of recordings. O'Neill had vowed to remove music from his household after the death of his, uh, the last of his five sons. From the above correspondences, though, we can infer that after 1904, O'Neill may either have continued his recording of Irish music on Edison cylinders at Early's house, or more probably, continued to solicit recordings by mail from Tui and post them to Ireland with other previously recorded cylinders from his collection. Um, in either case, O'Neill's cylinders are the first documented recordings of Irish music to be sent across the Atlantic to Ireland. One of the most interesting bits of information gleaned from um, these letters, though, is an offhand mention of a recordings of a piper named Mr. Andrews being sent to O'Neill in Chicago from Halpin and County Clare on 78 RPM record. Yours came to hand less than two weeks ago. I could not find a Victor or Columbia phonograph among my friends. They all had the Ed Edison cylinder machine. So I was obliged to go to Lyon and Healy Music House to test them this very day. The poor Irish cousins had trumped him by uh, upping technology and doing something that uh, O'Neill didn't even have. As for the impact that O'Neill had on the tradition, we can, we can clearly see this. First, of course, his nine books became the standard entry into the tradition for musicians in the diaspora, literally called the Bible by traditional musicians. But the oral tradition took an interesting hit. The Shaskin reel, and I'm gonna get out of this for a moment. The Shaskin reel that he mentioned, um, we can take a look at a couple of different ways of approaching this. Um, we can, take a look at what O'Neill had actually transcribed. And I beg your, uh, your indulgence for playing this. This is a synthesized accordion, but it gives you an idea of the stripped down note by note versions that they play. I'm so sorry, I will not subject that, uh, you to that any longer than I have to. Um, the, the notes that they transcribed were essentialized. They were the or text. They were without uh, the flourishes, without the ornaments, with anything, um, taking it out of the oral tradition and putting it in a book. And if you then look back to the actual, um, so this is the actual transcription that Early and O'Neill published of the Shaskin reel. But if you go back to the Mitchell and Small book, in which they literally transcribed every note that was played on a wax cylinder recording, 
you can see that the subtleties on the wax cylinder recordings that they were recording in the house as they were transcribing these pieces from the musicians are completely different than the things that they wrote down. And I can give you an example here. This is Patsy Tui playing in uh, 1903, I believe. And again, um, these can be found online very easily, especially at the, um, the Ward Irish Music Archives, Irish Traditional Music Archives. I'm not going to play much of this for time. The difference is massive. And this is an impact on the oral tradition that is kind of fascinating. Again, it's not known how many recordings Tui did uh, at home on the private machine, but we knew that at the publication of this book of transcriptions of um, uh, descriptive rather than prescriptive music, um, Mitchell and Small uh, had access to about 50 wax cylinder recordings by Tui. Uh, since then, more have been found. Uh, a few years ago, 32 were donated to the Ward Irish Music Archives from the estate of Michael Dunn, the fire chief of Milwaukee, who had been sent this suitcase of recordings from O'Neill or from Early after the death of his son, Rogers. Ironically, these recordings, which had been used to transcribe musicians for a fixed codification in printed books, are now back in the oral tradition. They're posted on the Ward Irish Music Archives and the Irish Traditional Music Archive websites for musicians to listen to and to reincorporate back into the oral tradition. So after having rejected uh, at least one offer, Patsy Tui finally signed with Victor and recorded his first record in New York in 1919. Um, the 78 was released in 1920. Um, these are images from the Dunn archives um, and advertised in the February issue of the Victor Record Supplement as one of the historic performers of the old traditional Irish minstrel tunes. And from here, the recording industry took off. Uh, it took notice of Irish music and the dawn of the recording age and the golden age of Irish music sprang up on the East Coast with the likes of Michael Coleman and Patty Killoran. And um, as Mary Rose O'Shea mentioned yesterday, the feedback loop of US recordings um, between the U.S. and the diaspora, they were incredibly impactful because they were the only recordings that were being produced and sent back to Ireland. And I have a whole other publication on the Sligo style that's, uh, that's in those things. So the recording industry took notice, um, but for a few solid decades, Instead of the East Coast being the epicenter of the diasporic um, music scene, the epicenter was in Chicago with Captain Francis O'Neill. And uh, I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. That was really um, terrifically interesting. Uh, so our next... Um, talk now, and there's some thanks coming through in the chat there as well. Um, our next uh, talk gives me the pleasure of introducing Amélie Doshi, who's joining us from the University of uh, Toulouse, post some storms we, we heard, and who is a senior lecturer at the University of Toulouse working on um, 19th century um, visual representations of Ireland and the Irish. Uh, Emily has um, taught at the National University of Ireland in Maynooth and has a PhD on the topic of the representations of the Irish by the Scottish painter Erskine uh, Nicol. So, uh, Emily, we're looking forward to hearing more. So my, my topic today is illustrating Irishness in paintings. Erskine Nichols pictures of Ireland showed at the Industrial Exhibition of Chicago in 1881 and 1887. Um, so 
who was Erskine Nickel to start with? So he was a Scottish painter uh, who was born in 1825 and who died in 1904. And he left Rhode Island in 1846, which can be surprising given the context of the Irish famine between 1845 and 1852. There, he must have witnessed the emigration, disease, and death resulting from potato blight. However, most of his artworks from the 1850s depict a blissful countryside, reminding viewers of uh, the locus amenus, a, a Latin motive inherited from classic literature, in which happiness is derived from a rural environment, as in Irish making uh, that you can see here. Can you see a picture of a fair in an Irish village? Does it work? Yes, we can. OK, cool. thank you. Um, so such a contrast with the dire reality of Irish peasants can be questionable for today's observers. But it did not prevent the painter from gaining international rec uh, reputation in America in the 1880s. For example, an Irish merrymaking that you can see here uh, was bought by American millionaire George I. Senny, who lent it in 1881 for the Chicago Interstate Industrial Exposition, held annually. Six years later, another picture by Nickel called Bashful was, was showed there. So how could such views of Ireland fuel the collective imagination on Irish pastoral life? How could they participate in the identification of Chicago as an Irish American metropolis? These questions will be explored by focusing on Nichols pictures and on their conditions of exhibition at the Industrial Exposition before examining the sense of Irishness that they could convey. And finally, their participation in the promotion of Chicago as a cultural metropolis. So how could such artworks be exhibited in Chicago? Chicago was qualified as a boom city, uh, given that in the 1830s, its population was around 350 inhabitants only, a figure evolving to over 4,000 people in 1840. Attracting numerous migrants from Ireland, Germany, and Scandinavia, Chicago had over 90,000 people, uh, inhabitants in the 1870s, so that by the next decade, it was the largest city in the Midwest. The Irish participated in its industrial success in the lumber business, slaughtering, and then shipping of hogs and cattle, as well as in millwork business. In such an industrial town, technological innovations were of great interest and it accounts for the foundation of the Interstate Industrial Fair. So um, the Interstate Industrial Fairs have not attracted a lot of attention. Um, many academics are rather focused on the World Columbian uh, Exhibition because it was international, it was discussed yesterday. But still these uh, expositions are interest because they somehow they were the ancestors of the World Columbian Exposition in 1893. So um, one of the two academics who has worked on, on, on this topic is Stefan Germer that I quote here. So I quote, after the Great Fire of 1871, the idea to have an annual fair was realized when a corporation um, a corporation headed by real estate mogul Potter Palmer offered subscription, um, offered subs subscription stocks to finance the erection of an exhibition hall on Michigan Avenue. The first exhibition opened its gates to the public on September 25, 1873. Chicago had a new attraction. The exhibition hall, a huge iron and glass construction designed by architect W. W. Boyton, offered businessmen 230,000 square feet of exhibition space to fill with a variety of pavilions, stands, and counters showing the products of Chicago, Midwestern, and even East Coast firms. Like the building itself, the exhibition was planned as a celebration of modernity, technology, and industrialization. It featured a working steam engine, a huge passenger elevator transporting visitors to an observation deck gas lighting, and one year, 
an interior railroad track on which locomotives drawing passenger carriages sped around the exhibit. Um, the fair was soon to integrate an art department, as explained by Kirsten M. Jensen. So she is the other researcher who has um, uh, worked a lot on these industrial expositions. So I quote from her PhD thesis. Almost from, um, well, it's, it's actually a book derived from our PhD thesis. Almost from Chicago's founding in 1837, art was a centerpiece of the city's cultural life, and the first public ex exhibition was held in 1859. Arts organizations, patrons, critics, and the public demonstrated an early interest in European art, as well as arts art by Americans who had worked abroad. Most significant of these early artistic activities was the establishment of the Art Gallery at the annual Interstate Industrial Exposition, 1873-1890. The exposition's organizers had not originally intended to include art in their fair, but recognized that it could be used as a way of demonstrating Chicago's cultural as well as industrial development. So, by 1877, there was a specific art gallery as the fine arts were showed in a separate room. So this is to show you um, what, what it looked like. And the, the art gallery was, I quote, prominently situated across from the main entrance and on axis with the central fountain. So you can see um, the fountain was here in the middle of the building. And you can see what it looked like to visitors there. So I guess the art gallery must have been here. Um, and throughout its 17 years of existence, um, the, um, it was deemed the most exciting exhibition of American art. And it was nicknamed the American Salon as it comprised European artworks, which had been successful in Paris, a sure indication of their artistic value. Um, besides, the exhibition was reported internationally, for example, in the London-based magazine of art, which also insisted on the key role played by Sarah Tyson Hallowell, um, who was the manager of the art gallery from 1878 onwards. Hallowell traveled across the US to get the best artworks from dealers, painters, or art lovers. And this must have been how she obtained the pictures by Nicole. Uh, an Irish merrymaking that we have first seen uh, was lent in 1881 by Joseph William Bates, who was a cotton trader and banker from Philadelphia. And Bashful that you can see here, uh, was lent in 1887 by New York banker George I. Sene, along with a hundred others. Um, a newspaper note published in 1881 by Hallowell herself gives, gives an idea of her work. So this is my next slide, and because it's not very easy to read, I've, I've trans transcribed it um, there. So she wrote in the Chicago Tribune, um, to the artists of Chicago and vicinity, the ninth annual art exhibition of the Interstate Industrial Exposition of Chicago will be opened on September 7 and will continue until October 22, during which no work mentioned in the catalog can be removed. Original paintings in oil or watercolors not before exhibited in Chicago will be received at the exposition building until August 13, but no works will be exhibited unless approved by the committee. The exposition will collect and return pictures in Chicago free of charge to exhibitors. All works will be at the risk of owners. If sales are effected, no commission will be charged, but no price will be offered for sale unless the price is given in the list. Artists residing in Chicago are requested to send their list with their pictures, addressed art department, Interstate Industrial Exposition, Chicago, and to forward so that they will arrive before August 13, all charges being fully prepaid by order of the committee, Sarah Tyson Alloyle, Secretary of the Art Committee Exposition Building, Chicago. 
So, art works first needed to be selected by the committee, comprising Hallowell and upper class Chicagoans who had a personal fond less for European trained artists, especially if they had received awards, which was the case of Nickel. This is echoed in the 1887 catalog um, that you can see here. Um, and you can see here a medal 1867. Uh, this is a medal he had got at the Paris International Fair of that year with uh, this picture and another one called Paying the Rent. Um, and you can also see his title, Associate of the Royal Academy of London, a title he had obtained in 1866. Indeed, from the 1870s onwards, Nickel was recognized as the painter of Ireland, to quote the newspapers of that time. Uh, given his specialization in pictures of the Irish countryside, he actually painted uh, more than 700 artworks um, in his lifetime devoted to Ireland. So how could such images convey a sense of Irishness to uh, visitors? Nickel enhanced the entertaining quality of his pictures, likely to be read as narratives. The Bashful Suitor, for example, is a sentimental scene in which an awkward protagonist is wooing his good-looking beloved. As indicated by the interior, characterized by a large fireside, that you can see there, more or less, because it's a bit, I'm sorry for the quality of the picture. Um, actually, finding this picture was very hard, and I'm very grateful to Thomas Pod of Sotheby, who sent it to me, because this artwork only came up twice um, for the public in 1887 in Chicago and in 1992 in New York. So it was really, really difficult to find it. Um, but, but still, uh, I'm very happy to have it here. So you can see a large fire side. You can see a typically Irish uh, stool there, some potatoes there, and a cooking pot. Um, so it indicates these are clues that the scene happens in Ireland. And it was probably painted in the 1860s when Nickel had a studio built for himself in County Westmeath, which enabled him to paint on the spot the cabins of Irish peasants who lived nearby. So in this typically Irish cabin is seen an Irish man who can be recognized in several other pictures, uh, such as the day after the fair that you can see here, uh, but also in Paddycock's Love Letter, a watercolor of 1864, and also in Listening to Reason, um, also called Oh, I'm Not Myself at All, Molly Dear. Uh, you can see it here. And in which the protagonist shows considerable progress in getting closer to his sweetheart. But in all these situations, uh, the Irishman seems to be part of a comedy designed to make the viewer smile at his emotions, such as embarrassment uh, here, pain here the day after the fair, um, we discussed this, this morning how it's hard to recover after a party. So this is basically what we have here. Um, pain, but also concentration and exasperation here. Um, several Irish cliches are at work here, such as sentimentality, the gift of the gab, rendered by the character's wooing or writing, or his tendency for sanguine behavior and brutality as in the day after the fair. You can see the de detail there. Um, historian Sheridan Gilly has noted that cliches are often double-edged. Uh, indeed, they could be perceived positively as well as negatively, and she demonstrated that an Irishman's so-called tendency for violence could be criticized, but also encouraged, as in combat, for instance. So here the pictures are touched with the sense, because it's, it's touched with the sense of joyful and eventful life, um, this is rather positive, I would say. So Irish migrants, who were likely to be amongst the seven and 10,000 visitors coming each day to the, to the exposition, uh, were likely to see these pictures. Um, actually, the admission fee was only 25 cents, which did not exclude the working class from the event. And in the eyes of Chicagoans, a pastoral canvas such as an Irish merrymaking could counterpoise against their very urban and daily lives, uh, very urban daily lives. Indeed, the pastoral genre is built by contrast with the city. 
and is characterized by quaint landscapes embodying, I quote, a rural retreat where people work to live rather than live to work, have time to meet, gossip, and laugh at life. This is a definition by Tom Inglis of the Pastoral Journal. So the rural gathering presented here is indeed imbued with a sense of leisure and peace, with characters drinking here, dancing there, or again, wooing their beloved there. Yet it is precisely because villages in Ireland were not such merry places of plenty that a million people had left them in the 1850s fleeing from hunger, burdensome rents, uh, and religious tensions. So these pictures um, do not hint at their contemporary political turmoil such as the land wars. Um, triggered in 1879 by poor crops, low livestock prices, and lack in demand for rural laborers, uh, so that many small tenants could no longer pay their rents. To defend them, nationalists such as James Daly, Michael David, and Charles Stuart Parnell promoted the three Fs, fair rent, fixative tenure, and free sale. And at the time when an Irish merrymaking was hung in Chicago, Parnell had finished a tour of the USA from January to March 1880 to solicit funds for the cause. Now, we, we, yesterday was discussed by Gillian the fact that in February 1880, in the very building of the Interstate Industrial um, Exposition, um, was a meeting held by Parnell attended by 20,000 people. So it was exactly the same location. Uh, the meeting was held by Parnell then in, there in February. And then in autumn, it's September, the same year, so just a few months later, you could see this type of pictures. Um, so, so there was a big contrast be between these very paintings and, and, uh, and what land leaguers were trying to do, actually. They were encouraging tenants to, I quote, refuse rent payments, purchase arms, march to meetings in military formation, and to hold back their friendship from those involved with landlordism, end of quote. So this is the exact opposite of what, we, what is represented in Nichols Fair, which exudes social harmony through several groups of characters. Uh, in particular, you have groupings here around the table. You have a group of Irish mu musicians in the background. Scott, I'm sure this will be of interest to you. And you have a group of dancers uh, there as well. So, so because of these groupings, you have a feeling of cohesion. Um, and so the evacuation of this political dimension uh, in the selected pictures by Nicole revealed that the committee, the art committee, was more interested in fueling a sense of nostalgia for the, the, the Irish homeland. Nostalgia means both a return from the Greek nostos and pain from the Greek algos. And this longing for an idyllic home can be seen as a feature of the Irish diaspora in America. James P. Byrne argues that Irish Americans nostalgically reconstructed Ireland as a mythological homeland a simple and stable past as a refuge from the turbulent and chaotic present. So I think this is the mechanism we have here um, at play. However, um, if these pictures did not inform on the state of Irish politics, they did provide indications regarding European art trends and thus brought a certain prestige to the exhibition. So how could they participate in the promotion of Chicago as an international and cultural metropolis? The organizers were committed to illustrate various schools of art so that in 1881, the show gathered 790 works. In the European room, French painters included Jérôme, uh, Jean-Louis Jérôme, Jean-Louis Léon Jérôme, he has a lot of first names, uh, with his celebrated coffee house in Cairo, but there were also pictures from the Munich School of Art, uh, from the modern Italian school with Saltini's bubble blowers, and several painters from Great Britain, uh, like the pictures by Nicole. So many artworks, no matter their, their different nationalities, many of these artworks 
were genre pictures. So what were genre pictures? I quote uh, Julia Thomas, they were images that told stories, end of quote. So it could be anecdotal, sentimental, and entertaining. And Garmer claims that the crowds preferred the small do domestic scenes, sentimental genre pictures, and fancy landscapes to the huge historical canvases of events from days gone by, which required lengthy and learned explanations. So the aim was doubtless to please the public by unveiling privately owned pictures. Owners lending their pictures always ran the risk of ruining their collection. Damage or theft happened, hence the comment by Halloween in the, in the Chicago Tribune that these works were, I quote, at the risk of owners. So their real motivations can be questioned. Um, for second generation pioneers like George I. Semi, there was undoubtedly a question of cultural prestige, prestige at stake as guessed by Germer, who claimed that picture owners, I quote, uh, realized the necessity of forming a middle class that would defend the cultural tradition they cherished. An educated middle class would help them further establish themselves as the socially dominant group in Chicago and strengthen upper class control of politics and culture, which was threatened by working class and immigrant populations. So the desire to influence a mass audience is redolent of cultural hegemony. These collectors were asserting their political power as they showed off their cultural possessions and thus social stages. In addition, the possession of pictures by Nicol focusing on the Irish rural working class was another sign of their power. These collectors possessed these canvases and the characters painted on them just like the higher order of societies possessed estate, wealth, and cultural knowledge over most visitors who were lower on the social ladder and could therefore better identify with the characters painted rather than their owners, especially if such visitors were of Irish origin. So this mental identification with painted objects further enhance their social difference with the world of art collectors and as such the exhibition can be seen as a tool for cultural hegemony and a means for the upper class to confirm its powers over lower social groups but for visitors who could consider buying pictures there the industrial exposition was an interesting art market where Nico's pictures were models of what was made in Europe in terms of style, but also in terms of commercial success. Success, sorry. Um, Nico's picture in particular were mainly of cabinet size. So what was uh, what was it in the nineteenth century? It meant that they were usually no longer than a meter uh, long and not more than half a meter high or vice versa, so that they were easy, they were easy to hang in any uh, interior. And actually the industrial show played a significant role in collecting patterns in the Midwest and such patterns were identified by Garmer. So this is my next quotation. What did Chicago social elite seek to buy? Paintings from Paris, depicting classical muse or sentimental scenes of mothers and children were hung side by side with the quiet landscape motifs of the Barbizon school artists. So you, you probably know that the Barbizon school uh, was devoted to painting uh, landscapes uh, with cattle and peasants. There were pictures from the German academies of Munich and Dusseldorf, landscapes by Kokuk and Verbeckhoven, two Dutch painters, the rustic canvases of Joseph Israels, as well as examples from the Italian, Belgian, British, and even Scandinavian schools. Landscapes were the most prominent genre. Second to landscapes came genre scenes, sentimental or moralizing views, with titles such as The Right Path by Mary, who was a French painter. So thus, Nicholas' pictures corresponded to the collector's desire to hang entertaining pictures on their walls, embodying quaint village scenes, and they also matched with their will to possess a collection that would be as culturally prestigious as it could get. 
To conclude, pictures by uh, pictures such as an Irish merrymaking and the bashful suitor demonstrated that there were places in Europe which were indeed more rural and backward than Chicago, thus denying the New York cliche that Chicago was a distant, rustic, or unrefined little town. By selecting scenes with rustic companions enjoying themselves as much as the tavern drinkers of Bruegel in the 16th century, uh, Chicagoans demonstrated their urbanity and modernity. It was precisely because they were modern and industrialized that they could find sources of distraction in such rural images and that they did have the purchasing power to buy them. This desire to prove that Chicago's lifestyle was different from Irish rural life may explain why none of Nichols' more political pictures, such as a disputed boundary, were ever showed in the industrial exposition, even if this, uh, this very picture was actually in America at that time. So the absence of political subjects in Irish paintings may seem paradoxical given the local interest in Irish affairs witnessed in the Chicago Tribune, for example, but it was perhaps estimated that the show should not revive past suffering, hence the choice for more nostalgic topics. Actually, the very presence of artworks conveying a sense of Irishness proves the interest in the country of origin of many Chicagoans in these foreign landscapes, people, habits, and family scenes which form their cultural heritage. And this tends to prove that Chicago was indeed an Irish American metropolis in the 1880s. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Emily. Such uh, compelling contradictions there. Um, hopefully we'll have time to discuss more. So it falls to me next to introduce uh, Patrick O'Sullivan, who's been a pioneer of many uh, uh, projects on Irish diaspora studies at the interface of academic research and uh, community action. Patrick is currently visiting professor of Irish diaspora studies at London Metropolitan University, and he's going to talk to us today about the discourse of the Irish emigrant letter. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Um, very reassuring to hear Scott and Amelie. I I've now feel that what I have to say fits in much better. Um, I have taken out all the comedy. We may have to put it back in again, but, but I have taken it all out. Um, and I'm not going to try and do the share screen thing. I've put uh, my illustrations and a rough list of references on my blog with a link in the chat. And I've done a tiny URL for people who need to copy and paste. Uh, we've all been thinking about Paris. Uh, I was thinking, I've been to Paris for many years. The high point of my last visit was a long leisurely meal with Maurice Goldring in his apartment in the Goutte d'Or. And I came away from that with many anecdotes. And then thinking back to the first time I met Maurice Goldring, it was in 1990 in Dublin at one of the Lippmann seminars on Ireland. It was a, a very helpful network organized by Bob Purdy and Austin Morgan. Uh, Maurice in Dublin began his paper by saying, let me begin with a little bit of theory. And there was an affectionate groan from the audience. And Maurice continued, I know that this might not be welcome. There was a further groan. Maurice's little bit of theory had to do with maleness, masculinity, about young males and their participation in paramilitary and terrorist activity. And that's a theme which he has recently returned to, I noticed when I was just seeing what he was up to. So our French colleagues might bring us a little bit of theory. This gift, these gifts, I welcome. Uh, but I have written elsewhere more than enough about Paris and your unfortunate predilection for generating theory. In a 2003 summary article to analyze the interdisciplinary patterns, I was forced to invent new verbs. The verb to Foucault, the verb to Lacan, the verb to Baudrillard, and I showed how individual academic disciplines might be every now and again well and truly Foucault. 
for me, this was, I said then, part of the intellectual pleasure of the interdisciplinary approach. And to show how the approach might be useful, I used an image. In the present day, I can only apologize for that image. I described us as acting as the intellectual equivalent of a virus warning. So this paper is a meditation on theory and discourse using the Irish emigrant letter as a case study, all very Oxford. So a case study to inter interrogate the academic disciplines. And I think it is worth saying that often we do need to interrogate the academic disciplines. And this is not an abstract exercise. There are real life consequences. Two examples are in front of me now. The way that for a brief period, Oscar Lewis and the culture of poverty became the shaping justification for Irish government policies towards the traveller community, the gypsies and tinkers of literary tradition. Or Peter Gray's book about British government policies at the time of the Irish famine, when Peter in the British archives realises that he is reading not economic theory, but theology. Discourses come to us through many mediums and discourses around the written letter come to us in many ways. In theatre, we are aware of the many scenes in which a character comes onto stage reading a letter. And there are very fine studies of letters in Shakespeare's plays. You can think of your own example, Shakespeare's Hamlet, in which the letter becomes a murder weapon and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. There was a project by Brian Limkin, uh, Lampkin and Paddy Fitzgerald at the Mellon Center for Migration Studies. This was part of the IFACUS network, the European Federation, to collect examples of the ways in which emigration had been portrayed in art. Some of these pictures you will be familiar with already, often as book covers. Uh, and my audience here will be aware of the, which, of the ways in which the emigrant better is visible in paintings and illustrations. And I put my favorite three examples on my blog. They're James Collinson, answering the emigrant's letter, 1850, now in the Manchester Art Gallery. James Brennan, letter from America, 1875, in the Crawford Gallery, Cork. And Maximo Peña Monoz, La Carta del Rio Ocente, 1887, now in the Prado Gallery. That is Letter from an Absent Son. So why are these three my favorites? Well, you'll, you'll hunt them down. You'll see that in all three paintings, the task of reading and writing is given to the child. So this is very telling about the ways in which our people embrace and harness the technologies of the world. Turning now to Chicago, and your unfortunate predilection for generating theory. Today, the theory and research practices we ask ourselves to get our heads around emanate from Chicago School Sociology. I'm going to assume that everyone at this conference knows more than I do about Chicago School Sociology and its massive research literature. But let me first recommend a book by Laura Vaughan. Um, I put it on the book. Uh, I, re I recommend it for three reasons. First, the book is open access. I try as much as possible to use an open access resources in formal teaching. Laura's book links the study of London, Paris, and Chicago. As for example, Toynbee Hall in London, Hull House in Chicago. And she explores the origins, influences on and influences of the Chicago school. Her book reminds me of my own first reaction a long time ago to that strand in sociology. So the place of cities in migration patterns, in world culture, in wealth creation, how cities work and how our people can make cities work for them. These are central themes in diaspora studies. And of course, in the current crisis, an even more important issue. My first reaction a long time ago when I first encountered the Chicago, Chicago School was the usual mixture of welcome and question. Yes, let us analyze complex issues in a rational way, good. Let us be empirical rather than philosophical or psychological or theological. But curious gaps in what is analyzed, a lot about crime and deviance. And so often the analysis boils down to the identifying of a person or the creation of a personage or a persona. At the moment, uh, for obvious reasons, I'm doing a lot of work about London 
One place you see this persona, this analysis, it is in Charles Wood's Life and Labour of the People in London, 1891. And Laura Vaughan is very good on Charles Booth's influence on the Chicago School, on London's influence on Chicago. On Boot, Boot is a great creator of maps. And on Boot's maps, the poorest streets are colored black and the inhabitants there are described as degraded and semi-criminal. Then you have the prettier colors, dark blue, light blue, for streets rising out of poverty and inhabitants of increasing moral worth until we reach the wealthy areas colored white where people are simply wealthy and no moral judgment is made. So all maps are explorations of a mind and Laura Vaughan's book gives you all those lovely maps, really worth going for. Another place you see that persona offered as explanation is in Trevelyan, The Irish Crisis, Charles Trevelyan's preemptive study of the Irish famine in 1848. You're dealing with the same kind of of creation. Okay, I will enter the Chicago School, as you might expect, with some consideration of William Isaac Thomas, W.I. Thomas, as he usually is, whose work in life gives us everything we would wish for from an American academic, including a sex scandal and supreme self-confidence and useful theory, like what is sometimes called the Thomas theorem. If men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. It is an important observation in the social sciences, but three comments. The quote comes from page 572 of a book which has two authors, Thomas William I and Thomas Dorothy Swain. The theorem seems to be about men and a woman author has disappeared from the theorem. The observation is sometimes assumed to be stronger than it is. Men can define situations as unreal, but such situations can still be real in their consequences. Viruses, for example. It remains a powerful observation, particularly in the field of mental health, which as some of you will know, is one of my interests. And I always like to give the quote its context in the book. In the book, it comes in a mental health context. The story of a murderer who had killed several persons who had the unfortunate habit of talking to themselves in the street. The murderer imagined that they were calling him vile names and he behaved as if this were true. If men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. This story always connects for me with the story in Ordi Lang's The Politics of Experience about the man in the psychiatric hospital who heard voices and would shout back at these persecutors until a lobotomy was performed. Lang presents the story as a bad joke, one of many from the hospital, and he says, at least I didn't invent him. Lang gives the patient a name, Jimmy McKenzie, the story seems to become an Irish story. It becomes an Irish joke. The Thomas theorem thus links with the study of schizophrenia, which is a theme within Irish diaspora studies. Now, in our day-to-day -day lives, it used to be true that if you met someone in the street with the unfortunate habit of talking to themselves, you could assume you were going to meet a person with mental trouble. Jimmy McKenzie and his demons. Nowadays, of course, it will usually be someone talking on a mobile phone. But it still means that I am every day reminded of Thomas's murderer. So we're looking at the five volumes of Thomas and Zaniecki, the Polish peasant in Europe and America. The persona or personage that I spoke of earlier is now the peasant. The foundation myth, how W.I. Thomas came to be interested in Polish letters, comes to us in a number of forms, and all forms of the story share two elements. There is an alley in Chicago, and there is garbage. This is Morris Janowitz's version. One morning, while walking down a back alley in the Polish community on the west side of Chicago, he had to sidestep quickly to avoid some garbage, which was being disposed of by the direct means of tossing it out of the window. In the garbage which fell at his feet were a number of packets of letters. 
since he read Polish, he was attracted to their content and he started to read a bundle which was arranged serially. In the sequence presented by the letters, here was a rich and rewarding account and in time he was led to pursue the personal document as a research tool. Then came the alliance with Florian Zaniecki in social science research, we might think insider outsider. Um, the foundation story has been queried a number of times. Is it likely that W.I. Thomas would be walking down a back alley in the morning? We won't, we won't go there. A bundle of letters in sequence. Some versions of the story make it one letter floating gracefully down. But we all know it could easily have been bundles of letters. And this is something you all heard me say many times. All over the world, the possible archives of the Irish diaspora are being thrown into skips, except in North America, where they are thrown into dumpsters. It is not a funny joke. David Pat Fitzpatrick tells us how one morning, Roger Andre, the archivist of the Mortlock Library of South Australia, took his rubbish to the recycling depot, idly glanced at some boxes and realized that he was looking at the entire archives of the Loyal Orange Institution of South Australia. 25 boxes, 150 manuscript volumes. The archivist took the boxes home. I don't know what he said to his wife. The approach of this conference in Paris made me reestablish contact with our Polish colleagues, which is something I had been made to do anyway. In 1999, Belgium and Klaus John Belgium and Klaus Tenfelder organized a conference in Bochum in Germany, which brought together scholars of Irish and Polish migration. And what, there came a point when, when we realized we needed to know more about each other's histories. And one of our Polish colleagues, and I look back at my notes, it was Jerry Kostowski of Poznan. He asked a question, and I think it was a brilliant question in the way that it illuminated Polish history and Polish thinking, and in the light it shone on Irish history. The question was, would you explain the importance of conscription in Irish history? We'll talk about that later. And I wondered what our Polish colleagues had done in the intervening years with that big ugly thing, Thomas and Zemiecki, the Polish peasant in Europe and America. They have made it even bigger. They have given it context. They have embraced it. They have made it their own. In the 1950s, Arnold Schreer formed an alliance with the Irish Folklore Commission to harness the commission's existing research methodologies, questionnaires, tape recorders, and network of interviewers to collect, to collect information about Irish emigrant letters. Shreer thanks the Commission for the invaluable assistance so freely and cheerfully given. And here's my copy of Shreer's book. It is the reprint. Uh, I don't have a copy of the original 1958 book, but very, very brave and interesting thing to do in 1958. This is not the place to explore the intriguing and always underfunded work of the Irish Folklore Commission. And I refer you to Michael Riodi's wonderful book, which is a history of it. And that is also on open access. You can get it yourselves. There is an, interdiscipl an interdisciplinary moment here and the arguments will be familiar to Irish specialists. The approach of the Irish Folklore Commission privileged the study of the people of rural Ireland, mostly the rural poor. This focus on the ideal peasant seems to come from at least three directions. First, there is Ireland's use of the ideal peasant for political and literary purposes. Second, there is the guidance, philosophical and methodological, given to the founder of the Irish Folklore Commission, J.H. Delarge, Seamus O'Delarge, by wider European scholarship, especially by ethnography and especially by his mentors in Sweden, Finland and Estonia. So that's an interesting decision. Mostly independent Ireland has looked to Britain 
for for prep or to the United States. This takes her in an entirely different direction. And third, there is that curious imbalance within scholarship, especially within European scholarship, which privileges the oral above the written. And we've already had a number of papers at this conference exploring that theme. There are many ways to unpack that imbalance, but the simplest might be to cite Derrida's critique of Levi Strauss. And that, that critique has already been brought into Irish scholarship by Tom Duddy with a study of all things Druids. So the exception to this pattern is of course the privileging of writings in the Irish language by representatives of the rural Irish, notably the Blasket Islands autobiographies. But it remains a strange imbalance, a privileging of the people or the peasantry, which ignores the people's own writings. And when, as Arnold Schreer points out, the vast majority of the people were literate. And all these methodologies involved the creation of secondary text, text, te notes taken by interviewers, transcriptions of tape recordings. And of course, at the same time, the, pe the peasant is being privileged in one discourse and disparaged in another. In 1955, in order to get hold of actual letters, the physical objects, the material letter, Schreer had to broadcast, and this is literally broadcast in newspapers and on the radio, appeals to the Irish people. Now, Schreer is not that interested in theory. His book is a good exploration of the effects of emigration on Ireland itself, using the letters as illustrative evidence. Arnold Schreer in turn passed the nucleus of a letter collection on to Kirby Miller, who added it to considerably over the decades in the same way going out and tracking them now. Now, note that the collection has become photocopies of photocopies of photocopies. We have lost contact with the material letter, the physicality of the text. We have lost the information that the piece of paper might give us, like watermarks, for example. Where did the paper come from? Miller, unlike Schreer, developed his project at a time when new scholarly practices meant that a scholar had to engage with theory and had to engage with current discourses. His book engages with many theories. You want the sapir wharf hypothesis? There it is, bang, page 105. Okay. We see here issues of interdisciplinary influences at a particular stage in a specific historiography, the historiography of the USA. Much of these discourses have to do with methodology as questions of samples, but of course, in diaspora studies, there is spillage across the world, especially to the Hoblands vision of itself. Kirby Miller has developed the use of Irish immigrant letters in further important works and informal structures can be detected in the long sequence of formal thanks to Kirby Miller, often but not always in footnote number one. And we can cite letters, uh, studies by Emmons, Corrigan, Coos, Bruce, Noonan, and of course, Emma Morton, whom you heard from yesterday. Just, just a reminder of time, Patrick. I'm coming to the end. Um, clearly, being a pioneer and a center of excellence brings extra burdens. Another way to explore the work of Kirby Miller might be to engage with a sequence of scholars whose work specifically engages with his. So, Akinson, Dorman, we have. Patrick Fitzgerald, there we go, and David Fitzpatrick. But unfortunately, I've run out of time. Patrick O'Farrell's book was choreographed by the Irish Diplomatic Service. The book has created massive problems for Irish history, Australian historiography. The most telling critiques of K Kirby Miller's Emigrants and Exiles come from David Fitzpatrick. Um, but they're often hidden in the footnotes, that was David's way. What we are doing now is what I suggest that our Polish colleagues are doing. We are giving the work a context, we are adding to it, we are cocooning it. So see, for example, Kevin Kenny's work on the historiography of Irish America. 
Earlier this year, 2001, we learned that the Miller Collection is going to Galway. We are fortunate that some of our people, Irish families, saved the letters, often not able to say quite why they were saving the letters, keepsakes, shrines. The impetus to collect Irish emigrant letters came from American academia, from fine American scholars like Arnold Schreer and Kirby Miller, and the impetus came from Chicago theory. Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> Ori. So now, um, yes, uh, maps do speak, as um, uh, Patrick is saying in the in the chat. We have some time for uh, questions. Um, we can take them via the chat, or um, I know there are some people there in the room as well. Any, um, I might start actually just by asking, um, and we'll come to you then next, Emily, just by asking Patrick about the, um, the Kirby Miller collection of letters, wh whether there is a lot of um, Chicago material in that in that archive. Um, I, I wouldn't know. It's 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 not the sort of thing I know about. Uh, Emma Morton did a presentation where she tried to pick out some material from Chicago. In the book, um, you can see specific rich Chicago references in, in Emigrants and Exiles, and you can pick them out, but mm -hmm. you can really only pick them out if you've got the PDF of the book, mm -hmm. which I have, uh, and then you can actually search through for every reference to Chicago. Yes. And sometimes it, 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 one of the problems with the way Kirby did the book was that, that sometimes he is talking about people you can identify and, and there are a number of, uh, there's an Irish speaker in Chicago that he, who, who, number of letters he has from him. Uh, and then th there are other uses of the letters where an abstract entity is created and you don't quite know who's talking. So mm -hmm. I, I can't really answer the question, but there, yeah. there will, because there are now so many there, Chicago will be there. And he's recently given the letters Kirby Miller to Galway, so that they're yes, embarking on them. You will have, you will have I, I don't know if you saw Emma Morton and the look that came over her face. I see that we only just found out that, that Kirby is going to give them to Galway. Um, we found it out just a few months ago. Uh, they were possibly going to go to New York. Um, they are with Kirby in Missouri and he's still using them and uh, so a moment, I don't directly know, but clearly a, moment, a momentous decision has been made and they're going to go to Ireland. And I, I would say that, that part of the way this panel has worked for me is that there seems to me a direct analogy between what Scott was been talking about in the work of Francis O'Neill and the whole study of Irish immigrant letters, in particular this thing, eventually they go back to Ireland. I mean, it doesn't, feel wrong but it doesn't feel right it's it's diasporic we, circuits yeah yeah and we don't quite know what uh, it's the more institute in go in what what they are planning they're talking about digitization but they don't seem to know that many of letters have already been digitized through all the the scholars that i that i have mentioned um uh so it's a, it's a bit uh, like the waterford gentleman scott in your paper saying that Patrick yeah. Tui should be in the university up in Dublin. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Amelie, I think you have a question. Yes, thank you. Actually, uh, it's also a question for Patrick because I actually, I actually have two questions. Uh, the first question that I wanted to ask you is about the blue book you showed at some point. I wanted to write the reference, but I didn't have time. And I'm really, really interested in this book because on the cover, there is a picture by Nico, um, which is actually the reproduction of one of his paintings, which was widely circulated in the form of an engraving, both in Great Britain and in the US. So could you show show this book to us again, again because you seem to be having it next to you? Patrick, that's the, um, the book that has the, the nickel the painting on the front. I think it had a blue cover. Thank you, Claire. That's it. Yes, exactly. The Immigrant Letter. I didn't know this book. It's, it's, uh, it's a reprinting of Arnold Schreer. 
Okay, thank you very much because I and I, the I, reference is in is in my blog. The the other one everybody will know is is the Brennan painting on the front of yes. Fitzpatrick's book. Um, it is one a very of the lovely picture. You you could do is is map co map covers uh, of books because uh, book designers are often very lazy, and uh, the number of times I. I've looked at a picture in a book about the Irish famine and went, oh God, you know, but it's... <laughs> okay, but thank you. And, and, and my other question to you is that then I, I had to look at your blog because you copied and pasted your, your blog in the chat box. And so I have a question, which is why did you call your blog the Fiddler's Dog? <laughs> uh, one, because it's easy to remember. And two, because the little woodcut of the fiddler and his dog, uh, I just fell in love with it. It's from it's from a nineteenth century ball, uh, ballad ballad sheet, and I've used I use it as a sort of logo right across the web. So wherever you see the fiddler's dog, uh, that's me. So. Thank you, because that was so intriguing. I wanted to know. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, Henri, there's a question for you in the. Um in the chat about um, the maps, a self, a self from Anna Artiaga, a self-interested question for Henri Peretz. Uh, thank you for explaining so clearly Irish settlement patterns in turn of the century Chicago. What sources, maps or particular publications would you recommend for post 1930 Irish American settlement in the city, um, in the city of Chicago, if you know any? Well, after the Artiaga, um, the, the, well, I recommend um, the tourist, the, the best maps of, of Bridgeport, for instance, are now in a book of walks in Chicago by, by neighborhoods. So those books are very good. And, and uh, what's the name of the Irish historian? Uh, Pasiga, Pas Pasiga, Pasiga, Pasiga. But in the, in the book of Pasiga, there are very good maps of uh, uh, of Bridgeport, very good maps, actual maps, and uh, well, because uh, very important. So, history. Uh, of, uh, what I want to say is, contemporary is, uh, um, research on Irish by Irish. There is no now, yes, but it's on the past. So, I think the best book. Uh, I buy this uh, Irish historian and also um, uh, his new book on the uh, culture. No, that's the best thing. The best thing. Tasiaga is Irish also. And also, I mean, no, um, I, I could bring also all the, 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 the maps of the census. Yes. Recent maps of the census. Recent, I mean, 1950, 1970, and also um, published. And you see, can see them in a special issue in New York Times. I don't have the reference exact. You have some kind of uh, uh, complete story of uh, uh, Irish and others uh, from 1910 until now. So you have so many things. And uh, very simple. Everything is on, on, on the internet. Very simple. You, you sh everything is on the internet. Nothing. Uh, we work now like this, you see. No more history to work the library. So all this, except the travel guide, the because you want to make money, etc. Everything is, for instance, the, the maps I show, it's very simple. They are all, uh, they are, if you write uh, Chicago social maps, you have everything. So it's easy. Thank you. Um, uh, any other questions? Um, Scott, I wonder, would you be able to tell us a bit more about um, comparatively, how that relationship between traditional forms of musical practice and new technology, taking into account these kind of diasporic patterns of circulation, how um, uh, how the circulation of Irish music compares in relation to um, uh, uh, similar circumstances for other migrant groups in the uh, early 20th century? That's a really good question, and thank you very much. Um... And it's going to be a hard one to think about too. Um, it's to me, it's fascinating that so one of the reasons I was drawn to looking at traditional Irish music was that here's a society that went from agrarian to post-industrial inside of what 
and I, I should turn to to Patty o, uh, O'Sullivan for this because uh, this is stuff that he actually writes about. Um, a generation and a half from uh, farmers to Pfizer, uh, boom, 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 just like that. And suddenly we have um, we have musicians who are learning instead of from their grandmothers and from their grandfathers from YouTube. And I don't see this in other societies hmm. um, at all. <laughs> And it's a, this is this is one of the areas that I think we see really interesting moments of exchange of change in the way that people learn and that people engage with tradition. But I, I'm I'm seeing some of the same things in in as Amelie is, is talking of of art, of uh, when we're talking about access to literature, when we're talking about. Uh, um, I don't know, even in contemporary forms of uh, dance, although uh, Aileen Delan, um, you know, really kind of nailed this uh, in the in the diaspora, especially in Chicago, of how uh, even the, what is the quote that she used? Um, People animate the spaces. And that to me kind of stuck out in that, um, that uh, we're looking at ideas of history that are moving so incredibly quickly. Um, and yet, our ways of trying to study this are looking back to the past and trying to isolate them and trying to um, see larger patterns when in fact it's sometimes the smaller patterns that are things that are the more more important so that's me rambling rather than answering a question interesting. and aileen is just pointing out in the chat that ethnic recordings she says were often used as a means to use the software to sell the hardware um, so vast catalogs of ethnic musics made for the US and then sent home. That's exactly true. And so on that point, um, some of the, the, the last pieces that I brought up in my presentation were mahogany cabinets, Victrolas, mm -hmm. that literally Victor Records went out to the ethnic communities and started selling first to, if I remember correctly, Ethiopian, Greek, and um, Irish followed very shortly after. If you could sell them a record, they needed something to play it on. And mm -hmm. that was where the money was. The records were, quote, loss leaders. So yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Great. And we have, um, there's another question in the chat. But first, I think in the room there in Paris, we have a question from Jim and then Brad. Oh, Jim, you want to go? Go ahead. My, my question is you. Um, I have a quick comment for uh, Scott, which is that uh, my uh, erstwhile dissertation student at the University of Chicago, Michael Dunahy, who became a musician in Chicago and then a celebrated poet when he moved to England, was working at the end of his life on a series of poems about Chief O'Neill. Um, and there's one I'm thinking maybe we'll read this afternoon during our ceremony about Chief O'Neill called Reprieve, in which he offers a reprieve to an Irish flute player in Chicago who has assaulted a Chinese man if he plays uh, three reels, three, three songs slow enough for him so that he can transcribe them. Uh, uh, but this was what Michael was working on when he died at the age of 50. Um, but my question is actually for Henri. Uh, Brad and I were talking last night about why the deadline is where it is and the paradox that the African-American community is actually in the better real estate, uh, closer to the lake. Um, so- No, not to, no, never to the lake. Never get to the lake. They are, they are, they are closer to the lake. They are closer to the lake, that's so, true. So, so, that, so that we have the paradox uh, in 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 the in the mid twentieth century of the yeah, of, of the the African Americans owning the South Side Lakefront, which is why it was so badly maintained. Um, it's only in recent years that the South Side Lakefront has been improved a little bit. Yeah. Um, but African Americans yes. control I think that lakefront. Cotatic Road was the frontier. Cotatic Road was always the frontier. Okay. They never crossed Cotatic Road. I think. Oh, fair enough. Question though is why was it just there? And is the answer the railroad station from Clarksdale? I had once heard that. That's that good. so many yes, African-Americans yes. came from Clarksdale. It was yeah, one place, Clarksdale, Mississippi. Absolutely. 
The railroad station Absolute. was there. Absolutely. They, and they and they had Excellent. relatives Absolute. nearby, and they just walked to yes. the to the to the to Absolute. The, and they walked further uh, down. Yes, yes. But um, that's Indiana. a book of that's a book of uh, Lehman. Lehman book is on uh, exactly like uh, that. Okay, okay. Absolutely, you're absolutely, absolutely right. So absolutely. Teresa's Teresa's Blues Club at 48th in Indiana was a sort of 40s yes, yes. No, no, uh, absolutely. extension of that. Yeah, uh, that's the answer. Yeah, uh, one of the answer, and also because I mean. The station before on Grand Boulevard was a Jewish rich neighborhood, and they left very quickly. They left very quickly. They couldn't afford those houses, and they left them. So there is the same problem like Harlem. Slowly they leave, they sell, but and the black people settle in, in the beginning in very beautiful housing on Grand Boulevard. But I think they never get through Cottage Grove. The, for instance, Ida Wells I was in yes. on 30 something, it's just at the border, the most, the most east, the most east. And now and east is what cottage? Yes, uh, yeah. cottage. Thank you. Um, and I Brad, please. I, I want to make a, a comment and then uh, and then a couple of comments, but one is I'm struck by a word that Eileen Delane uh, used last night about the ephemeral nature of Irish Chicago and how uh, things change so rapidly. And yet the art of Ireland, the, the music of Ireland wants uh, a, a long as a constancy, perhaps. And uh, the, the, the Irish experience in Chicago, people are moving all the time that they're moving Career jobs, they're moving houses, they're moving neighborhoods. And I'm, I'm really, uh, yet, yet there are a handful of things that stay the same, the deadline, Bridgeport, but the rest um, is, is, is so fluid and so uh, in motion that by 1930, the Irish aren't even on the ethnic map of Chicago in the same, I mean, they, they just, they, the, the diaspora continues even in Chicago and spreads out and now people are all over. Um, I, I find that really, that's a takeaway for me from this conference, but I'm really glad that Henri brought up Englewood, which is a neighborhood that Chicagoans don't know very well, is not well studied. We'd, and by showing that map with the railroads, I, I learned, I, I, you struck a bell with me that the reason that Englewood, it's as middle class or up, you know, working class moving up towards middle class as it's built, but it has this small nucleus, a small early yes. community centered around a railroad crossing. And that's where African-Americans live, a small number, and they form this small little spot and it grows. Yes. And that's the clash. At, at this the moment, they are, they are less. It's not so permanent. So uh, maybe yeah. in the 1940s, there are less Negroes. And then, yeah, yeah. So the difference between a Bridgeport, which has those yeah, boundaries, yes, yes. has the railroads, has the deadline, has, has, bound, has physical barriers, plus the defended the barriers, bastion, the bastion, the bastion, it becomes this and hold and resists any racial change until the 1960s, 70s, when Latinos move in and mm -hmm. Asian Americans move in, and they don't resist that. But Englewood um, racially transitions rapidly in part because there aren't barriers and maybe it's a class issue. Maybe it's, I don't know. I mean, somebody, somebody's got to explain why Englewood uh, doesn't resist racial transition, but Bridgeport does. And I, we don't know, I don't have a good answer. So that's a comment. And, and also the ephemeral nature of, of, of America versus Ireland. And that. Thank but, you for uh, Englewood, there was always um, institution, um, uh, there was already, uh, I mean, in the old times, already a, a shopping mall, and the famous bank became mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, still there, it's still there. Right. And now, uh, uh, food, the most famous uh, food, Mark Food, what's the name? Aldi. No, the other wood on uh, food. Uh, well, anyway, it's it's yeah. a, it's a middle class black jewel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not the other. No, don't worry. It's a it's, it's a paradox. Englewood is a middle class. And we know also one of the most violent uh, places today. today. Yes. Yeah, it, it's got this big history, and Irish are involved. It's complex. It's not as strongly Irish as Bridgeport, which produces the yeah. mayors and 
Yeah, but thank you. Uh, so we have a couple of um, questions about music in the chat, but just before we come to those, I'll, we'll take those together. I wanted to ask Emily um, just a little more about Erskine Nickel, the, this uh, fascinating set of um, this vision of Ireland in the 1850s that, as you say, seems so detached from social and economic conditions on the ground. And I wondered towards the end of your paper, were you suggesting that there is a connection between these depictions of leisure uh, and ease and the kind of organized withdrawal of labor by the Land League, um, Michael Davitt and so on, for example, is, is there some, were you suggesting we can kind of think of those two things together uh, that the, the Land League uh, boycotting and asking the Irish to, as it were, stop working? Um, it's it's something that I have suggested, yes, because there are pictures of our Erskine Nickel which are much more political. Mm. Um, some of his pictures actually show tenants being evicted. One of them is at the National Gallery of Ireland in Dublin, so you might have seen it. Um, it's called an, evic an evicted family. And so, but, but these pictures were were seldom shown in public exhibitions and, and in Chicago, they were never showed. And actually I didn't have a lot of time to do more research in the industrial expositions, although I wanted to, um, because what is interesting is that I had a look at the other Irish pictures which were showed in 1881 and in 1887 and in also um, other exhibitions because you know, they lasted for 17 years. Mm. But whenever there were Irish pictures, um, they were never political. Most part of the time, they were either genre pictures, you know, showing peasant women, uh, children, or landscapes, but they were never political. And I mean, they could have been, um, if this had been the will of the committee, they could have been. And I, I can show you, um, for example, uh, what an evicted family is like. Um, because, because it's really a poignant picture that Nicole painted in the 1850s and which tackles the issue of evicting tenants uh, who were then left without any resources to survive. And, um, and he has other pictures painted in this vein. He also showed an old man on the steps of a, of a porch being evicted as well. So he has very, um, very poignant pictures. Uh, denouncing what was happening, but they were never the pictures that were selected uh, to be showed in America, which to me is very paradoxical given the American involvement in Irish nationalism that has been discussed uh, these last two days. Oh. Um, this is even more paradoxical, as in Paris, for example, some of these more controversial pictures were actually exhibited. So, so in France, it was, ac it was acceptable to show um, distress um, on, mm. in, 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 in the fine arts, but apparently in America it was not. So basically if you have ideas around the room, because we are being 20 right now, on the reasons why, I would also be interested to have mm. your advice, because to me it's really, it's really puzzling. I like the idea of distress and the fine arts, Emily. It's a nice, uh, like, uh, a nice title. Yes. Actually, if I can show you right now, I can show you uh, an ejected family, which is at the National uh, Gallery of Ireland. I don't know if you can see it now. Oh, yes. Yeah. The, the, the quality is quite low, but you can still see it's the whole family which is being evicted. And it's a picture that Nicole did in 1853. So it was, well, just after the Great Famine. So, so it's a very poignant picture. And you can see the whole family uh, gathered. You have this... Um, this religious um, somehow <laughs> connotation there because it's like a holy family with the baby reminding the viewer of Jesus Christ, especially in the 19th century, uh, where you had this tendency to have uh, religious illusions mm -hmm. um, in painting. So it's, it's, it relates the distress of Irish peasants to biblical themes like the flight from, uh, from mm -hmm. Egypt, for example. Um, and, and this, of course, enhances the tragic dimension of their, their evictions. So, so there was potential for, for using the fine arts to denounce what was happening in Ireland, but, but the organizer did not use this. They, they preferred to show um, less controversial pictures. So that's puzzling. So can I say, first, is it Courbet? Yes. And second, there was no 
market for poverty, for image of poverty. There is no customer. People don't buy this at that time. They don't buy this. Yes, that's very important. They don't buy this kind of image. So a museum can show it, but private collectors never buy this. Even to show they surmounted it. <laughs> Painting is a market. Actually, actually some, some Americans collector did because the, the pictures that I showed are at the end of the disputed boundary. It was bought by an art collector called uh, A.T. Stewart, uh, who was interested in Ireland. And this is clearly a, a discussion of, um, of, of, uh, mm. of a boundary, of a frontier of land, of pos possession of land. And of course, this was at the heart of the fight of the Irish language. Who possesses the land? either the people who have the documents and who uh, depend on colonial rule or the people who live on the land and have a natural right to the land. And of course, this, this for me is a, a very significant picture and it was bought in America. Um, maybe mm. I can uh, show this to you again. There is the map and maybe, oh, you might like it because there's a map right in the middle. Um, <laughs> the map is very important in this picture. Um, actually, it's, the, the quality is not very good either because it's also a picture which was very, very hard to find because mm. it, it was seldom showed uh, in public. I can show it to you again. Can you see it now? Yes. So you have yes. this large map. Actually, I mm -hmm. wanted to, to talk more about this picture, but I didn't have time and I didn't want to. You know. Ireland or Chicago? Ireland. Ireland. Yes, yes, it's clearly ah. seen happening in Ireland um, because it was painted in the 1860s and in the 1860s, Nicol actually lived in Ireland in his oh. studio. And you have this large map in the center okay. and you have a suggestion by the way he's dressed that this is an Irish peasant who's actually asking for, for land. Mm -hmm. And you have the clerk or the solicitor in the background with the penniless mouse who is rather listening to a man who seems to be a middle man who was, you know, the, the person at the time who was between the landlord and the tenants and who was somehow organizing land distribution. And he's yeah. dressed more richly and the peasant, so you can guess he's arguing with the peasant there, and the, the clerk is clearly listening to him, but you have a, a potential for more argumentation and more, more quarrel here, because in the background you have another solicitor putting on his glasses, and who seems to be willing to listen to the farmer, and who seems to be willing to side with him, and so of course today's viewer would, well, I would definitely side with the farmer given the historical context and also because I have, uh, I mean, my grandparents were farmers, so I can, I can, I, mean, I feel touched by this kind of pictures. Um, but, but you have this potential, this, this reference to, to, um, to what was tricky politically speaking at the time. And these pictures were in America and this one was bought by an American art collector called Stewart. He was a collector, but he was also involved in art dealing. So he also bought pictures that he considered um, as potentially marketable or that would have success in being sold again, uh, making profits. So, so I agree with you, Henry. There were not many art collectors who were interested in having controversial pictures, but still they were. So why would a public exhibition like the Chicago <laughs> Industrial Exposition yes, not show this one, for example? But this one is on Ireland. So my question now, these people bought, the people buy uh, image of poverty in the United States? Because yes, here, yes, because it was an American collector who bought this picture. Yes, yeah. what I mean, but it's because it's an image of Ireland, not Chicago. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. Of course, nostalgia, yes, yes. native, native. Well, it's a kind of nostalgia of the yes. native country. But, but thank you, it's marvelous. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful our time. Time. Circuit. Uh, Emily, there's a, um, uh, an observation by the great Irish historical geographer, John Andrews, who says that it's only in fiction that we ever find an Irish gentleman poring over his maps. Uh, <laughs> so there's a kind of a fondness for this sort of representation. Um, we just have a few minutes before we finish, and Scott has been answering a couple of questions there in the chat, but do you want to make any more remarks, uh, Scott, just about one comment was about the relationship between um, uh, the two great migrations, jazz and Irish music, and the other to do with um, the uh, shift in reputation of, of Chief O'Neill and when that happened. 
Oh, that's a really interesting questions. And I'm hoping to do uh, much more thinking about this and talking um, offline. But the idea of the great northern migration coming up from the south to Chicago to the indu uh, industrial um, future, um, especially for um, uh, black Americans, for African American um, folks, um, I see some incredible parallels with, uh, with people, you know, um, coming out of very harsh situations and dropping into a future that is suddenly possible. And yet we hold on to the things that we came with, which is what, you know, immigrants do, um, food, culture, dress, language, and especially music. Um, and so the blues uh, slash jazz, I can see as a perfect parallel with traditional Irish music, even though you drop into a new metropolitan society and a new reality, and suddenly you have flexibility and you can make advances and you can do things that are experimental. And that's how, you know, Chicago blues is its own particular thing. And uh, the Chicago jazz scene was different than New Orleans for sure. And I have a feeling that that's one of the reasons why innovation of using recordings and um, documenting things was something that was possible for, for the Irish diaspora too, was that here you are in the city of big shoulders and you can do things that are different and new. So these are conversations that I think are really important and I'd love to continue with. Mm. It's been fascinating and Aileen is just, um, hi Aileen, has been uh, pointing out in the chat as well that the kind of those sort of sonic cross uh, pollinations were more audible in New York and some of the same kinds of reasons you're suggesting there to do with professional recording companies and um, of course segregation as well. Um, so if everyone is agreeable then we might conclude our um, uh, morning's panel. I believe um, uh, there is more to come in the afternoon but just to say thank you to all the presenters for absolutely excellent presentations and a really great discussion afterwards, um, a brilliant session. Yeah, thanks all. Okay, great. Uh, so first of all, thank you Arno and, uh, and Thierry uh, for organizing this wonderful conference and for inviting Anne and me to, to chair this uh, round table, uh, Globalization Ireland and its Diaspora. Uh, so Anne and I are members of the GIS era, so, uh, which has collaborated with this conference. Uh, and the GIS era is a research uh, network, just for those of you who might know, of uh, academics in Irish studies in France and abroad. Uh, one of the research strands uh, that Anne and I co-head uh, is on the Irish diaspora, which explains our, our presence uh, here today. And just for information, uh, we hope to organize next year a conference on the Irish diaspora and the concept of soft power. So if any of you are interested in participating, uh, the call for papers will be out soon. So I am now going to introduce the topic of this round table and then we will introduce our esteemed guests. So Kevin Byrne, John Bradley and Fergal Cochrane, who have honored us with their virtual presence today. Uh, and we thank them for being here. Uh, so just a quick quote from our former Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar in 2018. 100 years ago, we were a small island on the periphery of Western Europe. In the next 100, we will be a nation at the heart of the common European home uh, we helped to build, an island at the center of the world. So this was a quote from the policy document uh, titled Global Ireland 2025, uh, published in June 2018, uh, and it states that while Europe, uh, the UK and North America will continue, so I quote the document, to enjoy prosperity and global influence, emerging powers will play a role of growing importance on the world stage, uh, both at the economic and political level. Hence Ireland's need to ensure that it is, uh, quote, ready for these new realities and opportunities and is engaging fully with both traditional and newer partners, end of quote. This document presents the Irish government's plan to expand its global footprint accordingly. 
increasing Ireland's diplomatic presence, both in countries that have been its traditional economic and political partners, but also in emerging countries that is one of the pillars of this Irish strategy. Soft power is at the very heart of this scheme, encouraging education opportunities in Ireland for overseas students, uh, promoting awareness of Irish culture worldwide, developing economic diplomacy are among the chief priorities of the Irish government. It is essential to highlight that the Irish diaspora features as a key actor in this plan. So in this round table, we will discuss Ireland's strategy and the role of the Irish diaspora as envisaged in the Department of Foreign Affairs policy paper in the context of a multipolar post-Brexit, post-Covid, we hope, post-globalization maybe, world. So I'll just start by introducing uh, Kevin, uh, so you all uh, get, a little, get to know him a little bit more before you hear him speaking. Uh, so Kevin Byrne was appo appointed Council General of the Midwestern uh, United States in September 2020. He joined the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs in 2010 and has served in EU Division, Corporate Services and in Ireland's Consulate in San Francisco. He also worked in the Department of the Taoiseach, so it's the Prime Minister, where he planned Ireland's successful 2013 presidency of the European Union. Prior to taking up post in Chicago, Kevin was secretary to the management board of the department uh, and policy liaison with Oris Anouk Duran, the office of the president. Uh, before joining the Foreign Service, Kevin worked in the European institutions in Brussels, the think tank sector in London, and taught in France and Japan. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I am honored to introduce our uh, other two guest speakers, Professor John Bradley and Professor Fergal Cochran. Uh, I have actually quoted both of them in my recent research, so I am absolutely delighted to welcome them to uh, this online panel. Uh, John Bradley was a professor at the uh, Irish-based Economic and Social Research Institute. John probably uh, doesn't remember, but we met in 1996 when he was working there. I was a PhD student at the time. And the second time our paths crossed, and I don't think you remember it either, was in Caen in 2009, where you presented a, a, an inspiring paper at a conference organized by Anne-Catherine Lobo and Christophe Gillissen. John has published um, extensively on the island economy of Ireland, EU development policy, industrial strategy, and economic modeling. He has acted as a consultant to the European Commission and the European Parliament, to many EU member state governments, and has carried out research and training projects uh, in the EU, Western Balkans, and Africa. He writes a fortnightly column in the Mayo News entitled Notes from the Western Periphery. Fergal Cochrane is uh, an emeritus professor of international conflict analysis in the School of Politics and International Relations at the University of Kent, which he joined uh, in September 2012. Professor Cochrane's research interests uh, center on the dynamics of uh, politically motivated violence and emerging peace processes within ethical ethics ethnically divided societies. Uh, he's particularly interested in political and cultural aspects of diaspora communities and has conducted research on the Irish American role in the Northern Ireland conflict. Beyond the Irish case, he's interested in how diaspora uh, communities intersect with peace processes and political violence within deeply divided societies and how these groups engage from the outside with political and cultural processes taking place within their countries of origin. Fergal Cochran is the author of uh, The End of Irish America, question mark, Globalization and the Irish Diaspora, published in 2010 uh, by Irish uh, uh, Academic Press. Now, uh, as Grania uh, mentioned it previously, part of today's discussions will surround uh, the policy document titled Global Island 2025. 
This document makes it clear that Ireland intends to take full advantage of economic globalization. However, this phenomenon seems to have uh, slowed down in recent years, which led the economist uh, to coin the term globalization. The economic consequences of the current pandemic, as well as Joe Biden's plan to tax GAFAM, may well prove to be the last straw that breaks the camel's back. Could this tendency thwart uh, the objectives set in Global Island 2025? Could key members of the Irish diaspora plead the cause of Ireland in the highest spheres of power in the US? Now, Kevin, if you would care to open discussions on this topic, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Anne and Gronje, uh, for the opportunity to join this panel uh, and to share it with uh, professors Bradley uh, and Cochrane. Very much looking forward to the discussion. Uh, and bonjour à tous in Paris. Um, I'm joining you from a quite rainy Chicago, uh, which I think it's quite rainy there in Paris as well. So at least we have we have that in common. Um, Look, this is a fascinating topic uh, and the idea of Ireland in a post-world, post-COVID, post-Brexit, uh, and I suppose we'll be discussing whether it's post-globalization. But just maybe first to speak a little bit about the ambitions and the reason behind that Global Ireland 2018 document. Really, in 2016, Ireland saw three or two of our core core relationships change and change quite dramatically. 2016, obviously the Brexit, uh, vote happened in the UK, which saw the UK just choosing to leave the European Union, which obviously has has had and ha is having a uh, huge knock on implications for Ireland's relationship with our closest neighbour, one of our largest trading partners, the UK, um, but also in our relationship uh, north and south of the border. As well, uh, we had a constant partner uh, in the United States that was always a very strong advocate of Ireland, always a very strong advocate of globalization and the multilateral world order. And then, of course, in 2016, we saw the election of President Donald Trump, which again really started to question uh, some of those uh, certainties that Ireland had taken for granted really over the previous 60, 70 or 80 years. The reason for the policy document wasn't just a change, though, in the external environment. It was a change in Ireland as well. So if we look at Ireland of 2018, we see an Ireland that is increasingly diverse. Uh, we've got 16% of the population of Ireland born outside of the island of Ireland. Uh, we see Ireland as one of the most open and globalised economies in the world. And obviously having vastly benefited from that, but obviously during the, the global recession, having uh, suffered quite heavily from that as well. And as well, there was a change in Ireland's ambition. Um, and I think this is the point I just want to stress. Ireland has always had quite uh, an active and robust presence on the world stage. But at the same time, our presence has been quite small. You know, we have uh, 85 missions uh, in 2018. Uh, so really, we're represented in, in less than half of the world. The ambition of Global Ireland was to increase that representation uh, not just by opening up new embassies, but opening up new trade relationships uh, with partners that we may not have traded with before. It was also about developing broader relationships with certain countries and partners uh, that we had had for many, many years. So for uh, Ireland has a very large development aid program, predominantly in Africa, but also in parts um, of Southeast Asia. For so long, those were really just development partnerships. And what we noticed over the last 10, 15 years is that those countries were rising and they were having increasingly strong economies and they're becoming more engaged in the global economy. And we wanted to shift our relationship to be not just one of development support, but also working with them uh, in, in business, economics, trade, education uh, and foreign policy areas. I suppose if we look at where we are today in 2021, uh, three short years, and we have opened up or are opening up 13 new embassies or consulates. So we have two in North America, LA uh, and Van, uh, sorry, two in North America, LA, Los Angeles and Vancouver, two in South America, Chile and Colombia, four in Europe. We've opened up Cardiff and Frankfurt. We're opening up Manchester, uh, a consulate in Manchester this month, and we're opening up Kiev uh, in the coming months. 
two in the Middle East or the greater Middle East, uh, one in Jordan and one in Morocco, which will be opening up uh, in the coming year, and then three in Asia, Oceania. So we've got a consulate in Mumbai, uh, an embassy in Wellington, and we're opening up an embassy in the Philippines. So really we've seen quite a dramatic increase in just three short years. The goal is over the next uh, four years is to open up another 13 consulates or embassies in new parts of the world. I think one of the really important points uh, that you touched on is the importance of diaspora in Ireland's global engagement. Um, at home in Ireland, uh, we often think that uh, Ireland is one of the largest uh, countries in the world, uh, not because of our population, which is quite small, uh, about just over four and a half million in the Republic, about six and a half million on the full island of Ireland. Um, but because of our diaspora, we've got a diaspora of about 70 million right throughout the world. And really in so many of our relationships, our diaspora has been core um, to opening up doors um, and lifting up um, Ireland's uh, profile in the, country of, um, in the country of accreditation. So for example, here in the United States, we've got somewhere between 30 and 32 million uh, Irish Americans who claim Irish heritage um, on the US census. Um, and right throughout the States, those Irish Americans help us to make connections that it would be quite difficult for a small country to make. We're also looking at new aspects of our diaspora. We, uh, a successor policy document, or a, I suppose a, a document that sits under the broader Global Ireland umbrella. We launched our new diaspora strategy in November of last year. Um, and really that focused on a number of goals uh, to foster, grow and support our diaspora. The first one was to ensure the welfare of the Irish overseas and Irish abroad. That's the core um, goal of the Department of Foreign Affairs in our engagement with the diaspora, to support those diaspora members who may have left and find themselves sometimes in, in difficult situations. Promoting uh, our values and celebrating the diversity of our diaspora. And this is a new piece. Um, for much of the history of Ireland's engagement with our diaspora, we've engaged with predominantly an, you know, a, a white Irish Catholic diaspora um, in each of the countries that we engage in. That's changed uh, over the last number of years. And in this new strategy, there are goals that were to reach out and to make uh, stronger connections with those Irish that may have left Ireland under difficult circumstances. So members of the LGBTQ diaspora who wouldn't have felt welcomed uh, in Ireland for so uh, much of Ireland's history, um, mixed race Irish diaspora who again may not have felt uh, welcomed or included, um, some, uh, some uh, uh, women and members of the, of the female diaspora who again may not have sought uh, or found the opportunities that they wanted in Ireland. So there's a big push now for us to make uh, stronger relationships with that aspect of our diaspora. And then the third uh, strand is to reach out to our new Irish. So uh, our members of the Irish diaspora who may have just attained Irish citizenship or what we call the affinity diaspora. So predominantly uh, Europeans who would have lived in Ireland, maybe raised a family for a number of years and returned to their country of origin. So again, even in this new space, arguably post-globalization space, Ireland is still relying um, on those who have a strong connection to Ireland to help to advance our values and our interests. GAFAM tax that Joe Biden is actually uh, uh, planning to implement, I was wondering if you know, the diaspora could do something about it. Yeah, very good. Uh, a very good question. Uh, and obviously, um, you've got an ear inside the foreign ministry in Ireland, because at the moment, issues of taxation are core uh, to the work that we're doing here. And um, there's a whole uh, body of work, not just uh, in the US, but at the OECD to look at uh, global taxation and global taxation of corporations. It's something that, uh, you know, we're looking at very closely. Ireland obviously has uh, a well um, a well-supported in Ireland uh, and a well-known corporate tax rate of 12.5%. Um, this is something that we see as central to um, Ireland's economic success uh, over previous years. And it's something that we feel is part uh, of a country's, um, you know, a, a part of a country's normal tax policy to be able to, 
um, to, to set their tax rate um, to, to drive their economic growth. Um, does it pose a challenge? Yes, it does. Um, I suppose, does it pose a challenge to aspects of Ireland's model? Yes, uh, and I know Professor uh, Bradley will probably be able to speak uh, more to this. Um, does it pose a challenge to the achievement of Global Ireland uh, 2018? I don't think so, because Global Ireland 2018 goes beyond just markets. While that's important, uh, Global Ireland is really about a broader engagement right throughout um, our area, our relationships with uh, other countries uh, and other regions. Can members of the diaspora help? Members of the diaspora have always been helpful to Ireland um, and uh, Professor Cochrane uh, will be able to speak uh, more to this and obviously his, his work uh, speaks quite a lot about the support um, at senior level um, on Capitol Hill that Ireland has received uh, right throughout uh, the peace process, right throughout the drafting of the Good Friday Agreement and indeed in the two decades since then and there's been particular support um, for Ireland's position uh, in the Brexit negotiations from very senior Irish Americans on Capitol Hill uh, and indeed now in, in the White House. On the taxation piece, it's more nuanced. Um, there are many shades uh, of diaspora members, those who support um, stronger global taxation, those uh, who are, um, you know, who would support uh, current arrangements. So I'd say on the taxation piece, it's nuanced. Uh, but definitely on the broader political north-south um, aspects, the diaspora, particularly in the States, has been very supportive of, of Ireland's position. Thank you very much, Kevin. Can I turn over to uh, John to uh, have your opinion on, this, on these questions? Yes, Anne, uh, thank you very much for having us. Um, the wonderful thing about this conference is that you've been dealing with the 19th century and the early 20th century. And of course, as uh, Kevin has outlined, uh, Ireland today is a very different place. Um, the, um, the, the, the problems of globalization have to be seen in a historical context where for from the period 1932 until the late 50s, early 60s, Ireland was not a global economy. It was a heavily protected economy. Um, uh, we attempted a, a, a development strategy which was kind of Sinn Féin um, and it failed. <laughs> And that the shift to a policy of openness uh, was doubly lucky. Uh, one, uh, we were one of the first movers in the post Second World War reconstruction period to throw our economy open. And we did so because we had very little to lose. There was not much industry generating profit in Ireland at the time. Um, and secondly, we did it in a very ambitious way. We didn't say, well, let's tweak our corporation tax down a little bit and see who will come here. No, no, we just set it at zero. And we were lucky enough to have an extraordinary organization, the Industrial Development Authority, who marched out in, mainly into America and ballyragged people and pulled all the diaspora strings. <laughs> and got the initial crucial American companies to come here. So when Intel, for example, came, that sent a signal to all the other American national, uh, multinational high-tech companies to come. So we've been living off that for a while and it's wonderful. And Ireland, from an economist perspective, is the place it is because of the success of the foreign multinational sector. But now we're faced with a global movement in the G7 and elsewhere to harmonize corporate taxes. So we're going to have to probably over the next few years um, uh, move away from a pure tax-based strategy. But of course, when you delve into the Irish model, there's a lot more going on than low taxes. Um, that the links between the American producers are quite strong. They've stayed here for a very long time. They've renewed their investment. They're not just screwdriver operations. Uh, we have generated a huge amount of foreign tradable services. 
uh, where tax is important, but remember, it's not the Irish low tax rate of 12.5% that's the issue here. It's the double tax thing that ends up being registered in Ireland and paying zero tax in Bermuda or something like that. That's the issue. So uh, if we suddenly found we had to compete on an even playing field um, with respect to corporate taxation, could we succeed? Yes, I, I think we could. I, I, I think the, the Irish uh, multinational uh, strategy is, is very robust. Um, but more interestingly, and this is where I've been working a lot on regional economics in Ireland, there is a spin-off of Irish firms who are becoming Irish multinationals. Port West in, in Westport is a classic example. Um, McHale's who produce and sell um, industrial farming equipment all over the world. And they have succeeded because of their the tutelage of the foreign firms. So it's, it's, it's a much more vibrant uh, internal dynamic than this sort of narrow issue of corporate taxation. And that's why, as I come back and conclude, uh, why this conference is so interesting, because we get to look at Ireland before it modernized where the energy was in the diaspora. That's where the energy was. That's where the economic drive was. Very, there's very little coverage in the Irish War of Independence as subsequently of economic issues. They're, they're more concerned with political issues. Thank you very much, John. Fergal, would you like to add something? Uh, thanks very much, Anne, and thanks, Gronje, as well, for the invitation to uh, take part in a very fascinating discussion. Um, I suppose uh, one of the one of the things that resonated with me from both John and and uh, Kevin's contributions was the almost as if uh, the the diaspora provides a sort of wormhole through time, you know, where we can connect or are connected up not just economically, but also historically and politically and culturally. And uh, I think that's one of the issues that I, you know, I think um, this strategy is tapping into and is quite uh, clever about. Uh, you know, there is a debate now about you know, where the state actually ends and where the international begins. And I think that diasporas and obviously economic issues uh, you know, are not necessarily contained within a just a tax regime, uh, because of our, because of our, um, you know, our our, our, our uh, mobility and uh, and the, and the way in which international finance now it is no longer contained within a just within a nation state, and I think that a lot of what Kevin was saying was also connected into that. That we, you know, there is a sort of post territoriality about our our modern lifestyle, and uh, we may talk about this later on in the discussion, but. Um, I suppose it's about how that's harnessed and how it's experienced. And one of the questions I had for, for Kevin really was, was whether the Irish strategy is, was self-generated or the extent to which they looked at other countries. Because if you look at India, you look at Israel, for instance, you've got other countries as well, have these efforts to try and mobilize their, their diasporas, particularly countries with had you know, traumatic dispersals a long time ago, one of the maybe unique things about the Irish diaspora, it's not unique, but it's certainly its certainly notable, is that it, it's a diaspora that's quite old and it has evolved through the economic and social levers uh, to the point where it's quite hegemonic, uh, arguably, rather than, uh, you know, people with one way tickets to an uncertain destination. And, you know, if you've got a return ticket, I think it completely changes your outlook than if you, if you leave through compulsion uh, and, 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 and you have to say goodbye. And so that's a very long winded waffly way of asking, you know, was the Irish strategy taking lessons from other countries um, and sort of giving them a sort of an Irish spin or, 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 or was it very much just self-generated looking at, you know, the Irish economy and Irish Thanks, Fergal. And yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, 
The answer is yes and no. Um, one, I think the core fundament of the policy was around recognizing the diaspora that we currently have um, and how we ensure that we maintain and support it. Um, in many respects, there's a number of, you know, we have a number of different diasporas and the manner in which we support and engage with them uh, changes uh, and, and is different. You know, so I suppose there's, there's a level of diaspora where Ireland supports them um, and uh, much of the, so we have a diaspora fund. Uh, it's spent about 200 million over the last 15 years. Uh, to about 500 organizations in over 35 countries and that's called the Emigrant Support Program. The vast majority of that, 80-85% of that, goes to places like uh, you know, the London Irish Centre um, and uh, organizations in Manchester, Liverpool, uh, New York are big diaspora cities and a lot of the focus of that is on supporting are you know older diaspora who may be, have become disconnected from Ireland or sometimes disconnected from the social services that, that they provide. And then I suppose the second diaspora, and this is probably the diaspora that we're, we're speaking a little bit more about in terms of, of the business, the globalization piece, would, as you say, be those diaspora members who have become you know, very successful in their own right, very well established um, in their countries, often are in the corridors of power or at uh, you know, senior levels in business. Um, and we have engaged with members of those diaspora in quite a structured way, particularly post um, financial crisis. So we had what we call the Global Irish Network, which were senior, senior diaspora members in business that would have come back to Ireland uh, a number of years to have very high level conferences with you know, the president, the full government um, and uh, other thought leaders. Um, but sorry, to come to your question, I've, I've, I've gone off the point, to come to your question, yes and no. So yes, we knew that, yes, there were some countries that we looked to, you mentioned uh, India um, uh, and Israel, that we would have looked at um, their diaspora strategies and, and what they did. Um, but I suppose in the, the actual strategy and how we put it together was very much based on, you know, how Ireland had changed, how our relationship with our diaspora had changed or developed, and how we strengthened that um, as well, in you know, in your book, the the end of Irish America, that's you know, that piece there is something that we're very conscious of. That America is changing and Ireland is changing, and in these two changing states, will the diaspora link remain as strong as it's always been? Um, if you look in sheer numbers, twenty years ago there were thirty eight million Irish Americans uh, on the census. Uh, in the most recent census, there were thirty. One, um, so by any metric, a fall of seven million in sort of fifteen or twenty years is quite a staggering number. Which is why we're now trying to focus not just on those that would have left Ireland or their great grandparents would have left Ireland, but those that have another form of relationship uh, with Ireland uh, as well. Okay, great. So, so I think this leads on really nicely to the second part of the of the, the round table. So Fergal, you were talking about the post territoriality of the lifestyle, in fact, of, of, of Irish people and of this diaspora. So one of the other themes we wanted to cover was the term diaspora itself. Uh, um, does it apply uh, anymore? Uh, do we need to relook look at this term? Uh, what about trans? national community is this maybe better suited now to the more modern uh, era, era because many people uh, do move back and forth uh, from ireland to their to their host country or there's this more of a movement perhaps for a certain uh, a certain number of people uh, and what extent could we take this into account or has it been taken into account in the diaspora strategy uh, also the america and ireland relationship um, can we hope now perhaps for an improvement in this uh, maybe now with the new presidency, uh, with Joe Biden, might this change? Could it be something positive for the future, for future relations between uh, both countries? Uh, um, maybe, uh, let's see, Kevin or, jo or John, or uh, if you wanted to, to maybe answer that first, or uh, I'll open it up as well. I might just very briefly speak about, um, I suppose, the change in administration. Um, uh, yes, yes, uh, it has made uh, the relationship um, easier. I think if you talk to any European country, uh, the previous administration was 
unusual, um, which meant that the method and means of engagement was, was different. Um, Ireland obviously has a relationship not just with the White House, um, but right across the United States, our relationship with the US uh, runs wide and deep. Uh, and I suppose the person that sits uh, in the Oval Office has a huge amount of authority and power um, to change aspects of the relationship, but you know the business, educational, tourism, people-to-people -people links uh, remain strong, uh, and indeed many of those grew um, over the four years of the Trump presidency. Um, but I suppose in terms of the core values piece, you know, Ireland is, you know, we're firm believers in the multilateral world order, um, we're firm believers in open uh, economies, we're firm believers in um, in so many of those core tenets, I suppose, of, of Western democracy that at times uh, were challenged by the previous administration. So has the new administration uh, made a difference? Uh, yes, there's, there's been a change. And indeed, we've seen certain things uh, improve. Uh, just recently, there, was a, there has been a big uh, issue between Airbus and Boeing, um, uh, and there were tariffs which quite negatively impacted upon Irish agricultural goods, which obviously hit deep into sort of, you know, deep into Ireland, particularly into farming communities, which uh, have a large number of people working in them. So um, they, they've changed that that's gone away. There's been greater engagement um, on that point. Uh, and then obviously the fact that in Joe Biden, we have probably arguably uh, an Irish American president, more Irish American than JFK. Um, he's a man who quotes Irish poetry all the time. Uh, he even attributes non-Irish non poets uh, to Ireland, which we'll take, that's fine. Um, so uh, from that perspective, I suppose the mood music, the mood music has changed. Um, and I think, you know, similarly, not just Ireland, but many European partners would, would say something broadly similar as well. Great, I don't know if Fergal or John would like to add something, uh, yeah. Uh, do you want me to go ahead or wait for John? I don't mind. Okay. Um, yeah, just, just to pick, just just to pick up on this issue about you know what do we call what do we call ourselves and or what do we call the diaspora? Do we call them the diaspora? You know, I I I've lost count of the number of academic conferences I've been at where we've just we can't even agree on how to pronounce the word diaspora or whether it's diaspora or whether we should call call them something else. And to me, that's a completely pointless conversation. Um, for me, the the uh, the, uh, which isn't to sort of decry your, your your focus on it because you know it is interesting, um, but the, I think the reason it's interesting is because of who the diaspora are, what they do, uh, how, how they're positioned, and this is I think again Kevin's point, you know about about trying to harness the energy there and the networking, and to me the diaspora connects two principles. One is obviously dispersal and movement and traumatic a traumatic movement and quite often group movement rather than incremental, you know, just sort of incremental seepage uh, from one country to another. Quite often it's a traumatic dispersal. Uh, many countries have had that. Um, and the other, on one of the other dimensions of it then is also the way in which quite often um, this trauma evolves into something much more, much more useful, much more positive both economically, politically, and culturally. Second bit of the reason why I would still use the word diaspora is because it's not just about the physical aspect of movement, what you might call migration. Uh, the other aspect of it is an existential one, really, to me. It is, uh, you know, hanging on to home, hanging on to your, your, maybe your religion, your ethnicity, your language, other dimensions of, the, of that. Um, uh, at various levels, of course, it's not uniform, so it fluctuates massively. Uh, so, you know, there have been sort of typologies of diaspora, and to me, one of the most, um, I suppose, politically dynamic ones is not so much the first few criteria which are about moving, but are the, the criteria that follow, which were about attitudes, behaviour, um, Going back to the country, you know, thinking about going home, and I, I've been over. And I lived. I've lived in England for twenty years. I never call it home, and it really annoys my partner, you know, when I say I'm going home, talking about going back to Belfast, which is where I'm from, and she says you are home, you know, and uh, and she's and she's second generation Irish herself, but um, 
you know, this, I th and I think for, a, and I think that's what connects a lot of these people of Irish heritage, you know, what the document calls the global Irish is the sense of that they have something in common with people down the generations. And I think that connects in then to sporadically, it's not uniform, but sporadically an interest. And the, the interest at the moment, I think, is about Brexit. And hopefully we're going to talk about Brexit, another one of my uh, pet subjects. Um, and the protocol and the Good Friday Agreement. And, um, uh, and, and, I, and I think that sometimes I think the Irish diaspora struggle to find a sort of a, a an issue. I mean, it, for, it is also a bit undocumented in the United States, as I'm sure, you know, I'm sure Kevin knows and does a lot of work around, you know, be, the undocumented since 9-11 has been a massive issue for Irish America, but not necessarily one that they've won on and they're still sort of trying to, trying to lobby around that. But the peace process, Good Friday agreements and Brexit are issues where you can definitely see the diaspora um, at various levels connecting into it. Uh, and so another thing I think is really fascinating, uh, Just I'll just stop talking in a second because I don't want to hog it, but um, I think that one of the things that's really, I think, uh, helping the Irish strategy is the way in which um, uh, the digital economy, I think I mentioned this before, but our, our just our, our mobilization, our ability to um, tap into our preferred identity or take pieces of different identities is really being um, uh, uh, facilitated by our, 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 our ability to have bank accounts in different countries, multiple passports if, uh, if our, our country of origin allows that. Um, uh, you know, cultural, cultural access through Zoom, through Skype, through websites, even to our local newspapers. And, you know, I've interviewed people in the United States who said the best thing for the diaspora was the invention of the jumbo jet. And I thought, right enough, there was a time before the jumbo jet existed, you know, and air travel really facilitated um, an ability to reconnect rather than say goodbye. And I think so now it's, now it's au revoir rather than goodbye. And I think that that's massively important for the success of a strategy like this. Um, you know, rather than thinking, well, those people are gone and we've had our wake and we won't see them again. And now it's about actually their, their assets. Uh, they are, and I don't want to sound too instrumental about that, but, you know, they are now introducers, you know, they are assets, they are cultural assets. And just, I just want to finish now on, on talking about sort of cultural diplomacy, because I think it's very clear from social media, looking at, you know, if, if you look at, you know, Dan Mulhall's Twitter feed, uh, or, or the Irish Embassy in Washington. There's an awful lot being pumped out there about poetry, about um, not just that, but as, as Kevin was saying there, this not necessarily a white Catholic vision of Irishness, but a very multicultural, you know, second, third generation type of diaspora that's, uh, that's now in existence and actually championing, championing that, opening it out, um, which I think is very progressive and very, very welcome from my from my point of view, um, and and I you know and again that obviously is is connected in with the economic policies and with the the political policy and I think the G seven was the sort of moon landing for a lot of that strategy really where a lot of the issues were very you know non territorial or climate change, COVID, um, you know uh, multilateral alliances and. Um, and, and Biden definitely planted his flag with the Northern Ireland Protocol. And, uh, you know, and I, and I think that that is definitely had an impact indirectly on British policy uh, with regard to Brexit. But I'll, I'll, I'll shut up now and uh, leave it to others. Thanks. Okay. John, I don't know if you'd like to come in on, on this. Yes. Um, once again, could I come back to the wider historical themes of your conference? Um, if I picked up one message from the papers yesterday um, and the day before, um, it's that there was a maturing process of the diaspora that was being described, particularly interestingly in Chicago, where coming into towards the middle of the 20th century, it 
it became difficult to get people to identify as Irish and they were being absorbed into the wider population and other racial and ethnic groups were taking a, um, playing a more role in the diaspora. Now, the other thing to remember is uh, that although Ireland was a relatively small country in the 19th century compared to say Italy or Germany or whatever, the proportion of Irish people that emigrated was massive. It was the biggest of all the migrations of the 19th and 20th century. Um, so that I think generated a peculiar effect for the Irish diaspora that they had almost been cast out of their country and they held on to it, but they gradually became absorbed. And uh, I have relatives, my wife has relatives in Chicago and we meet them and they talk about coming home and they use the Irish kind of idioms but they're creatures from a different planet. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're American, they're not Irish. The use of the diaspora for Ireland's relationship with the US, which is this topic is about, was interesting. The IDA um, in the middle 80s, during the OPEC II global crisis, the Ronald Reagan crisis, um, they were pitching to get Intel to come to Ireland. And they had maintained a database of all the electronic engineers who graduated in Ireland during the 80s and immediately left because there were no jobs. And they were able to go to Intel and say, Intel were looking to, to locate the first fab plant outside uh, America. And they were able to say to Intel, look, um, if you come to Ireland, we can, staff this factory with 2000 electronic engineers overnight because they had um, queried, they had kept in touch with these people and said, if a major multinational came to Ireland, would you return home? And they did. Uh, so the final pitch was between Tel Aviv and Dublin and Dublin won it, uh, mainly on that kind of clever use of the diaspora. But of course, America benefited from this relationship as well in that they had a very secure English speaking production base rigidly located within the, what became the European Union. And the uh, Irish government went, went to great uh, uh, um, uh, extent to facilitate this. So you could clear into America in Dublin airport <laughs> You know, we had ceded sovereignty to do that. You could enter America on Irish territory, which uh, you know was very clever, and this was a really good use of the diaspora. But I, I, I think the maturing element that your conference has demonstrated by the diaspora means that we're now dealing with vaguer issues of goodwill and cultural identity, the music, the poetry, the art. That's going to take over now and um, will be just one aspect of what makes Ireland play punch above, above its weight in, in the um, uh, global economy. And I guess that's what the Department of Foreign Affairs are after to maintain that. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Grania, I don't know what you think, but it's quarter to Fargo's sorry, Anne wants to say something, did you? Sorry. Um, I'm not sure if there's time to, to discuss this or not, but I was interested in just coming back on John's point there about the fact that you know the the, the diaspora um, uh, you know, sort of what would you call it, lobbying power or or manifestation of it is now going to move in the cultural realm. Um and I would sort of, and I'm, at the moment I'm sort of curious about, and this is, I don't want to put Kevin on the spot here. Uh, I'm sure he can get off the spot if he wants to, but but I'm, I'm wondering about whether or not we're now seeing, and I'm talking now Ireland post-Brexit, UK post-Brexit, and the American relationship in the middle of that, to me is fascinating. And um, I think, and also the fact that we're now post-Cold War, which again, I think is also in the macro level changing Ireland's potential leverage, if you like, vis-a-vis -vis the United Kingdom, and whether we're now moving into a situation where 
um, Ireland can, because I, I wouldn't get too misty eyed about Joe Biden's presidency, right? So, um, you know, the United Kingdom is a much larger country than Ireland and always will be. But Ireland is now, uh, you know, a key member state of the European Union, and the United Kingdom is not anymore. And I think that the United States is really looking at the European Union as, an, as building a, sort of a, a set of alliances there. Is Ireland now going to be the bridge into the European Union in a way that maybe in the past the U United Kingdom would have played that sort of a role? Is that something that Ireland's looking at and thinking about as a sort of a as as a next step of its sort of political diplomacy um, and using its using Irish America almost as a vehicle to 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 do that? So and I, I, I'm not saying that's and and and, and you know. A, Going in a different direction, John's contribution, but I think it's I think there is a hard politics there that is also going to keep uh, is is going to go along with the cultural aspects of the diaspora's involvement. I think, uh, and I'm just wondering. Yeah, I might I might just come back on uh, uh, Fergal and and John's points. Um, I think on John's points on the and I really like the way you said it. It's not just um. It's not just about getting misty-eyed uh, about Ireland. I suppose, yeah, there are there, look. There are two aspects of our diaspora. There's the piece around, I suppose, the broader mood mood music of wanting to maintain those links and connections with Ireland. Uh, and I think in the cultural sphere and cultural space, because Ireland is so strong uh, culturally, um, I think I think that's one way that we maintain it. And um, obviously, there's an element of challenge there because if you look at Ireland over the last twenty, you know, if if you described Ireland twenty years ago. And Ireland today, um, and didn't you know didn't put the tag of Ireland on it? You possibly think that we're talking about two two different countries, um, and that's something that is a challenge for us to educate our diaspora about Ireland and the changes that have taken place in Ireland. You know, Ireland is now arguably one of the most progressive countries in terms of social policy in Europe. Uh, we were not 20 years ago, you know, first country in the world to um, vote for same sex marriage. We've got one of the most progressive policies in the world uh, on gender recognition, uh, particularly on passports and official documents. Obviously, we had uh, we repealed the Eighth Amendment uh, in Ireland, which had a, a prohibition on abortion. So Ireland has changed uh, quite dramatically over the last, you know, over the last 10 years, really. Um, and that poses a challenge sometimes around connection with the diaspora who remember Ireland as dancing at the crossroads and, you know, comely maidens and, and, and farmland and, you know, beautiful Atlantic coastlines. It is, we are elements of that, but we're also, you know, a very, you know, high tech, modern, progressive, young country. So at times there, there are challenges to, to connect those, those two, uh, which is why I think the, our strategy looks at diaspora very broadly. Um, and then just to come back to, to Fergal's point um, on um, Fergal's point on uh, Ireland as a, as a bridge. Exactly. Look, Ireland, that's a core part uh, of our message to the US. We have a, a new US strategy, uh, which again is published on, on, the, on the internet. Uh, and a core element of that, a core strand of that is Ireland as a transatlantic bridge, you know, really leveraging the point that Ireland is culturally understandable uh, in America. Um, we understand them, they understand us, and we also understand the European Union, which many in America don't. Um, uh, so there is definitely an element there. However, John, just to go back to you, uh, Fergal, to, to go back to your point around the hard element of politics, I suppose the one element that Britain will always have that Ireland doesn't have is, you know, Britain is a military power and they are engaged on the world stage. And Ireland, from a US perspective, is interesting from a security perspective. And so for that security relationship, which really is the base of any US relationship, Ireland is not in that space, nor will, nor can we be. Um, so look, there are elements where Britain will be the first, uh, or Downing Street will be the first number that's called from the White House. But there are other aspects where it will be Ireland, uh, and that's on, you know, uh, privacy policy uh, that's been developed in Europe, uh, broader elements around the digital economy, 
uh, the environment, all of those big, uh, I suppose, broader areas where Europe is, is taking the lead, Ireland definitely sees ourselves as, you know, as a bridge between uh, the US and, and, and uh, the EU. Thank you very much, Kevin. I think we're going to drop uh, topic number three and move on to topic number four directly because uh, uh, it's on Brexit and uh, it concerns the political as well as the economic uh, aspect of, of that question. So, uh, Gronja, if you... Uh, yeah, so just to yeah, to the time that's left, maybe we could talk about the yeah, Brexit and it's, uh, is it likely to have the far uh, reaching consequences for the island of Ireland politically and uh, economically. Um, while Brexit is viewed as a threat, could it also be viewed as an opportunity on the economic front uh, by, by, for example, Ireland could look to, to other markets, uh, other opportunities. Uh, um, and from the political point of view, some now see the unification of Ireland as a serious possibility uh, in the long term. Uh, is the Irish American diaspora still expected to play a part in this process? Uh, uh, if it is, uh, would any of you uh, care to, to elaborate? Uh, what's your opinion of the, the post-Brexit situation? I, could, I was going to open it to anybody, so I don't know if anybody would like to. Uh, maybe Fergal, you were keen to... <laughs> To discuss this, I think. <laughs> uh, well, I, I have written a book called Breaking Peace, a Brexit in Northern Ireland. So, um, you know, that sort of positions me a little bit, I think, uh, in terms of what I think about it. Um, you know, I think, I mean, peace was breaking in Northern Ireland without Brexit, but Brexit has, I think, has introduced another uh, element to it that it really problematizes the relationship. And you can see that. And actually, obviously, today is the five year anniversary of Brexit. I'm not sure if I've mentioned that yet, but, you know, this day five years ago, we were, you know, um, we we're all on tenterhooks. I was actually flying over to run a conference in Belfast on devolution uh, with some colleagues. And we had a section on Brexit in the afternoon and I worried it was going to be just dead air because, you know, it's probably be remain. So we'll, we'll have nothing to talk about. And the next morning, the Prime Minister resigned of the United Kingdom and we lost half our delegates because they're all having emergency meetings, all the politicians about, you know, uh, what they're going to do. Um, and it's very much, I think, moulded the debate in Northern Ireland since 2016. We've now got the protocol. Uh, you know, we were a blind spot. Northern Ireland was a total blind spot in the whole Brexit uh, debate, which uh, for me wasn't really about the EU membership. It was more about race actually and immigration in the United Kingdom and the Conservative Party's own civil war. And it wasn't so much about like an audit of membership of the EU. And if it had been, we would have had a bit more data on the, you know, on, on the benefits and, and negatives of that. Um, but in Northern Ireland, it wasn't, they didn't really see Northern Ireland as a significant problem that they couldn't address. They thought they could sort of, sort of square that off. But I think once it happened, everybody in Ireland, North and South, realised there was going to have to be a border somewhere, <laughs> somehow. And once Theresa May sort of stated her position um, as looking for a relatively hard Brexit and, and leaving the customs union, it became even more clear that Northern Ireland, or that, that Ireland and Northern Ireland was going to be the sort of the, the you know, the collateral damage there. So. And for a lot of the time, it was about a border in Ireland. And again, this brings us almost back to the diaspora point as well about the fact that it wasn't just about trade and it wasn't just about economics and uh, it wasn't even just about, um, you know, the physical space. It was also about identity very, very quickly in Northern Ireland, as you might imagine. Uh, how a peace process that was built on ambiguity about let's get on with the journey and let's worry about the destination once, once we get on a bit. Um, it forced a binary certainty. You were either in the EU or you were out, and you're either on one side of a border or you're a different side of it, and you're going to be maybe a wrong side. So, Brexit, and we're still in the middle of that. Um, we're now getting, you know, warnings slash threats of uh, disorder if the Northern Ireland Protocol remains. Uh, we've had chaos in the DUP. Um, you know, somebody said, I think there's five leaders in a couple of months of unionism and three leaders of the DUP in a month. Uh, so they are searching for a strategy. They don't seem to have one at the moment. That to me is not 
any good news for nationalists either because you need to have a you need to have a unionism that is is not frightened of its future and i think at the moment it is and that therefore they are um trying to resist and so one of the questions you asked is this going to uh lead to irish reunification i i, I think it certainly put that in the public realm when it was in the academic seminar room and i think it's very much now a policy issue and uh people are taking different positions on that uh, but i think we're you know we're only really starting to think about what would it mean what would it mean for northern ireland what would it mean for the irish republic um what would it mean economically politically and culturally uh you know and we're totally at sea with those questions at the moment and i know the irish government set up at you know a, a, a shared island unit and so on and there are there are various uh, groups that are trying to get somewhere with that process but um I, I, I think we're very much at the beginning of that conversation, but that's a conversation that's not going to go away, and uh, and I think it's and I think we will see organic change uh, coming over the next few years. Okay, I don't know if anybody wants to come in on, on this, or if we should open the floor to questions. John, perhaps you'd like to say something. Mm. Yeah, um, my worry with the British decision to leave the EU is that it embroils the Irish government in a very fractious uh, process that must surely be taking, forcing it to take its eye off the ball of being a small island at the center of the world. Um, and it's very interesting. Uh, may I make two points that might seem unrelated to this topic, but they are. One is your conference focused on the cultural manifestations of the Irish diaspora in America. Um, I didn't pick up many resonances of the culture of Northern Ireland. Uh, they kind of seem to vanish. Um, and I, of course, I, I'm, it's a slightly mischievous point to make because I, I, I know why. But the second issue is that um, the engagement of Ireland with the EU was very, very deep. And the EU development model is one that evolved organically from the iron and coal or the coal and steel community in the early 50s through the uh, uh, customs union, the EEC, the EU, the Euro. It was a process that moved on. Now, when you go to the Good Friday Agreement, that went nowhere. It, it was frozen in aspic. It was clearly negotiated through gritted teeth and set the political atmosphere for the next series of decades. There was no evolution. Uh, the prototypical cross-border institutions that could have been like the coal and steel community and evolved into mutually beneficial organizations never evolved. Um, and there is no likelihood of movement from the union aside. Now, I, I think that's desperate. Um, and that's a big political problem for the Irish government. And I have no idea how they will solve it because the British engagement with the European Union was shallow and ignorant in a way. They don't understand the distinction between the single European market and a customs union. Um, they never bought into the European model. Now, <laughs> we're caught in the middle, but I have absolutely no doubt that our our loyalties lie to the European Union, and we desperately try to contain the negative fallout of Brexit. I might, I might just come in uh, there on this, um, and excellent points made by by John and, and Fergal. Um, and uh, just, just to, to one point, just John, on your point of have we taken our eye off the ball on the global island at the centre of the world? Um, I'd argue that we haven't. Um, so uh, it's kind of shocking to be reminded that now is the fifth 
anniversary. I don't know. I don't know if I'll say birthday commemoration of uh, of the Brexit decision um, of the Brexit vote. Um, but in those five years, Ireland has opened up, you know, uh, 10 to 13 new embassies in new parts of the world. And as well as that, we've also lobbied very successfully internationally to win a seat on the UN Security Council. So uh, Ireland uh, was in uh, every uh, two years, there's a number of rotating members on the UN Security Council. So the highest uh, security body in the UN. Uh, we were up against Norway, which has endless wealth uh, and Canada, which is, you know, massive and a member of the G7. Um, and Ireland won, but we beat Canada. Um, I can say that because there's no Canadians on this. I hope there's no Canadians in this call because we're trying to mend relationships with, with Canada. Um, but we won. So Ireland won a seat uh, on the UN Security Council, um, which really does put us uh, as a small island at the centre of the world. And part of our Global Ireland strategy is about building on those relationships that we made um, over the previous number of years, lobbying to be on the UN Security Council. Uh, this is our fourth time on the Council. It used to be that in between elections, we would, you know, in the run-up to elections, Ireland would suddenly arrive in Tuvalu or Kiribati or uh, some small country in Africa, and we'd say, hi, we're Ireland, and you should really vote for us in the UN Security Council. Um, and, and, and then we did support their interests while on the council, but then after Ireland kind of, you know, the tide rolled back and we pulled back our people and focused again on the EU, the US, the UK, uh, Australia. Um, the, the purpose and goal of the Global Ireland strategy is to have and to maintain those relationships. So now Ireland has a small island developing states strategy. Uh, we've opened up an embassy in New Zealand. Part of their work is to work uh, with, with small countries in the Pacific. Uh, we're going to be opening up uh, new embassies in sub-Saharan Africa and in West Africa. So really, I'd argue that no, uh, with, with Brexit, I don't think we've taken our eye off the ball. Um, but then to jump to, to Brexit, um, which I think since in the last five years, every Irish diplomat has said at least once every day. Um, and I'd agree with, with what Fergal said. Look, it has upset uh, the balance. Uh, there was sort of quite a delicate balance uh, in the relationships in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I'd agree with John as well on elements of, of what he said around over the last 20 years, have we seen the benefits that we would have hoped from the Good Friday Agreement? Not all of them. Uh, there are certain areas where there is quite good North-South cooperation. Um, Tourism Ireland markets the island of Ireland, north and south. Uh, we've got an initiative called Education in Ireland, which is hugely successful, which markets Ireland as an education, Ireland, north and south as an educational destination. And in fact, Ireland has the most international students per head of population of anywhere in the world. So from that perspective, it's, it's been very successful. Um, but has it made things difficult. Uh, John mentioned the British decision to, to leave the European Union. It was really an English and a Welsh decision. The Scots and the Northern Irish voted uh, to remain. Um, and as Fergal mentioned, it's th that blind spot around the fact that Northern Ireland was an interesting space um, uh, and the Good Friday Agreement created uh, an interesting space <clears throat> whereby you could be both British and Irish. And you know, there was no border between uh, North and South because both the North and the Republic were both in the European Union. Um, and it really, you know, it was a blind spot of, of the Tory government that they just did not think about the consequences for, for Ireland. Uh, and I'd agree with John, it is a huge challenge um, how we move forward. Uh, Ireland has been, and I think maybe we haven't discussed the EU uh, enough. Um, or I haven't mentioned the EU enough in our in our conversations, I suppose, because I'm here in the States and because the focus is, is on Chicago, a big focus has been the importance of the US diaspora in, in Ireland's uh, foreign policy. But really, Ireland is, a, you know, we're a member of the European Union. We've been in the European Union for, for 48 years. That is the core fundament of Ireland's identity. There's a reason why the EU flag sits in an equal place uh, with the Irish flag. Uh, yes, you know, Ireland is, uh, is, is an EU country first and foremost, that is core and fundamental to our identity. Um, and Ireland's, the position, I suppose, and what we see as um, a success for Ireland's perspective in the Brexit negotiations is because all of our European partners stood with Ireland. Um, and that is something which I, you know, 
over the last number of years uh, in the Brexit negotiations, you know, the British strategy was essentially to try to separate off EU member states um, to get support for their position. And right throughout um, member states, both those with a close relationship with Britain and those with a, 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 a more distant relationship stood with, with the Irish and European position. Um, is it challenging? Yes. Uh, why is it challenging? We had an agreement. Uh, we had the withdrawal agreement and the protocol, which was agreed by the European Union and the British government. And now, once it's being implemented, the British government is coming back to say, well, you, you know, you're being too, you're being far too strict on this aspect of international law. The whole purpose of international law is that it's strict and it binds countries uh, to, to, to key obligations. So look, there is a challenge, um, but, uh, you know, Ireland and the Irish government is working with the EU to try to see how we can help uh, to, to support um, a, a, a positive resolution. But again, disarray uh, in unionism in the North is a problem. Um, it's, it's, it's something which, uh, you know, the Irish government supports a, a number of unionist groups as well through our uh, reconciliation fund. Um, and, you know, disarray in one of the communities in the North is, is a challenge. Um, and it's something that, that is concerning. Okay, great. That's wonderful. Yeah. I think we'll have to move on to a few questions because our time is really running out. Um, I see a question on the on the questions and answers or a comment. I'll just read it out. Inside the world of Irish art, so it's from uh, Marty Fahey, uh, there is a very strong history of Northern Irish representation and leadership in that cultural space. I wonder if there are opportunities therein to explore the Irish Northern Irish relationship in meaningful and constructive ways. The same opportunities exist in the world of Irish music and Irish poetry. We always say that Ireland leads so well in the world of culture when we engage with the rest of the world. Perhaps some insight and potential dialogue healing can be found here. So I don't know if anyone would like to comment on this. Very interesting comment and if it's as if the, the unionist community doesn't have the, the courage to state their culture, uh, to put it out there the way uh, Southern Irish culture is. And culture could work very well to heal the political divisions because the images of shared historical experience the emigrations, the earlier emigration, mass emigrations from Northern Ireland to America that preceded the Great Famine. All, all this is documented in cultural expression. It's, it's a very nice point. I don't know if there's any more. Oh, yeah. Fergal, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just, just to pick up on John's remarks there. And, and the question was a great question, a great comment, actually, I think. And I was reminded of, of what Professor Joe Lee, uh, a, a, a very eminent Irish historian that many of you will know, he, he was talking about the sort of Ulster Scots community back in the you know, 19th century, 18th century. And he, he used this phrase that they rose without trace. And what he meant by that was they assimilated, they wanted to be American, they, 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 they did not define themselves as, as Irish or necessarily British, and they wanted to uh, assimilate and sort of merge in. And I think that one of the cultural uh, problems for a lot of the Northern Unionist community, they wouldn't see it as a problem themselves, but it's a, it's a sense of, of knowing where the space is, where, the, where, where the, an expression, where, where they feel that they can express their Irishness in a way that doesn't undermine their British identity. Uh, in a way that somebody who's Scottish can emphasize their Scottishness and still be British. And uh, you can certainly see that in the work of Northern uh, poets and, and Northern playwrights, uh, I think. Um, and there, there's definitely something I think can be done there to, uh, even the Irish language, you know, is seen as something that's been appropriated by Sinn Féin or an Irish Republican dimension, which I wouldn't buy into, but nonetheless, I think a lot of unionists would see it that way. And uh, and there are there are examples where uh, there are you know northern uh, Protestant groups that are learning Irish 
that are that are moving into Gaelic games and playing those in East Belfast, for instance. Um, but it but if that space shrinks, then that is going to be sort of kiboshed. And the problem is, if the political space shrinks into a binary, you know, us us or them type mentality, it's very difficult, I think, then for these cultural expressions to to evolve and and, and get traction. So, yeah. So I think it's a, it's an interesting point, but I think it's there and maybe not recognised as much as uh, as it should be. Okay, I see that Greg Greg Coos. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Has his hand up. I think I might have a question. That yeah, uh, I'd like to do just a bit of a follow up on uh, the uh, notion of of the Ulster Scots and their relationship with the United States. They Ulster Scots didn't lose their identity. The Ulster Scots ultimately underscored and helped create American identity. So much of the cultural ethos of the Ulster Scots became part of the definition of what an American is. Americanism, for instance, is in terms of a cultural image, one of the pieces is the log cabin. And the log cabin is strictly a wooden version of a Irish hall and parlor house. Um, agronomy methods, uh, cooking, there's, there's a huge amount of, of culture which is Ulster Scots that is identified as American. So they, they didn't really disappear, they actually redefined, which is different than the experience of the Catholic famine immigrants. I might, I might just add just a little piece on, on the Ulster Scots piece, both uh, Greg and, and Marty's point. Um, one of the new consulates that we opened in a previous wave here in the US was in Atlanta. So it covers the, the South East, uh, Gulf states and then on up, uh, on up north a bit, um, and it covers six and a half million Irish Americans, um, and the majority of those Irish Americans, or those uh, folks that would uh, ascribe some Irish identity, would be from the Ulster Scots community. And really, the focus of that consulate is to more broadly engage with members of the Ulster Scots diaspora. So, uh, in previous years, they've brought over. Um, with our Irish government uh, cultural funds. Uh, they brought over bands would march in on the 12th uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, they would have brought over drummers, you know, to show that there is that link and connection uh, and that that's something that we're trying to support um, as well. Okay, great. And we have a question from Andrew Wilson. What role does the Irish government want the Biden administration to play in the ongoing Brexit dispute? And what role do you think it can play? Uh, we have to wrap up in five minutes. So if the three of us want to say something on this, just keep in mind that we, you know, you have to be uh, to be brief. Okay, thanks in advance. Um, I'll, I'll, I might answer first and I'll be very, very brief. Um, very good question. Uh, I think you saw at the G7, uh, the role that Ireland would like President Biden to play and it is you know, core for us in these negotiations is the support um, and continued maintenance of the Good Friday Agreement and the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement uh, and finding a resolution which uh, maintains peace on the island of Ireland. So I suppose support for international agreements that have been signed, that's really uh, the role that we hope that uh, the Biden administration will play. Uh, obviously at the moment it's still early in the Biden administration's uh, term, uh, we still have no uh, U.S. ambassador to Ireland. I know that there have been calls as well for a special uh, representative um, of the president to Northern Ireland, uh, and I know that that's something that is being considered uh, by the administration in uh, Washington. Thank you. Could I could I say that much more bluntly? I'd like him to tell the British to behave themselves in Northern Ireland, or they won't get a U.S. U.K. trade agreement. I think just to just to come in on that on, on both of those points. Um, I think that uh, that it, it, it's it 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 was pretty clear that um, that Boris Johnson's Brexit policy took a different turn when Biden won the election uh, because he had the internal market bill on the table and he was sort of trying to use that to use UK domestic legislation to undermine the international treaty that he had signed. Um, and he pretty quickly took that off the table. So it, I, I, and I, I obviously can't speak for the Irish government, but my reading of it is that, you know, Ireland wants the US almost as an arbiter 
of the good, you know, of of the um, uh, the, the bona fides of the United Kingdom's commitment to what it signs up to. And it's clear from Biden, from my reading of it, that he said that, you know, you're going to be at the back of the queue to quote Barack Obama, or maybe even further back, uh, if if you renege on the protocol. And it was, you know, he was pretty adamant about the importance of the protocol. Um, and he seemed to be leaning slightly more towards the Ireland's and the EU's understanding of the problems and implementation there than he was towards David Frost's or Boris Johnson's understanding of what the problems were. But I suppose we'll have to watch that. But you know, he, you know, that's sort of a good offices role, third party type of of uh, holding, holding it, keeping everybody honest. I think on it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, to the three of uh, of you. You know, for uh, this uh, very uh, rich and thought provoking uh, discussion. Uh, really, and I wish we had had more time, you know, to uh, uh, talk about this. Unfortunately, we have to give uh, the floor back to our colleagues for another uh, roundtable. So, uh, you know, hopefully we will, uh, you know, speak again, um, you know, next year in the context of our forthcoming uh, conference, international conference on Ireland's uh, soft power. For you are very much welcome, you know, to uh, to participate uh, in it. Uh, so um, I think it's time to part. Unless Gronia, you want to uh, add something? No, just want to thank you very, very much for for being here today. Uh, sorry you had to get up so early, Kevin, but uh, I think it was really worth it. It was really fabulous, but, uh, and I hope that we'll see each other perhaps in real life uh, at some stage. Uh, so really great. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. All right, so uh, I'm very pleased to, uh, to be um, uh, chairing this uh, session, this roundtable actually, about um, the, the role of culture, of Irish culture in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, history and, and maps, and, uh, and uh, we've had the pleasure, it's a pleasure also uh, to uh, have uh, Aileen and uh, Charles uh, speak to us again. Um, but um, we have a new guest uh, this evening and uh, it is uh, Jude. Uh, so um, so um, uh, Jude Blackburn is uh, the founder and the programmer of the Chicago Irish Film Festival. And um, so, in fact, uh, I, I'm not going to, uh, to read uh, the, the rest uh, of uh, the presentation because that's precisely um, the, what I'm going to ask you to do um, this afternoon, that is to say, uh, to uh, present uh, the festival and uh, its uh, main uh, purposes and how it is organized and uh, what sort of audience uh, it uh, addresses. And um, then, um, so uh, uh, perhaps it's uh, uh, superfluous to uh, introduce uh, Aileen uh, Delane uh, again, but for those who are, uh, did not attend her fantastic uh, keynote lecture uh, yesterday, uh, I remind you that uh, she's a senior lecturer in music at the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at the University of uh, Limerick, and uh, she uh, studied at the University of Chicago, from which she received uh, a PhD in ethnomusicology. And uh, of course, she is a distinguished uh, scholar who has been uh, invited uh, to uh, several academic uh, institutions. And uh, she is a co-editor of two book series on uh, called uh, popular music, popular music matter and uh, discourse uh, power and uh, discourse power and uh, society, and uh, so she's currently completing a, a monograph called Irish American Musical Imaginaries, um, and uh, so uh, and it is based on her experience of. Uh, uh, 
uh, playing and, as she said, performing and both as a research, um, performance based research, we could say, uh, in Chicago and uh, Ireland. And um, uh, Charles uh, Fanning, our third, uh, the third participant in this roundtable, is also a distinguished uh, professor who received uh, of history. Uh, he, uh, his last uh, uh, institution was Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, and he was awarded uh, several prizes uh, for his uh, books. Uh, uh, especially one on um, um, Finley Peter uh, Dunn and uh, one uh, called uh, The Exiles of Erin, 19th century American uh, fiction. So um, um, what to introduce you all, I just wanted to say that perhaps we could uh, turn the conversation perhaps uh, towards uh, the present, because much has been said already about uh, the influence of Irish culture and the way that uh, culture helped uh, um, the Irish diaspora to maintain a sense of identity. So we may wonder um, what has happened uh, to this uh, identity and what role uh, a culture can play uh, today in a globalized uh, world uh, as well. We could also um, wonder about the, 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 the notion of circulation, that is to say how uh, culture circulates uh, between the two countries. You, much has been said already about, uh, of course, Irish culture moving to America, but what about uh, the other way around? And uh, uh, again, uh, circulation, that is to say the circularity of this, uh, uh, of this uh, transfer of cultures. But uh, first of all, let's uh, start with uh, film and cinema, uh, which is uh, an area that we haven't mentioned at all um, uh, so far. So, um, so Jude, uh, first of all, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And um, so, uh, so to speak, you are a representative of uh, uh, civic life, so to speak. Uh, you're, you're not an academic uh, uh, yourself. So can you explain uh, um, how the, the festival uh, started and uh, who organizes it? How is it organized? And what sort of films uh, do you play? And uh, what sort of audience uh, also? Um, is it, does it address? Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted. And um, I, I appreciate the fact that you've underscored that I am not an academic. I have never published a single word on cinema, any cinema, um, but I do have 22 years of experience uh, with Irish film um, in the United States and in Ireland and have served on many, many juries. Um, so I have a somewhat of a healthy background in, in Irish film. Um, the festival started in 1999, uh, really just as the Irish Film Board was being relaunched with Michael Higgins and Lilia Doolan in uh, Ireland and um, healthy funding to the Irish Film Institute. So they were two organizations that really helped um, the festival in its early years. The festival was founded on Chicago's South Side, which is a strong Irish centric community of Beverly Morgan Park. Ever since the Chicago fire and the dispersion of the you know, people, Irish people there closer to the downtown Southwest, Western area. And, um, we were at the time looking for programming as every arts center is always looking for new programming new audiences and independent film was also emerging at that time moving away from the major studio production so we felt that you know that was something maybe naively that we could acquire um, i think many people who are in the arts frequently start with very naive uh, ideas about acquiring uh, pieces uh, works and you, we simply went forward. I mean, literally, um, 
at that time making phone calls in the middle of the night and uh, searching the news and the papers um, for films and and uh, literally calling up and asking filmmakers if we could show their film in Chicago. And surprisingly, they were delighted because for the most part, Irish filmmakers at that time were not screening at Sundance. Uh, Tribeca had not even been founded yet, but Toronto, Palm Springs, other festivals that uh, had already been established in the United States. Um, when we started the festival, uh, pretty much the only film that the community recognized as an Irish film was The Quiet Man. And I have pretty much spent 22 years explaining to people that that is not an Irish film. It's an American <laughs> film made by an Irish American filmmaker of great renown, and it was filmed in Ireland. Uh, and today, I, you know, many, many remarkable films have been made in Ireland and have used the Irish landscape in many television shows. Uh, and the Irish film industry is well known throughout the world in both its uh, extraordinary crews and working ethic and its animation. So in that regard, uh, in 22 years, we've seen a remarkable growth of Irish film production. In programming uh, through the last years, in the beginning, we really looked to films that told Irish stories, uh, which obviously would have centered on uh, immigration or I Catholic church. And we really stuck to more non, what's the best word for this? Nothing that got in anyone's face. Everyone felt comfortable. It was a nice representation of Ireland. Everyone felt good about themselves. You know, we didn't push the envelope in film. We didn't really feel that was our place. But over the years, um, because Irish filmmakers uh, tackle extraordinary stories and are very self-reflective and, and very, uh, I think, politically and culturally aware of uh, what's going around in the world, we started showing uh, films about the troubles, films about the occupation of Gaza, films about abortion, films about LGBTQ rights. And it was fascinating at first, as a festival in America, we thought this was very edgy, but we realized that if we looked at festivals in France, in Ireland, in Germany, it, you know, it wasn't really edgy at all. These were simply topics that were at the forefront of cultural and social, you know, social ideology and, and were topical. And I, funny in many ways, I still feel that many American festivals don't really look you know, most American festivals and American filmmakers don't really seem to be pushing or creating films that push cultural and social events and political events, but Irish filmmakers do. They, they don't seem to have any problem tackling an event um, such as The Eighth, which is, you know, barely 18 months old. Oh no, the film isn't even that old. Um, you know, I can't even imagine an, an American filmmaker tackling the abortion issue here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So um, our programming has become more inclusive. We really don't shy away from any topic anymore. And our audiences, though perhaps grounded, and, and certainly if I look at our admission ticket sales, there's always a healthy amount of Irish names. We really draw from across the city. I, I think our audience is, is, is almost as varied as our, our, our city's demographics. We have a strong Polish uh, audience, uh, Hispanic, uh, frequently Asian. Um, and uh, we really never program specifically to a cultural group. We, we program what we feel is the best of what's out there from what the filmmakers uh, have presented that year. And, and, and for that, we're very proud of it and we're very grateful uh, to the filmmakers. So um, yeah, we just... <laughs> but uh, hasn't it always been a, a problem for Irish cinema, first of all, to define itself uh, as you know, a, 
uh, having a proper nationality, uh, this national identity. And uh, secondly, because um, if I take, for example, uh, you know, uh, Neil Jordan's uh, film on, um, um, what's the name again, 1916, um, Michael, oh. Michael Collins, uh, the, the, uh, it, the, the film was financed uh, with um, American uh, money. Uh, so it's hard to define exactly what an Irish movie is. And the second problem is also about having a, an audience. I mean, isn't, hasn't it always been a problem for Irish cinema? You know, that not all Irish films, for example, are exported outside Ireland. So do you find this is a, a problem? Well, that's an interesting mm. yes and no. Mm. I think what, one of the problems that we've seen, it's not a problem, but a large number of films in the last or, or, you know, 10, 12 years, deal with um, Irish gangs, Irish drugs, drug, drug issues in Ireland, homelessness, uh, unemployment, uh, the, the fall of the Celtic tiger, um, the abandonment of the housing, you know, um, and those are hard, sometimes, those are hard films to sell in that, um, did you really want to go to the movies and watch four guys uh, without subtitles um, <laughs> meet each other uh, to death, drink excessively, wander the back streets of Dublin? Um, it, it's funny. Oh, and the one film that I always say we can't find from Ireland is a rom com. It's you know there's very there's very little of the you know the Hollywoodish um, type of movie. At the same time. Um, you know, they have, it, people don't understand that, say, the, the current, like, Nessa Hardiman's Sea Fever or um, uh, Shelley Lowe's uh, Bump Along the Way, you know, where Irish filmmakers are simply moving towards more universal themes, you know. <laughs> they're not, they're, they're, I don't think, say, they're trying to take the Irishness out, but they're, they're not looking at specific Irish-centric themes for a feature film, uh, you know, not every film is going to be Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Lenny mm -hmm. Abramson's Room. Mm -hmm. Hardly anybody you tell would, would, would know that Lenny Abramson that Room is an Irish film. They they wouldn't associate the two. Mm -hmm. So you either have something that's in your face Irish, or you just mm -hmm. have a universal film, and and that's you know that's a kind of a conundrum, because mm -hmm. Irish doesn't have like a. a, a a sense like you know the French romance or you know, the Italian mobster. It, it doesn't really seem to have a general constant uh, um, theme to their films. You know, I mean, they're not known for anything particular. You know, so that's why I always say, just come for a great movie. You just come, you know, just come for an interesting movie. Don't, I, you know, I don't necessarily say you're just going to see, you know, because you know, there's no stamp that says Irish particularly. Right. And you, you mentioned the, the Quiet Man. Does it mean that you exclude uh, all American, Irish American films? That you say American movies uh, uh, situate, located in Ireland or dealing with uh, uh, an Irish uh, subject? Oh, we don't. Well, no, we don't exclude them. Uh, actually, we have uh, in our shorts program, which we are somewhat well known for. It, we screen shorts by uh, Irish, Irish uh, people of Irish heritage all over the world. So you could be Irish Australian, Irish Mexican, Irish French, uh, and and we've got and we have had films in that way. Um, we don't exclude them, but there was an interesting article recently that um, you know a film, say like Wild Mountain Time, would not come to our festival. I mean, they, they simply wouldn't. We wouldn't get it, and they wouldn't want to screen it there. They're, you know, films that usually have large American financial backing and may have an Irish subject um, would be going to a major, you know, major festival or going straight to distribution. Um, so it's we really tend to stay uh, stay away from those films. Okay, so you don't, uh, you wouldn't describe yourself as a major. Uh, uh, film festival? <laughs> no. 
No, I, you know, it's a, I think it's a problem with any, um, you know, what, what they call a diaspora festival. Mm -hmm. You know, people, and, and I understand this completely, uh, you know, film is an art form and film like, or art, you know, comes with a cost. It has production costs, distribution costs, obviously the cost of cast and crew. And, you know, for the most part, festivals, you know, don't pay a great deal. You know, we do pay, you know, uh, we do pay something. And, and it really, I would say is a token, you know, at a major, and we don't, we're not a film market. So of course, uh, you know, a film with large financial backing or the major cast and something like Lenny Abramson's room would go to a major festival like Toronto, like the Bernali, you know, like Pump, to look for distribution. And that's not something we do. Uh, mostly, and um, we give young filmmakers a chance. It, it, um, and we have screened Lenny's films, uh, you know, actually quite a few. We, we screened Adam and Paul in 2004. That's an extremely Irish centric film. Mm -hmm. Here's two drugged out guys wandering Dublin. I mean, in your heart just breaks for them. Uh, and it, you know, and it is not the best uh, vision of Dublin. <laughs> I don't think anyone got on a plane to go to Dublin after seeing Adam and Paul, but I mean, it's a brilliant yeah. film. And, um, you know, we're, we're delighted to have his films over the years. Um, but, and we've had Nora Toomey's, uh, Academy Award, the breadwinner, and and you know, so I mean we do, but we're certainly not the festival Irish filmmakers are looking to make a name at. We're more right. a stepping stone. It's you know it's more an entry. But uh, do the directors uh, still agree to uh, go over and uh, to Chicago? Uh, do you uh, have them over to uh, speak to the audience? Um, well, I can say over the years uh, we've had hundreds of filmmakers and um i'm never quite sure if it's um it, it's always been a uh, a toss-up of whether they're delighted to present in their film or um they eventually admit that they have relatives in chicago and the ticket and the free hotel room was a grand opportunity to visit with family uh and friends so it's it's a but they i mean we have had um We've had, you know, wonderful filmmakers over the years and um, a, a great variety and we're always delighted. Um, but it, 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 again, it's a, you know, it, many would say, well, we'd be happy to be in your festival, but we're waiting to hear from the Cleveland International or, you know, we'd be delighted to be in your festival, but we're waiting to hear from South by Southwest. So, um, <laughs> We yeah. do have we do have a lot of filmmakers present, but again, it is with all honesty, and, and people have attended. It's an Irish centric film, and we have never strayed uh, out of that box. We've never gone and looked for other Gaelic communities and ethnic groups to spread it out. Say like the Latino Film Festival that presents films from every country that speaks Spanish as Spanish, you know, heritage. Mm -hmm. So that you know is like. 40 countries. <laughs> mm -hmm. We just stick to Ireland. Mm -hmm. And would you say that uh, the audience, when they uh, interact with uh, the filmmakers in the debate, do you feel that there is a good understanding among the audience of Americans or, uh, who are uh, from uh, the people from Chicago of what is, what is being represented in the films about Ireland? Do you think that uh, um, there is a good understanding or do you feel that uh, there is a uh, a sort of discrepancy between their expectations of what Ireland is like, or the the image that the the you know the the entertain of Ireland and uh, the the representation which is offered by this, as you said, uh, new groundbreaking uh, film Irish filmmakers. I would say undoubtedly, mm -hmm. the filmmakers bring the Irish audience up to speed on what's happening in Ireland. Um, I, I think that there's, a, for many people, for many Irish Americans, Ireland is captured, you know, in the images of the quiet man, in the images of Brooklyn. You know, it's still, people are emigrating, people are, um, you know, the, the rural communities are poor, farming. It, it, 
frequently they're just astounded when we, you know, the, the, young, the filmmakers, and, and they are predominantly under 40. The, the Irish filmmaking community is very young and, and very edgy. And they, and, and they are very well versed in their country's history, politics, and current culture. I, and I, I, I think frequently that astounds our audience. I mean, they're, they're just wonderful at the Q&A and very knowledgeable. But you know, they, they're, they're, they have to set aside that everybody's not at the pub, everybody's family doesn't own a pub. You know, they, you know, we, we have you know, extraordinary, uh, you know they're moving forward. You know they they have divorce now. They have, you know abortion rights, uh, 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 LGBTQ rights. It, you know they and they're very versed in bringing this forward. Um, they're, they have a, a brilliant understanding of Brexit, of Northern Ireland, of the still you know those that still look for unification. You know those who work on both sides of the border, especially if they come from Galway and up to the northwest. And so it's, um, I, you know, frequently it's actually an education. It's mm -hmm. like they're hearing about a country they know, they know nothing about because for many Irish Americans, it's frozen in time. And certainly in Chicago, I mean, if you look at our Irish, you know, American celebrations, we dump thousands of pounds of color in, in the river to turn it green. <laughs> we have hundreds of thousands show up for a parade, and, and, you know, and, and there you know, they put on their kilts, you know, we play the parting glass, you know, Danny Boy, the, you know, the bagpipes come out. It's just very culturally specific, you know, cultural Irish culture imagery that really doesn't reflect right. what the filmmakers are making. So it's, it's always, and I mean, when we do things like when we screen Gaza or films like that, they're constantly like, well, why are you, why are you screening movies? About, why are you making movies about that? They're just, that's not Irish. You're like, they're filmmakers. You know, they, they're a filmmaker. They could film about anything. But people find that quite fascinating. So it's, um, I, I think it's a very two-way street and I think they enjoy each other. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And again, you have stressed this idea that uh, art is educational and uh, can uh, really change uh, people's representations of, uh, a place and uh, Ireland in particular and I think Aileen had something to say about that about yeah, the yeah. role of art yeah, uh, yeah. art and culture and I think um, Jude's comments uh, resonate so much with the mission as outlined by uh, Kevin Byrne from the, the consulate in Chicago that um, contemporary music and contemporary art and you know contemporary festive networks and all of these kinds of things yes they absolutely are part of the vanguard of representing different kinds of Ireland and opening up these spaces for di discussion music can be a bit different at times because traditional music in particular the repertoire hasn't necessarily changed um, but also I would add to this that uh, you know, one, it's very important one does not just see music or cinema or art simply as a part of a soft diplomatic effort. There are also uh, industries involved in this, there are economies involved in this. And so, um, it, you know, it, it's really important to acknowledge uh, there isn't this maybe binary of soft and hard power. Um, and in many ways, I would argue that music and later film and perhaps Charlie will come in on this literature, have circulated and challenged uh, um, and sometimes reified stereotypes and particular tropes. Um, and, and as Jude pointed out, yes, there are a generational Irish in Chicago who have a sort of a fixity on, on identity because that's what maybe was passed on by their parents or grandparents. But I've also learned that uh, people are curious and uh, want to uh, learn more and understand that um, the Irish American lens or the many Irish American lenses are also capturing a specific Irish American culture. So uh, I think everything that Jude outlined in terms of that tension and dynamic uh, plays out in music also. But similarly, um, musicians and bands are very kind of social justice aware and very topical. And so you have music festivals that bring these bands. And I'm thinking in particular, the relationship between Milwaukee Irish Fest 
so just north of Chicago, uh, in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, and um, festivals in Ireland where, where new bands constantly do circuits actually throughout the Midwest, uh, the Dublin, Ohio festival, places like that. And, um, you know, these are new young singer songwriters. These are people who are doing different things with traditional music. And so uh, constantly update and challenge, but also show the connective tissue, I guess, between um, past and present. Um, yeah. yeah, but but you know, prior, I don't know if many people knew the Consulate General prior to Kevin, and it was uh, Brian O'Brien, who's an absolutely extraordinary Irish dancer. And, uh, you know, through his um, kind of outreach as well in Chicago in the last number of years, he really put culture at the center. So when um, John, you know, or, or Fergal in the previous uh, session comment about, um, you know, the importance of social media and kind of uh, it's, 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 you know, Dan Mulhall tweeting about poetry. Um, this isn't in any way soft or incidental. It's, it's critical. And it's critical to this idea of a point of intersection of hospitality. Uh, that's really, I think, central to any economic discourse as well. And I'd also like to point out, and, and I'll stop after this so you can get to Charlie, that as Kevin Byrne pointed out, yes, you know, um, Ireland doesn't have the military power. So, you know, the US will look to the UK in that respect. Uh, but many of those wonderful filmmakers that Jude has referenced have also talked about things like the use of Shannon in the transportation of rendition. Uh, planes um, and the idea that you have an actual border and a US jurisdiction once you pass through immigration in Shannon. Uh, these kinds of things are tackled and dealt with a lot in Irish music, in Irish cinema. Um, you know, Fall of the Celtic Tiger, the Occupy Wall Street found resonance with Occupy Dame Street. Folk musicians, traditional musicians were central in that. Um, the current musicians that I know in Chicago who play Irish music are incredibly connected to the socio-cultural and political world of Ireland. I think, I guess uh, the point I was trying to make in my talk yesterday, there's a pivot in the 1990s and that's really where I see these things emerging. And it's interesting, Jude, that 1999 as well in the film festival uh, emerges. Yeah, I, I like the word emerging. And um, that's, that's a question I wanted to, to ask you as well. Does, it, does this, uh, uh, merging of um, preoccupations, this uh, globalization, in fact, of uh, uh, topics, etc., reflect in the music proper. And uh, this, uh, in a way, joins another question I had because there has been much talk uh, over the last uh, three days of the, you know, the the, the ethnic uh, competition in Chicago between uh, blacks, black Afro Americans, and the Irish. And so uh, I was wondering uh, how it was, uh, trans how it transposed in music. And uh, because Chicago is also famous as uh, the capital of blues. Uh, mm -hmm. And so how did uh, traditional Irish music compete with, um, well, uh, blues or jazz? And uh, how, in what way did they influence one another? And yeah, there's, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's very little documentation of this. Um, and because of the type of racial segregation that you experienced in Chicago in the 20th century, um, even if people were visiting clubs, uh, none of this is necessarily manifest, or at least we don't know in, in commercial outputs. Again, I would say where these things start to really emerge interestingly would be in the 1990s. And Chicago had its own house and techno scene kind of connected with the Detroit house scene as well. So techno started to bleed in a lot into the staging of traditional music. And of course, things like, um, I mean, jazz chords and jazz sounds would be very manifest in some recordings of Irish music not necessarily collaborating with African-American uh, musicians, but certainly um, reimagining soundscapes in, in, in careful uh, ways. I, I think in terms of actual collaborations, uh, some of the most interesting ones come around 2012 onwards. You have 
um, Sean Cleland from the Irish Music School Chicago, who holds each year, by the way, uh, Francis O'Neill um, Arts Week. Um, he worked a lot with a composer and with the um, um, uh, Mexican community to do some stuff on San Patricio and, and collaborations between the poetry and music of um, Mexico and Ireland. So finding a historical theme to make that connection. In terms of individuals, you will have always have individuals from different music communities, maybe accessing Irish music or teaching Irish music and dance. It's probably a very good time to remember the wonderful Alan Beale, who was um, uh, African uh, American Irish dance teacher at the um, Irish uh, American Heritage Center in Chicago. Not of um, of, of African pa African parents, not African American parents. So its terminology is is interesting mm -hmm. here. But one of the most important teachers of Irish Kaylee dancing. Uh, and one of the few people of color to, to be operating um, in this area. But more and more and more, you would have seen that in the last 20 years in competitive Irish dance. That's a huge place where, uh, where uh, people are emerging, but there isn't necessarily a syncretism between musical forms yet, mm -hmm. but they are happening. They just haven't been properly uh, documented. This is where ethnography is really, really necessary, yeah. It's fascinating. And uh, uh, perhaps a, a last question. You mentioned Liz Carroll uh, mm -hmm. yesterday. And uh, so I was wondering, uh, of course, she's a traditional uh, uh, Irish music uh, uh, player. But um, is there any difference really between, uh, let's say, uh, uh, traditional music from Ireland and as it is played by uh, an American born musician? Would you say no? Not different. at all. I mean, yeah. it's, it's to do with genre. I mean, what Liz is most celebrated for now are her extraordinary compositions in the idiom of Irish traditional music, but she's very clear to proclaim herself as an Irish American and an Irish uh, traditional musician or Irish American musician. She is top. She's kingpin. She is you know, one of the best in this transnational globalized Irish music form. Um, she is someone who has in her own music incorporated elements of a very multi-ethnic soundscape with great care without saying uh, this is what you know the blues sounds like but she has Appalachian sounds that she adapts in her music and and groups like the Republic of Strings have set these things she's she's a maverick um, she's someone who maybe 20 or 30 years ago uh, felt more on the edge of tradition but in terms of her reputation and her, the award to her a number of years ago as Chumador in the tradition, which means composer in the tradition by the Irish language station TG Carr in Ireland, she is utterly at the center. But again, these kinds of things shift and change um, uh, and peak and trough. And some of the best musicians in the tradition writ large are Irish Americans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this questions very much uh, the, the notion of authenticity, which you also uh, talked about uh, yesterday, and it uh, really uh, makes it appear as something very, uh, how could we say, subjective and uh, based on no, not actual facts. Well, I think the last thing I would say on that, and you know, pe people talk about this a lot. It and and actually, I, I don't know if he's online at the at the moment. We have a newly minted uh, doctor of music in the uh, Irish World Academy, Felix Morgenstern, who's a piper from Berlin, and mm -hmm. you know, he talks about this kind of sonic. Um, sonic Irishness, or that the fact that if you can be technically excellent at what mm -hmm. you do musically, it absolutely doesn't matter where you're from. Um, that's the excellence. You know, we need to move away from the idea of 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 uh, connected. Um, or you having to be ethnically authentic or whatever that is to do these things. Um, mm -hmm. it just, it's just a different register. So you can separate ethnicity from, um, from the playing of this music, but you can also, if it's a core part of your own identity expression, then of course um, it, can be, it can be that. And that's what we mean by global Irish music. They, they shift mm -hmm. and change and have resonances in different ways in different places. Yeah. I can see a comparison, but I can't remember the name right now. It's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Central European Jewish music, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. Klezmer. Klezmer uh, jazz, that's right. And, which and, was and originally the... played by uh, Jewish musicians, but Absolutely. now it's played by uh, 
and mm. polka, polka music in the United States and the polka belt. I mean, there's so many musics or, or going off and learning, um, you know, flamenco or whatever it is, you know, the, the, the musics and dances can become untethered uh, and that's fine and people can enjoy them, but then they can also be go back into communities and resignify communities as well. Um, and, and it's that kind of uh, mobility, music more than anything is extraordinary mobile in that respect. All right. Thank you very much, Amy. Thank you. And now I move on to uh, to uh, Charles, perhaps to ask him mm -hmm. whether this uh, idea of mobility and uh, lack of, um, you know, the disjunction between uh, uh, art and identity, national identity, um, also is true also of literature, or is it something that uh, you wouldn't agree uh, about uh, Faro uh, as uh, you presented him? Uh, yesterday or does he exist outside beyond um, um, his uh, Irish American identity? Well, you know, uh, Chicago is remarkable in having two geniuses uh, in, in, the, in, in the Irish American literary scene, uh, Finley Peter Dunn in the 1890s and uh, Farrell uh, in the 20s through the 1970s. Um, and I've wondered about all this, uh, wh where, what it is that, about Chicago that produced these two, but uh, beyond that, up, coming up to now, I'm wondering why there hasn't been more uh, in, on the literary scene uh, in, in Chicago. Um, back up a little bit to my own uh, uh, coming into this. Uh, I'm from the Boston area and, and I grew up in a in a town outside Boston, which had its own identity, the town of Norwood, uh, which had a significant Irish population, Irish speaking population, uh, even up to my time as a kid, uh, Irish was spoken on the streets. Uh, the, um, the, the greatest uh, Irish language novelist of the 20th century, Mochin O'Kain, uh, had relatives in Norwood and he came out there a lot uh, and, uh, and, and people knew him, you know, and, and actually, uh, the town gets into his um, into his masterwork, uh, *Cranachilla*, uh, *Churchyard Clay*. Um, I uh, I did a doctorate in American Studies, and I wanted to do something that had to do with part of my own background, uh, my own ethnic background. It was mostly Irish, but I got into that because I knew the least about it, uh, and that therein lies the great difference, uh, uh, at least in the 40s and 50s between Chicago uh, and between Boston and Chicago. Um, there was a, 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 always a, an ebullience and energy, uh, a generosity in the Chicago Irish, which I, which I got to see from uh, coming out there and starting to do research. Uh, the, the, the Boston Irish were always a little bit under the uh, under the radar and and still reluctant to to uh, to come forward uh, in in uh, in in ways other than literature. Uh, now in literature, they they were early uh, and all the way up through. Uh, uh, there was important uh, engagement with ethnicity uh, in the Boston area uh, in in fiction uh, and. Uh, that uh, I, I think that has to do with the difference, the difference between the art forms, really. Um, uh, fiction is an individual art, uh, more so than any other, uh, an individual imaginative art. And um, it thrives on, in fact, it, it needs uh, conflict uh, and, and, uh, and uh, the, um, the, 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 the engagement with difficulties and so on for it to work. Um, and I think uh, this, um, I, I'm, I'm no esthetician, but th this is a, the major difference between fiction and, and uh, the kind of the performative arts, you know, because you can, those work, uh, you're expressing uh, uh, unambiguously. Um, uh, and, 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 um, and, and then they don't depend on, on uh, the external context, I think. And, and so it was, I think it was easier and maybe more um, uh, easily developed and, and sustained to be an Irish musician or an Irish dancer or, 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 or Irish in, in the dramatic. 
uh, all the way across uh, the, the, the U.S. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, I, I've, I've kept up pretty well, but I, I don't think there's, there's a whole lot of, uh, of Irish ethnic identity in the literature in, Irish, in Chicago now. Um, Whereas it's still big it, uh, and has been all the way through the 20th and into the 21st century in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, the, the, the East Coast nexus of, of ethnic. Now, not to say that the Irish in Chicago aren't uh, um, uh, out there and, and, and there, is, there is a community and, I, and I, I got this big time when I first went to Chicago in, in 1970, uh, the people were, always helpful, always welcoming, um, generous, and so on. And I, I started giving talks uh, all over the place. You know, I was invited to uh, uh, my, my first talk on, uh, on, uh, on Finley Peter Dunn uh, in Chicago was at a, a Chinese restaurant, uh, a lunch meeting of an Irish studies group. And uh, I've, you know, I've spoken in pubs, I've spoken in churches, St. Bridget's Church in Bridgeport, Old St. Patrick's. I've spoken in uh, organizations like the Heritage Center at the universities, the Loyola uh, University of Chicago, at the uh, what the the uh, what Finley Peter Dunn called the Onion League Club, and so on. Um, and when when Alan Skerritt and I put together this feral centennial at the Newberry, uh, it was very easy to do. The, the Newberry itself, their public programs uh, operation, was tremendously supportive. Um, and uh, I was able to get, uh, we were able to get uh, d vignettes from Farrell by local actors, uh, you know, really fine uh, a, a pr presentation. Uh, we had musicians, um, we had a concurrent exhibit of materials uh, at, at the Newberry. We had a bus tour of the neighborhoods that Farrell came from uh, um, and including uh, his, his church, St. Anselm's Church. Always good crowds in all of these venues, always enthusiastic, always question and answer, intelligent Q and A's and, and appreciation of, of, uh, of what these writers had, had you know, um, meant in terms of uh, the identity, uh, the, the self-knowledge the self -knowledge of the people uh, in, in these audiences. Um, I find, and this, uh, this continued, you know, I, I branched out, I, I wrote about, uh, research wrote about the 1934 fair and I wrote about the, uh, the, the wonderful musician Eleanor Kane Neary. Uh, I interviewed three of her daughters. They couldn't have been more helpful. They gave me photographs. They talked all about what it was like being her daughter and, and so on and so forth. I was able to have a phone conversation with one of the, the one of the Nearys called up Pat Roach, who was still alive, <laughs> about 96, you know, in and in in and out of, of coherence. But he uh, he testified of you know, the great the great the, the, the musician dancer and so on you know uh, it, it was like um, you know having a conversation with uh, um, with Paul McCartney or something you know uh, and he testified to her genius uh, uh, and there's just there's, there's a way in which uh, being Irish in Chicago. Uh, is, is, is something that still remains significant, but it's never, it, it hasn't, hasn't come over to the literature, I don't think. Um, mm -hmm. Now Dunn, um, Finley Peter Dunn, who invented Mr. Dooley, uh, he, uh, his, uh, his genius was in, in being the first American writer to use Irish dialect uh, in, in his Dooley columns for something other than mockery and self-mockery. And, um, uh, he's, uh, that's in the 1890s when there, really, there was a vibrant Irish community. And of course it was in, in conflict with other communities, other immigrant communities, ethnic communities and so on, which provided the impetus for what he did. Uh, similarly, Farrell, uh, style was important. Style is character, you know, and for Dunn it was the invention of this dialect. Uh, for Farrell, it was the invention of, of a plain style um, which allowed him to express the the, uh, the thoughts of uh, and and, uh, and emotions of people who for whom self expression came hard, and um, and also in a time when it was hard to be uh, a, a, an ethnic in, in Chicago and in, 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 the, in, in the working class and, and so on. Now all of that I think is gone. Um, 
there, but music, theater, and dance continue, and but it's more of a, uh, it's self-selected now, you know, uh, and and uh, people who can perform perform Irishness. Um, but uh, in terms of the writing, I think the, the impetus isn't there anymore. That's my sense of it anyway. Uh, and I've read a lot of the things that as they come out, I, I think the last significant Irish American novel out of Chicago, to my mind, that, 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 that seemed to really catch something was, 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 was in the early 80s. Um, so I don't know what other people think about that. You know, there's sort of one. Uh, there was a, there was a film. yeah. There was a it's film idea, adaptation but... of Farrell, wasn't there? There was a film adaptation of. Uh, oh yeah, there was a, there yeah. have been two. Yeah, there was a 1960 movie mm -hmm. uh, of Stas Lonigan. Uh, what do you think Jack, of it? Jack what Nicholson think of had it? his first role. Uh, mm -hmm. He was uh, he was one of the corner boys. Uh, yeah, Jack Nicholson. Not bad. And then there was a. Uh, I made for TV series in which Harry Hamlin played studs in the in the mm, about 77 78 yeah so that's but again it's just studs Lonigan and uh, um, but it did carry over to that extent um, I so think it's that, yeah. sorry go on I, I think his 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 material the short stories and so on uh, and and done as well it's 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 uh, it would lend itself to um, the film <laughs> it just ha you know, hasn't happened. So would you say that Farrell belongs to a, sorry, uh, Aileen, go on. I was, I was just going to say it may happen yet, Charlie, if you, if you find a way to, to, to connect with people. And, and I mean, connecting the idea of film and Chicago, uh, you know, in terms of the 1990 blockbusters, Jude will know these two, uh, Blink, and uh, Backdraft, which were about Irish, one was about an Irish American uh, firefighters and the other was about a blind Irish American musician. They drew on a local band who had quite a national reputation called the Drovers, uh, who played traditional and traditional rock music. Um, so there's, a, it, in some ways, it seems like maybe the energy uh, shifted into other genres of music and into cinema rather than as Charlie was saying, you know, why did it not go into literature? I think there maybe was some poetry, but, but I think you're right. It doesn't seem to be as prevalent as it is with other cultural production. No, and it, but, yeah. it is that idea that I think that the, the, the performative uh, is, 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 uh, is self-motivating in a way that, um, that that sitting down and writing isn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, would you situate uh, Farrell rather in uh, in the realm of uh, popular culture? Even though I know that uh, the limit between you know high culture and low culture is really uh, very difficult to define. But would you rather situate him there and uh, or? or no, not? What, 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 what's the question? Would you say that uh, it's popular fiction or high literature? Um, well, though, them's fighting words, uh, Sylvie. Uh, it's, uh, it's, right. it's literature, uh, people read it. Uh, people uh, who don't read other books read mm -hmm. Farrell and respond to them. That's what I've seen in my Chicago experience. Uh, but it's also um, uh, innovative uh, and and uh, remarkable uh, and uh, and and shaped in a way that only the best fiction is. Um, he's a crossover figure, and that's a part of what I've been trying to, to get at for all for all these years. And especially by you know showing how he's a uh, he was a modernist and how connected he was uh, to um, to people like Joyce and Proust and, and so mm -hmm. on. And, uh, right. And, 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 uh, so it's uh, you know it goes both it, it goes both ways and there's no there shouldn't be a, a, a barrier there. Okay, yeah. thank you. And Jude, I, I, yeah. Sorry, I go wanted on. to say it's in in listening to many of the people in the conference, I, I, I've learned a great deal about the city of that I've been in my entire life, <laughs> and one of the things. Um, we have three schools of film in Chicago, Columbia, DePaul, and Loyola all have uh, media and schools of film. And I, where I have been fascinated for decades at all of the extraordinary topics 
Irish filmmakers have made films, documentaries, short films about. I, I thought in my, to myself, Chicago has such an extraordinary history of people and events, uh, you know, of Irish, Irish American uh, culture that none have ever been used as topic for films. That I was, there were so many things between the white city, the Catholic church, immigration, mm -hmm. the expansion mm -hmm. of Irish, the, the buildings, our history and architecture. I mean, the topics, you know, music and dance, the topics are so varied and wide that I thought not only Chicago and Illinois, but virtually every state in the United States could take a page from Irish filmmakers and capturing their history and their events and their people on film, which I think there's a complete dearth of. It, you know, I just somehow I think maybe many of these universities should call over some of these Irish filmmakers and have them have a discussion about how they pick topics, how they represent their, their culture, their county, their history. And maybe we could start making those films here because I, there were so many topics that I would love to see a film about. I would love to know more about. And I've never seen any of it in my 60 plus years. So, would, you know, and here's more here today. So maybe that's something we could certainly, you know, establish here is sponsoring an Irish filmmaker to perhaps talk how that could happen because who wouldn't want to see a film about Studs Lonigan or his or his stories, you know, in, it's very far, very few and far between. There have been movies about uh, the Irish arriving to the US, such as in the Gangs of New York, for instance, in the, but uh, th there is no equivalent for Chicago, I guess. Thank goodness. <laughs> yes. Sorry? So thank goodness. I mean, there are there are documentaries that have been made by PBS and by the local Chicago TV. They've done stuff on O'Neill, and there was a documentary in the late '90s, early '90s on the canals uh, and things like that. But you know, again, if we go back to the previous session, this idea of um, using culture, leveraging culture in part of yes, education, but also kind of commerce and and those kinds of things. The much of the musical activity that comes from Ireland to the US is sponsored by Culture Ireland, which is part of, you know, a government funding agency. Mm -hmm. uh, but Culture Ireland works with Tourism Ireland to do that. And so, you know, it could easily happen that there may be projects, transatlantic projects, including to Chicago and other places where these very things that bursaries that uh, Jude might be talking about can happen. And I think we are going to see much more of that. I think we're going to see much more commissioned um, musical or theatrical or literature responses to current situations. And I think, you know, again, uh, post pandemic, post Brexit, post crash, post Trump, um, mm -hmm. this is the moment of extraordinary creativity. We're on a pivot point. Yeah. Great. There was perhaps, yeah, sorry, there, there was perhaps one last issue which was raised in the last uh, session, which was about uh, uh, Ulster Scots culture and uh, the other side. Mm -hmm. But perhaps you have given an element of explanation, Aileen, in, in talking about culture Ireland, that is to say the government of uh, the Republic of Ireland uh, sponsoring, uh, you know, uh, uh, culture uh, uh, abroad. Uh, and perhaps there is not the, the same effort, of course, on the part of the, the UK government. But still, can you give any, uh, do you have any idea of this influence? I mean, is, there, is, is it present in any, any, any way in film or in music? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, if you talk about a lot of the um, uh, Scots-Irish and Ulster-Irish and you look at settlement patterns, particularly around um, Appalachia, and as was pointed out earlier, this idea of it being uh, one of the fundamental layers of an emergent uh, pan-American white identity, I guess. I mean, a lot of the traditions are the same. So you also have it through the UK. You have the child ballads in Appalachia. You have, you have it manifesting absolutely in country music. Um, you have it manifesting in traditional musics all around uh, the South, Southeast. Um, and you have, I guess, a, gradually a conflation of uh, folk and traditional musics once the uh, Catholic Irish start to arrive. So in, in some ways, this is where that whole Celtic paradigm comes in. You can kind of smooth out those um, political differences that come later uh, in the political history of the island of Ireland. But uh, 
I will say that in Northern Ireland, when it became very difficult for certain uh, Protestant communities to be uh, playing traditional music that became so associated with republicanism and nationalism, uh, many turned to bluegrass. So, so white folk traditions form a very important uh, matrix um, in all of this, for sure. And there are plenty of people writing and uh, thinking about um, these things in the contemporary sense, um, you know, the historical Ulster Scots versus right now, um, those traditions, uh, I was surprised and pleased to hear that uh, Kevin Byrne was talking about bringing the um, pipe bands uh, to, right. to, uh, to Atlanta. But do you remember in the police force in Chicago, those kinds of pipe bands, bagpipe bands, in many ways have much more to do with kind of Ulster Scots imaginaries than have to do with Irish instruments and musical iconography and all those kinds of things, they all get mishmashed uh, in interesting ways. So, so there's actually far more uh, similarities than differences uh, mm -hmm. culturally, but I think country music, uh, and of course, that's one of the most interesting places to explore African-American influence as well, because it gets written out. I would tell everybody go watch some Little Nas X and listen to some of that crazy country, old time, old time road and, and start to unpick and unravel all these threads. Okay, good advice. Thank you. There was a there was a, a, a kind of a subgenre of Irish American fiction in the 1890s, which went along with the um, the kind of invention of Scotch Irishness uh, in America as a way for people to say, "I'm not a Catholic. Uh, I'm Irish, but not Catholic." And that you know, it, it centered around uh, you know, scho scholarly stuff around Princeton with the uh, 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 people like Woodrow Wilson, uh, but there was a there was a literary uh, uh, genre by these people, um, written by these people, in which the idea was to um, uh, to present themselves as a separate, coherent culture. Um, that was the last time that it was was a bit was was a big thing in American writing, but then it had. Uh, obviously, uh, cultural uh, motivation and ramifications. Yeah. And we may see its reemergence actually in this very politically fraught time because um, any of the current commentary I'm following in, in relation to uh, the challenge with the DUP and leadership and the recognition. I just saw a documentary actually on the uh, Good Friday Agreement and the recognition that perhaps. Um, the, the Republic was much savvier with the American um, political sphere in, in, in leveraging culture. Uh, so we may see actually post Brexit uh, new formations and new iterations of these very old uh, identity um, tropes and conflicts. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So I think it's time now to move to uh, the questions. Um, so I look up in the chat and, um, oh, we have, you have loads of questions here. Um, let me see now. <laughs> uh, at the University of Chicago and Loyola University. Oh, Ellen asked that. Yes. yes. I'm too new enough at Loyola to know the answer to that. Uh, but yeah, it's getting harder to hold on to ethnic studies programs that are uh, that are from European um, ethnic studies programs. So okay. we're yeah, we had we had to find a big donor just to hold on to a sliver of an Italian studies program at Loyola. But I don't know what effect that would have on the yeah, I mean without faculty doing this work at these major universities that's that's problematic yeah we should have hired ellen a long time ago do you have access to the questions yeah um if it if i could uh, answer that um and and uh tip my hat to ellen scarrett who's been an absolute mainstay for me uh in my own scholarship an amazing and brilliant woman um, in terms of the loss of, of history departments and the loss of maybe what one calls ethnic studies in general, I think it's absolutely profound because this is where 
uh, young scholars, you know, people who wanted to study with uh, people like Emmett Larkin, uh, you know, this is where new, new uh, generations of thinkers come from. And, uh, you know, in different times and in different contexts and different geographical places, Irish studies has often been subsumed under European studies or British studies in particular in the, mm -hmm. in the UK or empire studies. And I know I've spent some time in Notre Dame and, you know, the, the, the Keonaughton Institute of Global Affairs rather than necessarily uh, specific Irish institutes. Things shift and change all the time. Um, and the lack of visibility does make a big difference. Um, so I don't know. Uh, when you don't have leadership in this area and you don't have people publishing uh, necessarily visibly, they're of course publishing, but visibly in this area, um, you don't have a new generation of scholars engaging in these ideas. So it's, my answer, Ellen, is it's depressing. Oh, yeah. One more oh yes, and Sean Farrell raises the point that yeah. the Newbury Library, yes, indeed, has a new Irish seminar and it is fantastic. I attended it last year. And so coming through somewhere like the Newbury is fantastic. Yeah, great, great point. And there is the Notice Irish Studies program in DePaul, thankfully. I think DePaul is holding the flag in that respect. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Sean. Yeah, I could respond as well that um, the Irish, uh, I, I had a career because um, one, of my co one of my friends from college was, um, um, was Bridget, Kelleher, the, the uh, daughter of John Kelleher, uh, the, uh, the great scholar. And um, it was his generosity that got me going on, uh, on Finley Peter Dunn and so on from there. And then followed up with uh, um, the great support group of the American Conference for Irish Studies. Um, and so, you know, everyone there became my friends as well. I mean, again, the generosity of the group uh, uh, and, and the reinforcement of, of, uh, of, of scholars is what, is what keeps it going. And uh, yeah, we, we need these kinds of studies more than ever, but they are um, in the, uh, not, not in the ascendant anymore, that's for sure. Although the, 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 the you know, the, the lessons remain the same and they, and they can, and I've written letters to the editor and uh, talked as often as I could about, about this, you know, the, um, in the situations that we have now uh, uh, in, in uh, um, uh, the, the, the you know, ethnic immigrant um, uh, people of color uh, situations in the U.S., uh, uh, it's, of course, it's the same story over and over again. And, um, it, it needs to be told. It needs to be uh, the, the 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 reinforcement of comparative studies of of these groups and their and their reception uh, and lack of it in America. Uh, but we need we need this perspective more than ever. Yeah, and Charlie, if if uh, Sylvie, if you don't mind me coming in on that, I mean, I think you go back to the Chicago School of the nineteen twenties and thirties, or the idea of ethnology, which is the comparative study of groups. I mean, we've seen a real dynamic. Uh, uh, in this conference in the past three days about how uh, anything, you know, I've, ne I've never thought of this conference as an Irish studies conference actually at all. But if you wanted to label it as that, you've seen this real sense of it cannot be insular, it cannot be focused on particular or texts or particular times, it has to be relational. And certainly in my experience of American Conference for Irish Studies in particular, but other Irish studies things as well, this is happening big time, wholesale in Europe, especially I would say, mm -hmm. uh, in Paris, in, in the Netherlands, you know. Um, so, so what may no longer be under a rubric of Irish studies in time to come, there will still be scholarship on these issues, but there will be more uh, relational. And I think that's a wonderful thing for everybody concerned. And Sean Farrell asked that one more plug for the regional uh, Midwest Regional uh, Conference of the American Study for Irish, uh, American Conference for Irish Studies in NIU in October. So everybody should go there. And Sean, I may actually be in Chicago in October, so I will try and come. <laughs> I have a last question for, not a last question, because there might be other questions from the floor to, uh, to choose, because I forgot to ask you uh, when the festival was taking place and whether you had been able to have it over the last year. And what about this year with uh, the COVID situation? Where are you at? Um, we did have it. Um, the festival is always the first weekend of March. Um, mm -hmm. So if uh, it's uh, 
Thursday through Sunday, four days. And mm -hmm. this year we were able to do uh, everything online. So mm -hmm. we had a wonderful uh, partner, uh, um, a streaming partner out of New York City who um, it was amazing transition and the filmmakers, everything worked brilliantly. And mm -hmm. one of the things that happened was that because um, though we did block the screening of some films at the filmmaker's request to the Midwest only, uh, other filmmakers were open to access from across the country. So where we normally had 12 to 15, 1600 people, we were able to move into the thousands because um, <laughs> There are many states that don't have uh, Irish film festivals. As a matter of fact, most states don't have them. So mm -hmm. we had people from Kentucky and Tennessee and Alabama, Missouri, all the way to California mm -hmm. and Georgia, and that was wonderful. And so for 2022, um, we are hoping to be hybrid, we, which is that we would like to be in person and bring the filmmakers back and then um, record Q and A's and sessions, and then have them available online. So we'll have to work out exactly how that works for the films and the filmmakers. Uh, but that's our that's our dream situation is to have the best of both worlds, so that people who don't live close can see the films, and uh, at the same time we can still have the dynamics of a film festival and in person uh, that that in person dynamics that you really can never take away. You know, it just changes the way a film is viewed right. and seen and received. And who are you thinking of uh, inviting as a guest? What filmmaker are you thinking of uh, having over? <laughs> oh, um, so the festival um, uses the film platform, Film Freeway. Mm -hmm. And um, we uh, literally open the portal and the films come in. So okay. we have no idea okay. who is going to send us a film. Oh, really? uh, we, yeah, we do mm -hmm. work um, with various film festivals in Ireland, with Galway mm -hmm. and Kerry and Dublin um, mm -hmm. in partnerships. And, uh, and I will have access if I can't go in person, I'll have backdoor uh, viewing access. And, um, but we do, we pretty much at this point in the festival's career, um, wait to see to go what comes to us <laughs> and it's always a surprise and we're always delighted and so it, uh, mm. it, it and then the program just evolves right you know the the Cannes festival is going to open very soon <laughs> and uh, there used to be a there was one film which was not a, a from an Irish filmmaker but about Ireland who uh, won the Palme d'Or once it was uh, you know the wind shakes the barley by, uh, oh yes, can look. Yeah. yeah, we have a question from uh, from the room. It's uh, uh, Jim Chandler who uh, wants to ask you a question. Thanks for this panel. This is um, a follow up with Jude, um, and and sort of a return to Sylvie's question about how well the audiences are tracking these films, especially with some of the auditory issues about. Um, understanding Irish accents. Um, so just across the river here, across the Seine, is where they moved uh, Henri Langlois Cinémathèque, where in the 50s, people like Godard and Truffaut went to talk about movies. It's one of the things that made this French New Wave what it was. And I was just wondering if you ever thought about a sort of uh, Cinémathèque model where, where it, films are screened and, and discussed, um, maybe even during the year, not just in the festival season, uh, and maybe with, with, uh, with AIDS. Um, I mean, subtitles, English subtitles seems to me not a crazy idea for <laughs> a film like Adam and Paul, right? I mean, that's a pretty tough film to follow, but, but even for another Lenny Abramson film like What Richard Did, which, which doesn't pose quite the challenges there are, it's, it's a sort of inside baseball movie. I mean, uh, you know, understanding uh, posh Irish Catholics in Balls Bridge and, and where their, what their class position is in relation, relation to the rest of Dublin seems like it's something that, that it would help to have some, some context for, some education around. So that's what I was, what I think about the, 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 
the um, Cinematheque idea of, of, of film plus discussion? Well, we, we certainly always welcome discussion and, it, and it's funny you say that. Um, I think there is uh, an unending conversation about uh, the Irish accents, the various Irish accents coming from across Ireland. As a matter of fact, that was one of the major issues with the new movie, Wild Mountain Time. Um, Emily Blunt's accent was regarded as not very well. Jamie Doran's was good, but he's Irish and nobody um, understands, um, oh good heavens, it's now gone out of my head, the famous American actor that played the dad who didn't even bother to have an accent for the most part, he just delivered it. Um, probably one of the most uncivil conversations between an audience and actors came years ago with Cole Meany, who was representing his film, How Harry Became a Tree. And um, the audience, some people suggested there would be accents or uh, subtitles. And he was rather extraordinarily offended uh, having been in Star Trek and others and felt his dialogue and accent was just fine, that um, there was something wrong with the audience if they couldn't understand what he said. And yeah. it really went back and forth for quite a while. Um, we still have films and present films that might have a strong uh, accent and other films of, of re recent years have very little. Uh, Sorsha Ronan very rarely has an accent or recognizable in her films, Col uh, Colin Farrell, uh, you know, the same there, um, the Gleason family. So it's, um, I think sometimes we think that films where, you know, the Irish represent themselves in their natural dialect are just part of, you know, it, just a normal film. And those who overcorrect or attempt a broader English without accent are, you know, then again, appealing to the greater universal film audience. But, I was thinking uh, it's the films subtitles that are have been a conversation for a very long time. <laughs> I was thinking it's more the films that are for the internal Irish audience. I think of what Richard did is really a internal film. It didn't really do very well outside of Ireland at all. Um, you know, it's based on a murder case that people in Dublin knew, but nobody else knew. Um, but I think with those films, the ones that are kind of for the Irish, that where that's more of an issue. And you'd want to have your audiences understanding those films. Uh, just a thought. Yeah. yeah. Don't worry, we have the same problem in France with uh, films from Quebec. We have to have the subtitles as well. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think we have come to the end of our panel. So uh, I wish to thank very, very uh, uh, heartily our uh, speakers today and uh, thank you so much. And we feel so much like watching all the movies and listening to all the, mu the, the, the music and reading all the, the books. And that's what, of course, this type of conference is all about as well, going back to what matters the most, right? Uh, primary sources. So uh, thank you all. And uh, I hope very uh, much to uh, meet you in person one day. Um, and uh, perhaps you can come over to, uh, to Paris uh, sometime. And uh, <laughs> oh, I'd love very much to go to Limerick, mind you. <laughs> so, all right. So thank you very much again and uh, a round of applause for you. Well, um, good afternoon again. Good morning, Scott. Uh, you are a wonderful person. You were awake at two o'clock and uh, I don't know, what, what time is it right now? Oh, it's so hard to tell. It's uh, 8 a.m. here in Los Angeles. Okay, so um, we are really grateful to you for um, accepting not to sleep for us. And uh, so now the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you, Scott. And I have to say, this is, uh, it's an honor to be able to do this. This is the first time that I'm presenting this project publicly. And I want to thank the organizers for, uh, for allowing this and for putting on what has been a really fascinating conference with wonderful people, great ideas and good discussion. So uh, the thing that I want to show you today is a project that's ongoing, and I thought it was perfectly appropriate for this conference in that it is about 
Captain Francis O'Neill, the police chief of Chicago from 1901 to 1904, I believe, 1905. Um, O'Neill was, um, uh, was in Chicago, uh, uh, came from uh, County Cork, had been in Chicago for a number of years on the police force, rose through the ranks through some very tumultuous times, um, especially uh, from uh, as he was publishing his books. He published nine books between 1903 and 1922. And there was turbulence both in Chicago and back in Ireland, as you can imagine during those times. I don't have to tell the historians about that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do that with this project is to approach um, our fields, because we do so many interdisciplinary um, aspects of, uh, of looking at history, literature, um, music, the works. It is an inherently uh, interdisciplinary field that we're in. And I thought that uh, doing a project that brought in uh, digital humanities um, would allow, most people think that studying music is a specialist's thing, but we can use music to look at so many different aspects of life and society. And so I thought that a digital humanities project would be something that would be um, really perfect for um, not just um, the field of Irish studies or ethnomusicology or history, but also um, to think about the role of archives. And <clears throat> just looking out at the crowd of people here, looking back to Charles Fanning's work um, across uh, so many archives and uh, with ethnography and um, just so many aspects of history involved, um, I have been rethinking the role of archives, especially in the time of COVID. And I also had a graduate class this last semester and um, Heather Moore is uh, one of the people from that class she's attending here. Um, uh, it was intended to be a fieldwork class. And with COVID, suddenly we couldn't do fieldwork. So I pivoted and tried to do a different direction and came up with an idea to revisit Captain Francis O'Neill and think about his work and his intersections with um, society in Chicago in Irish America and across the waters back to Ireland in a completely different way. And assembled a team of um, Mike O'Malley, who is a historian, um, Aileen Delan, who is an ethnomusicology and a serial keynote speaker, and Daniel Neely, who is an ethnomusicologist, writer, and uh, is excellent with technology. And we came up with an idea to uh, instead of looking at the music in uh, O'Neill's nine books of music, to look at the dedication pages that he wrote, he did a. Uh, we have we've gathered about a hundred um, dedication pages in which he literally would gift copies of his books to people, everyone from his childhood friends to Henry Ford, and everyone in between, and each one of those would have a very florid. Uh, signature, and I'll show you these. Um, the I'm leaving this website up and open for the next couple of days so that you can see it. I'm just putting a, a, a copy a link in the chat as we go here. And I'll show you, this is really a rough draft. It is an ongoing thing, but it will give you an idea of what we're looking at or um, here O'Neill is looking at us. Um, Francis O'Neill um, signed copies of his books and sent them out to people that were known to him and also I think in many ways trying to establish relationships with other people that were influential. Um, and the, the number of uh, dedication pages that we've seen really had uh, me thinking this is a great way of exploring some of these cross currents in society that we can look through um, aspects of music and O'Neill's life to try to better understand um, society in Chicago, society in Irish America, and some of the currents that were flowing through. What better way to do this than through a digital humanities project? Um, also, in the days of COVID, when um, archives had all shut down, we couldn't necessarily get to these places to 
find these dedication pages in first editions of, uh, of copies that were in uh, archives and libraries around the world. So we partnered with the Irish Traditional Music Archive in Dublin and the Ward Irish Music Archives in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, just north of Chicago, to, um, to put out the word. Um, those archives will be hosting the, the collection that we're assembling and um, uh, also helped us to, to uh, not only get a number of copies, but put the word out, a general call out to the public um, to find copies of O'Neill's first editions that he signed. We scanned them and um, this crowdsourcing effort was then um, backed by my class of graduate students. Heather Moore is one of the people who took on uh, the bulk, uh, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of work in writing biographies, um, uh, searching out uh, information about the people to whom these pages were dedicated and then writing biographies of them. And I will walk you through just a little bit of what we're coming up with. Again, this is a very rough draft. Uh, it is an ongoing project, but you can at least see some of the progress that we have made. And we have nine different books. Um, our goal is to have multiple areas of inquiry and pathways through the content. That is to go in through the books themselves and see what the book is, but then also find dedication pages from this particular issue. Here is one to Mrs. James Weissman with compliments of the editor, uh, compiler and, and editor, Captain Francis O'Neill, Chicago, November 12th, 1907. Um, provenance of the book. And then we also try to tag it both in a timeline to try to then place it inside of O'Neill's life, but also historic events that were happening in Irish America, Chicago, and of course in Ireland, as this was a very influential time and tumultuous time in Ireland, but then also place them on a map. So that is three different ways of approaching the same material through history, through uh, geography, and through um, uh, biography and provenance. So this will then allow us to do a pathway through looking at Sergeant James Early, who was one of O'Neill's collaborators, to Sergeant James Early, a loyal and generous friend with compliments of the compiler and editor, Captain Francis O'Neill, November 11th, 1907. We then get to throw in a little bit of a biography of, uh, of Early himself. There he is with his ill and pipes, posing for Irish minstrels and musicians, the book. And um, we can also then get in again to timeline and map. I'll do one more here. Here is O'Neill signed a copy to the editor of the Intermountain Catholic with compliments of Captain Francis O'Neill in Chicago, December 4th, 1907. This one is fascinating in that this was based in Salt Lake City and from Chicago, he sent this out to the editor in Salt Lake City. Um, the provenance of this book is from a private collection. Mr. Uh, Richie Piggott uh, bought this book, or Pigeot, bought this book in a bookshop in Cork City 25 years ago, he says. And we then start to see some patterns coming out here. Uh, O'Neill wrote a lot of dedications and sent copies of his books to clergy, to those in the Gaelic League, to influential authors, to people like Henry Ford, and there's an interesting history with that too. Um, Michael O'Malley uh, has just submitted his manuscript for biography of O'Neill, in which he talks quite a bit about that area and some of the censorship that um, potentially some of his family has done to try to um, uh, paint his legacy in a slightly different way than um, we can see through the letters involved. Um, this one is actually do donated from Kevin Conniff, a um, musician from the, the Chieftains, the Irish supergroup. Um, it's at the uh, Irish Traditional Music Archive and has not yet been cataloged, but ITMA has been very, very helpful in providing us with uh, some of these copies that are, are not accessible to the public as of yet. I do wanna show you a couple of other things here. You can access the same material through a timeline and we're working to include um, quite a bit more with uh, Irish history involved in this. 
um, a number of dedications to Selena O'Neill, his collaborator and possibly niece, it's kind of hard to tell uh, in history, um, but she actually was the editor of one of the nine books and she orchestrated a number of the pieces uh, of Irish music for piano. And again, we can also look through a geographic, uh, a mapping tool to see Salt Lake City, California, that's my own personal copy, to um, copies from the Henry Mercer collection um, and letters that went along um, from O'Neill to some of the recipients. Uh, we actually have um, letters uh, that he had included in some of these books as well. So we try to give context around these dedication pages, use the dedication pages because they are so beautiful as a vehicle for looking into multiple different facets of Irish America and um, all the different streams that were sort of flowing through Chicago and O'Neill's life at the time. I want to show you one other thing. As Aileen Delan, uh, my collaborator here, uh, mentioned um, in the questions after her keynote, she said, people animate the space. Um, and I think actually this might have been in response to um, uh, the idea of uh, where music was taking place in pubs. People animate the space. And I do want to show you one um, particularly beautiful um, provenance of one of these books. This is, again, this personal copy. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I have the wrong one. Go back here to book titles and we'll look at O'Neill's Music of Ireland in 1903. Here's the covers. He had a couple of different types. There was one particular copy that was dedicated to Timothy Downing, who was a childhood friend of O'Neill's back in Clare. Um, Downing's father was a, a, a gentleman farmer um, and taught him flute and had a, a, a big, um, it's described as a chest full of musical manuscripts. This one is dedicated to his son, a childhood playmate of O'Neill's, to my esteemed friend, Timothy A. Downing, with compliments of the compiler and editor, Daniel Francis O'Neill. That was his born name, his given name, and uh, it's the only copy that we have in which he signs it um, with, his, uh, with his first name of Daniel. Uh, Christmas 1906. But as, uh, as Aileen said, um, people animate the space. The provenance on this one is from the personal collection of Christina Igo. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who writes, in the early 1990s, I was studying music in Southwest England and doing a dissertation on influences of traditional music on classical music. And my teacher gave this book to me as a gift. The first tune I learned from this book was Lanigan's Ball. And when I moved to London, I heard about a session in a pub in Edmonton and played this tune to Eamon Ego, whom I later married. We played this tune many times over in London and Spain before eventually settling in Ireland. Um, I am very much indebted to the Irish Traditional Music Archive for, um, for hosting this, for offering to, um, to archive everything that we find. Um, to the Ward Irish Music Archives in uh, Milwaukee for uh, incorporating their collection, including the Dunn Collection, um, the fire chief of Milwaukee with whom O'Neill was a, a close friend, um, and to my collaborators uh, for, uh, for, for jumping in and saying yes to a project that they didn't know much about, um, but especially to my intrepid graduate students who have done some of the, the difficult um, archival digging and um, puzzling through uh, an area that they are not incredibly familiar with. Um, uh, here we have Heather Moore, who is uh, a, a graduate student and has done a number of the biographies of, of the people um, that are being featured in here. And one of the things that I love about this is that not only is this an engagement with archives for them, it's an engagement with uh, an area of music that they probably don't have much uh, experience with as conservatory students or as um, musicologists, uh, especially looking at aspects of traditional music. Um, and um, again, it's also something that they could do during COVID. 
Um, but it's uh, people like Heather Moore have uh, have really uh, have dug in and have done some of the dirty work of uh, experience art, experiencing what archives can do and how they're helpful to us. And I'm hoping that this project will be a window for uh, multiple fields into um, using these dedication pages as ways of exploring society at that time through a completely different window. And um, I don't know, a Aileen, uh, anything that you want to add to this? Maybe not. Yeah, uh, yes. Um, no, not at all, Scott, other than to congratulate you and your students, because uh, I mean, all Dan and I did really was talk you through ideas and help you collate or find things. I mean, the manner in which you put this together, because this is the first time I'm seeing this as well, just congratulations. I think it's an extraordinary resource and I do think it's interdisciplinary and uh, I hope many more will follow. So thank well you, thank done. you. So um, one of the things that we're hoping to do is uh, we will be, this is, uh, uh, and thank you, Aline, too. Uh, this is a rough draft at the moment. We have the structure together. We have about a quarter of the material that we've gathered loaded into it. And we have um, promises from many archives that when they open, they'll search their collections and send things on to us as well. So this will be something that will launch um, again, um, open up a little bit further in the fall. And we will also be including music. We have, uh, we're planning to link to a number of things at both of the archives that are hosting this, as well as archive.org. Um, Brewster Kale's uh, initiative to, to document the, the history of mankind and the internet, um, the number of wax cylinders that we'll be linking to on there. We also have music that has been uh, donated by Dana Lynn, a fiddle player, and Brendan Dolan. Um, piano player and flute player, who is actually the son of somebody who played on many of the 78s uh, that came out of uh, the East Coast uh, during the golden age of Irish music uh, and 78 RPM records. They've donated, they did a project in which they were recording every single O'Neill tune and they got through, I think, the A's and the B's um, alphabetically. And they're donating this to the project so that we can also have music um, that's associated with these pages. One in particular that I have not posted yet is a dedication to Mayor Harrison of Chicago. O'Neill, when he transcribed tunes and published them, sometimes if he didn't have a name, he would make up a name for the tune. And so we have a tune called Mayor Harrison's Fedora. And Dana Lynn um, has recorded a, a version of Mayor Harrison's Fedora that we can then include with the dedication that O'Neill did to Mayor Harrison. So this is going to be really fun. I'll have the, the project open for a few days and then we'll close it down for some structural repairs uh, and expansion. And I very much hope you enjoy it. And I'm looking forward to this as potentially being a model for digital humanities access and um, perspectives uh, for the future and for other projects as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, you get the Heroes Award for this conference for what you've done staying up uh, late last night and getting up early in the morning. And you have our heartiest congratulations on this uh, wonderful achievement. Uh, so fitting as a as a way of uh, concluding or almost concluding our um, activities here this week. Um, instead of making remarks, I wanna now uh, read a very short poem about Captain O'Neill. I mentioned it earlier. It's by Michael Dunahy, the late Michael Dunahy, uh, who was a dissertation student at Chicago um, in the 1970s. Uh, this is a poem he wrote in June of 1992. It was part of his last it would have been his, his, his next book, which was going to be about Captain O'Neill. Uh, and so this appears in Poetry Magazine, Chicago Magazine in 1992. It's called A Reprieve. Here in Chicago, it's almost dawn and quiet in the cell in Deering Street Station House, apart from the first birds at the window and the milk wagon and the soft slap of the club 
in Chief O'Neill's palm. Think it over, he says, but don't take all day. Nolan's hands are brown with a Chinaman's blood. But if he agrees to play three jigs slowly so O'Neill can take them down, he can walk home, change clothes, and disappear past the stockyards and across the tracks. Indiana is waiting. O'Neill lowers his eyes, knowing the Chinaman's face will heal. The Great Lakes roll in their cold gray sheets and wake. Picket lines will be charged. Girls raped in the sweatshops. The clabbered tenements burn. And he knows that Nolan will be gone by then. The coppery stains wiped from the keys of the Blackwood flute. 5,000 miles away, Connaught sleeps. The coast lights dwindle out along the west. But there's music here in this lamplit cell. And O'Neill, scratching in his manuscript like a monk at his illuminations. And Nolan's sweet tone breaking as he tries to phrase a jig the same way, twice. The limericks rake, or tell her I am, or my darling asleep. Thank you, Scott. So now we just take two minutes to set up for John Judd. Um, shall I explain what's going on while uh, Sebastian takes care of us. Thank you so much, Sebastian. So um, having a sense of uh, the centrality of James T. Farrell to our uh, work here um, uh, in these days, and, and a special homage to Charles Fanning's work on this writer over the, his many decades, um, we decided to conclude things with a, a recorded reading by a Chicago actor. Um, I went to court theater at the university and asked Charlie Newell who would be good, and he recommended John Judd. I had just seen John Judd in a superb performance of Arthur Miller's All My Sons. Um, he played um, uh, Jamie in a production of uh, Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's Journey that went to Galway. Um, he also now plays an Irish cop in a television series called Southside. Um, he's a wonderful actor and we had great conversations. Um, the passage uh, that we settled on was the second section of the first uh, volume of the Studs Lonigan trilogy. Um, and I'll just set it up by saying um, there's a house that's uh, a bustle with graduation activities um, the, the older son, uh, who's William, who's, called, who's the title character, Studs, and his sister Frances are graduating from a grammar school uh, and sort of fighting about the use of the bathroom upstairs. And then we shift uh, to, the, to the father, um, who is uh, smoking a cigar and um, thinking with great self-complacency about his time in Chicago um, since the, uh, his, his childhood. Uh, remember that the book is written in 1932. This scene takes place in 1916, and uh, he's reflecting on uh, uh, the 1890s and the time since. It's a it's a, almost exactly a 20 minute reading, which is what we asked John Judd to do, and uh, we're now ready to show that. Um, there is one small slip, um, and. Charles Fanning himself will certainly uh, catch it, and uh, many of you might as well. We had a debate about whether to ask him to do it yet again. He had a couple of tries at this, and I, I decided to let it go. It's a, that imperfection in the Navajo rug, which is a sign of our human mortality.
Old man Lonigan planted his feet on the back porch railing, sat tilted back in his chair, enjoying his stogie. His red, well-fed looking face was wrapped in a dreamy expression, and his innards made slight noises as they diligently furthered the process of digesting a juicy beefsteak. He puffed away, exuding burger comfort while from inside the kitchen came the rattle of dishes being washed. Now and then he heard Francis preparing for the evening. He gazed with reverie lost eyes over the gravel spread of Carter Playground, which was a few doors south of his own building. A six o'clock sun was imperceptibly burning down over the scene. On the walk in the shadow of and circling the low rambling public school building, some noisy little girls, the size and age of his own Loretta, were playing hopscotch. Lonigan puffed at his cigar and ran his thick paw through his brown-gray hair and watched the kids. He laughed when he heard one of the little girls shout that the others could go to hell. It was funny, and they were tough little ones, all right. It sounded damn funny. They must be poor little girls with fathers and mothers who didn't look after them or bring them up in the right home atmosphere. And if they were Catholic girls, they probably weren't sent to the sister's school. Parents ought to send their children to the sister's school, even if it did take some sacrifice. After all, it only cost a dollar in a month. And even poor people could afford that when their children's education was at stake. They wouldn't have his Loretta using such rowdy language, and of course she wouldn't because her mother had always taught her to be a little lady. His attention wandered to a boy, no older than his own Martin, but dirty and less well cared for, who in the intent and dreamy seriousness of childhood played on the ladders and slides which paralleled his own back fence. He watched the youngster scramble up, slide down, scramble up, slide down. It stirred in him a vague series of impulses, wishes, and nostalgias. He puffed his stogie and watched. He said to himself, Golly, it would be great to be a kid again. He said to himself, Yes, sir, it would be great to be a kid. He tried to remember those ragged days when he was only a shaver and his old man was a pauperized greenhorn. Golly, them were the days. Often there had not been enough to eat in the house. Many's the winter day he and his brother had to stay home from school because they had no shoes. The old house, which was more like a barn or a shack than a home, was so cold they had to sleep in their clothes. Sometimes in those zero Chicago winters, his old man had slept in his overcoat. Golly, even with all that privation, them were the days. And now that they were over, there was something missing, something gone from a fella's life. He'd give anything to... Live back a day of those times around Blue Island and Archer Avenue. Old man Dooley always called it Archie Avenue, and Dooley was one comical turkey, funnier than anything you'd find in real life. And then those days when he was a young buck in Canaryville, and things were cheaper in them days. The boys had hung out at Keeley Saloon, and later around the saloon that Padney Flaherty ran, and Luke O'Toole's place on Halstead. Oh, Luke was some boy. Well, the Lord have mercy on his soul, and on on the soul of... Old Padney Flaherty. Padney was a comical duck, good-hearted as they make them, but crabby. He was a first-rate crab. And the jokes the boys played on him, they were always calling them names. Pigpen Irish, Shanty Irish. Padney, ain't you the kind of Irishman that slept with the pigs back in the old country? Once they told him his house was on fire. And he dashed out of the saloon down the street with a bucket of water in his hand. It was funny watching him go, skinny little Irishman. And while he was gone... They'd all helped themselves to free beers. He came back blazing mad, picked up a hatchet, called him all the choice swear words he could think of, and ran a whole gang out into the street. And they'd all stood on the other corner laughing. Yeah, them was the days. And when he was a kid, they would all get sacks, wagons, any other thing, and go over to the tracks. Spike Kennedy, Lord have mercy on his soul, he was bit by a mad dog and died, would get up on one of the cars and throw coal down, like 60, and they'd scramble for it. And many's the fight they'd have with the gangs from other streets, and many's the plunk on the coconut that Paddy Lonigan got. It's a wonder some of them weren't killed, throwing lumps of coal and ragged rocks at each other like a band of wild Indians. To live some of those old days over again? Golly. He took a meditative puff on his stogie and informed himself that time was a funny thing. Old man time just walked along, and he didn't even blow a how-do-you-do through his whiskers. He just walked on past you. Things just change. 
Chicago was nothing like it used to be when over around St. Ignatius Church and back of the yards were white men's neighborhoods. And Prairie Avenue was a tony street where all the swells lived, like Fields, who had a mansion at 19th and Prairie, and Pullman at 18th and Calumet, and Fairbanks, and Potter Palmer, and the niggers and the whores had not roosted around 22nd Street, and 58th Street was nothing but a wilderness. And on Sunday afternoons, the boulevards were lined with carriages, and there were no automobiles. And living was dirt cheap, and people were friendlier and more neighborly than they now were. And there were high sidewalks, and he... And Mary were young. Mary had been a pretty girl, too, and at picnics she always won the prizes because she could run like a deer. And he remembered that first picnic he took her to. And she won a loving cup and gave it to him. And then they went off sparking, and he'd gotten his first kiss. And they sat under a tree when it was hushed like the earth was preparing for darkness. And he and Mary had looked at each other, and then he knew he had fallen. And he didn't give a damn. And the bicycle parties. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer true. We won't have a stylish marriage. We can't afford a carriage. But you look sweet upon the seat of a bicycle built for two. And that Sunday had rented a buggy, even though it cut a terrible hole in his kick. And they'd driven way out south. And who would have ever thought that he and she would now be living in the same neighborhood they had driven to on that Sunday, and that they would have their own home and graduate their kids from it? Now, who would have thought it? And the time he'd taken her to a dance at Hull House and coming home, he'd almost gotten into a mix-up with some soused mick because the fellow had started to get smart alecky like he was a kike. Yes, sir, them was the days. <laughs> he hummed trying first to strike the right tune to Little Annie Rooney, then the tune to My Irish Molly O. He sang to himself, Dear old girl, the robin sings above you. Dear old girl, it speaks of how I love you. Dear old girl, it speaks of how I love you. He couldn't remember the rest of the song, but it was a fine song. It described his Mary to a T, his dear old girl. And the old gang, they were scattered now to the very ends of the earth. Many of them were dead, like poor Paddy McCoy. Lord have mercy on his soul, whose ashes rested in a drunkard's grave at Potter's Field. Well, they were a fine gang, and many's the good man they'd rank under the table. But, well, most of them didn't turn out so well. There was Heine Schmaltz, the boy with glue on his fingers, the original sticky-fingered kid. And poor Mrs. Schmaltz, Lord have mercy on her poor soul. God was merciful to take her away before she could know that her boy went up the road to Joliet on a ten-year jolt for burglary. The poor little woman, how she used to come around and tell the things that her Heine found. She'd say in the German dialect, My Heine, he finds the grandest things. Why, only yesterday I tell you he found a diamond ring. Why, can you imagine it? And the time she and Mrs. McGurdy got to talking about which of their boys was the luckiest and about the fine things my Heine found and the fine things my Mike was always picking up. Good souls they were. And there was Dinny Gorman, the fake silk hat. When Dinny would tote himself by, they'd all haw-haw because he was like an old woman. He was too bright, if you please, to associate with ordinary fellas. Once a guy from New York came around, and he was damned if High Hat Dinny, who'd never been to the Big Bird, didn't sit down and try to tell this guy all about New York. Dinny made a little dough, but he was, after all, only a shyster lawyer and a cheap politician. He had been made ward committeeman because he had licked everybody's boots. And there were his own brothers. Bill had run away to sea at seventeen, and nobody had ever heard from him again. Jack. Lord have mercy on his hoe. He'd always been a wild and foolish fellow. A man or devil couldn't persuade him not to join the colors for the war in Spain, and he'd been killed in Cuba. And it had nearly broken their mother's heart in two. Lord have mercy on his and her and the old man's souls. He'd been a fool, all right, poor Jack. And Mike had run off and married an older woman than himself, and he was now in the East and not doing so well, and his wife was an old crow slobbering in a wheelchair. And Joe was a motorman, and Catherine, well, he hadn't even better think of her. Letting a traveling salesman get her like that and expecting to come home with her fatherless baby and going out and becoming a scarlet woman.
his own sister too. God. Nope, his family hadn't turned out so well. They hadn't had none of them the persistence that he had. He had stuck to his job and nearly killed himself working. But now he was reaping his rewards. It had been no soft job when he started as a painter's apprentice, and there weren't strong unions like there were now, and there was no eight-hour day, neither. And the pay was nothing. In them days, many's a good man that fell off a scaffold to die or become permanently injured. Well, Pat Lonigan had gone through the mill, and he had pulled himself up by his own bootstraps. While he was not exactly sitting in the plush on Easy Street, he was a boss painter and had his own business, and pretty soon, maybe, he'd even be worth a cool hundred thousand berries. But life was a funny thing, all right. It was like Mr. Dooley said, and he'd never forgotten that remark, because Dooley, that is, Peter Finley Dunn, was a real philosopher. Who'll tell what makes one man a thief and another man a saint? He took a long puff. He gazed out and watched a group of kids, 13, 14, 15, boys like Bill, who sat in the gravel near the backstop close to the Michigan Avenue fence. What do kids talk about, he wondered. Because a person's own childhood got so far away from him, he forgot most of it, and sometimes it seemed as if he'd never been a kid himself. He forgot the way of a kid, the thoughts of a kid. He sometimes wondered about Bill. Bill was a fine boy. You couldn't find a better one on the graduating stage at St. Patrick's tonight, no more than you would find a finer girl than Francis. But sometimes he wondered just what Bill thought about. He puffed. It was nice sitting there. He would like to sit there and watch it slowly get dark because when it was just getting dark, things were quiet and soft-like and a fellow liked to sit in all the quiet and, well, just sit and let any old thoughts go through his mind. Just sit and dream and realize that life was a funny thing and that he'd fought his way up to a station where there weren't no real serious problems like poverty. And he sits there and is comfortable and content and patient because he knows that he has put his shoulder to the wheel and he has been a good Catholic and a good American and a good father and a good husband. He just sits there with Mary and smokes his cigar and has his thoughts, and then after it gets dark, he can send one of the kids for ice cream, or maybe sneak down to the saloon at 58th and State and have a glass of beer. If there was many another evening for that, and tonight he would have to go see the kids get a good send-off, otherwise he wouldn't be much of a father. And when you're a father, you got duties. And Patrick J. Lonigan well knew that. While Lonigan's attention had been sunk inwards, the kids had all left the neighborhood. Now he looked about, and the scene was swallowed in a hush, broken only by occasional automobiles and the noise from the State Street cars that seemed to be more than a block away. Suddenly, he experienced, like an unexpected blow, a sharp fear of growing old and dying, and he knew a moment of terror. Then it slipped away, greased by the thickness of his content. Where in hell should he get the idea that he was getting so old? Surely he was a little gray in the top story, a little fat around the belly, but well, if fat was healthy fat, there was a lot of stuff left in the old boy. And he was not any fatter than old man O'Brien, who owned a coal yard at 60 seconds at Wabash. He puffed his stogie and flicked the ashes over the railing. He thought about his own family. Bill would get himself some more education and then learn the business, starting as a painter's apprentice, and then when he got the hang of things and had worked on the job long enough, he would step in and run the works. And then the old man and Mary could take a trip to the old sod and see where John McCormick was born, take a squint at the lakes of Killarney, kiss the Blarney Stone, and look up all his relatives. He sang to himself so that no one would hear him. Where the dear old Shannon's flowing where the three-leaf shamrock grows, where my heart is, I am going to my little Irish rose. And the moment that I see her, with a hog and case I'll greet her, for there's not a calling sweeter where the river Shannon flows. He glowed over the fact that his kids were springing up. Martin and Loretta were coming along faster than he could imagine. Francis was going to be a beautiful girl who would attract some rich and sensible young fellow. He beat up a number of imaginary villains who would try to ruin her. 
He returned to the thought that his kids were growing up and he rested in the assurance that they had all gotten the right start. They would all turn out A number one. Martin would be a lawyer or professional man of some kind. He might go into politics and become a senator or a... Well, you never could tell what a lad with the blood of Paddy Lonigan in him might not become. And Loretta, he just didn't know what she'd be, but there was plenty of time for that. Anyway, there was going to be no hitches in the future of his kids. The family would have to be moving soon. When he bought this building, Wabash Avenue had been a nice, decent, respectable street for a self-respected man to live with his family, but now, well, the niggers and kikes were getting in, and they were dirty, and you don't know but what, even in broad daylight, some nigger moron might be attacking his girls. He'd have to get away from the eight balls and tin horn kikes, and when they got into a neighborhood, property values went bluey. He'd sell and get out, and when he did, he was going to get a pretty penny on the sale. He puffed away. A copy of the Chicago Evening Journal was lying at his side. It was the only decent paper in town. The rest were Republican. And he hated the questioner because it hadn't supported Joe O'Reilly, past Grand Master of Lonigan's Order of Christopher Lodge, that time in 1912 when Joe had run for the Democratic nomination for state's attorney. Lonigan believed it was the questioner that had beaten Joe. He wouldn't have it in his house. He thought about the Christies and decided he would have to be taken his fourth degree. And then at functions, he'd be all dolled up with a plume in his hat and a sword at his side and would be attached to a red band strung across his front. And then he'd get a soup and fish outfit and go to the dinners all rigged out so his own family wouldn't know him. He wasn't a bad-looking guy and he'd bet he could cut a swath all togged up in soup and fish. And when his two lads grew up, he was going to make good Christies out of them too. And he'd have to be attending meetings regularly. It might even help his business along. And it was only right that one Christie should help another along. That was what fraternalism meant. He looked down at the paper and noticed the headlines announcing Wilson's nomination in St. Louis. There was a full-length photograph of long-faced Wilson. He was snapped in summery clothes, light shoes and trousers, a dark coat and straw hat. He held an American flag on a pole about four feet long. Next to him in the photograph was the script of a declaration he had had drafted into the party platform, forecasting the glorious future of the American people and declaring inimical to their progress any movement that was favorable to a foreign government at the expense of the American nation. The cut was worded, the president and the flag. Now that was a coincidence, and the day that Bill and Francis were graduated, Woodrow Wilson was renominated for the presidency. It was a historic day because Wilson was a great president and he had kept us out of war. There might be something to coincidences after all. And then the paper carried an account of the day's doings at the Will or Pet trial. Our pet was the bastard who ruined a girl, and when she was in a family way, went and killed her rather than marry her like any decent man would have done. And the baseball scores. The White Sox had lost to Boston 2-1. to one. They were only in fifth place with an average of 500, but things looked good. And they might win the pennant anyway. Look what the Boston Braves had done in 1914. The Sox would spend the last month home. He'd have to be going out and seeing the Sox again. He hadn't been to a game since 1911 when he'd seen Ping Bodhi break up a 17-inning game with the Tigers. Good old Ping. He was back in the minors, but that was Comiskey's mistake. Chicotti and Faber were in form now, and that strengthened the team, and they had Zeb Terry at shortstop playing a whale of a game, and Joe Jackson on the club, and Weaver at third playing bang-up ball and not making an error a game like he had playing shortstop, and Collins and Shock and a better pitching staff, and they would get going like a house of fire, and he'd have to be stepping out and seeing them play regular. Well, he could read all about it and about the food riots in Rotterdam and the bloody battle in which the Germans had captured Vaux, afterwards. Now he'd have to be going inside, putting on his tie and going up with Mary and the kids for the doings. He sat there comfortable, puffing away. Life was a good thing if you were Patrick J. Lonigan and had worked hard to win out in the grim battle and God had been good to you. But then he had earned the good things he had. Yes, sir, let God call him to the heavenly throne this very minute and he could look God square in the eye and say he had done his duty and he had been and was a good father. They'd given the kids a good home, fed and clothed them, set the right example for them, sent them to Catholic schools to be educated, seen that they performed their religious duties. 
hustled them off to confession regularly, gave them money for the collection, never allowed them to miss mass even in winter, let them play properly so they'd be healthy, giving them money for good clean amusements like the movies because they were also educational, done everything a parent can do for a child. He puffed his stogie and sat there. The sun was burning imperceptibly low. Old man Lonigan looked about. He puffed his stogie and his innards made their customary noises as they diligently furthered the digestive process. Well, um, I think the conference has now come to an end and I want to thank Jim Paul and Arnaud uh, for uh, being part of this uh, common venture going into uh, um, trying to address uh, the issues of uh, Chicago life seen from the uh, Irish perspective. Um, I must say that it has been a pleasure for me and I know it has been a shared pleasure. I want to thank all participants for uh, attending the conference for um, providing insights that I'm sure um, will provide will uh, uh, the participants will keep in their minds, and um, I hope that at some stage we'll meet again um, in a different format, perhaps I don't know. But uh, I want to thank you all for being here in person or online, and um, wish you well for. Um, and I hope that for the rest of the stay in France, for those who are here, um, I wish you a safe trip back. And for the rest of the crowd uh, in Ireland, in England, and in the United States, I wish you a great summer. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jeffy. Thank you, Jeffy. Thank you, Jeffy. Thank you, Jeffy.